Hello, good evening, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sim Grid and a very special night indeed. This is Super Saturday. It's David Christie here, and a brand new name to the Sim Grid commentary box is Dan Handover. Dan, a very good evening. What a way to make your entrance. Well, a very good evening to yourself as well, David. I, it's just going to be amazing, is it? It's going to be incredible. I love Imola as a track. We've got some amazing racing happening today. Uh, and uh, yeah, I can't wait for it to get started. I really, really can't. So we are here at Imola, one of the iconic, one of the most iconic circuits in the world here in Bologna in Italy. It is going to be a 30 minute super sprint race here tonight, the first of 
three races tonight. These are the two support races leading up to tonight's 2.4 hour endurance race. There you can see the uh, schedule for tonight. We're currently underway with practice just now. Qualifying will begin in just nine minutes time. And then we have a race between uh, 6.15 and 6.45. That's uh, European time. And uh, for the, me and you in the UK, that's of course uh, 5.15 to 5.45. And we're going all the way through to uh, to 11 o'clock European time tonight, Dan. I know you're joining me for the Super Trofeo race and the Porsche Cup race. Now, let's let's uh, touch on the Super Trofeo race uh, originally. Um, obviously, it's the Lamborghini Super Trofeo that we see as a support race in the support package for the, uh, the GT Championship. What do you think we can expect to see from these cars tonight? Well, I think, you know, the good thing about having these one spec series is obviously everyone is in the same boat. Everyone is in the same car. They have to drive to um, what the car is actually uh, doing for this p uh, particular track. Um, I think these cars are, they're really suited to Imola. Okay, it's one of those things, the Lamborghini is a very, very good car to drive. It's a very stable platform I found as well. Um, and I think it really does suit um, this track really nicely. We're going to see a lot of like you know, heavy braking zones, as we know with Imola, a lot of braking zones going into the chicanes, the hairpin as well. So got to watch out there because I think it's going to be, a, you know, a case of last of the late breakers for the majority of these overtakes that are going to be happening tonight in the Lamborghini. Well, I think it's about time that we get an in-depth guide to the track that we're racing tonight here at Imola from our very own Alex Goldschmidt. We're on board the Huracan Super Trofeo with around 610 brake horsepower with Gregor Schill from Coach Dave Academy heading towards Tamburello on this hot lap. And we're going to hit a speed of around 245 clicks in sixth gear heading into Tamburello. Down to third through the first apex at 120. Just notice through the first, second and third apexes how much curbing Gregor Schill takes as he actually exits out of the corner. Now the short run down to Villeneuve. We're going to break into this just before the 50 meter mark board. Down to around 160 through the first part of Villeneuve. Second gear at 120 through the second part. And uh, now the short blast up to Dorza, taking it second gear and 70 kilometers an hour before Gregor Schill boots the throttle once again, using all of that 5.2 litre V10 screaming engine up the hill as they head towards Piratella, the left-hander that takes you down into the double right at Aqua Minerale. Down into third gear at 135 kph, allowing the car to drift off to the right-hand side. Now the dip comes along rather quickly before heading into Aqua Minerale. First bit of it taken around 190 in fourth, down to second at 105, up the slight incline. And now the run down to Variante Alta, which is a second gear chicane taken at 105 kph through the first part of it and 95 through the second part of it before the run down towards the Vivazza, the double left-hander that concludes the 3.050 mile circuit here. Now he's pushing up the gears up to fifth now, over 215 kph as we run towards now breaks before the 50 meter marker ball down to second at 100 uh, through the first apex through at the second left-hand apex at Rivazza before the run to the line and looks to be a fairly good clean lap here from Gregor Schill as he will push his way across the line and cross it just over 225 kilometers an hour in fifth gear so a huge thank you to Alex Goldschmidt there for that awesome guide round here at Imola. And let's have a, a, a little chat about that because we've got a couple of minutes to go uh, while we wait for qualifying, Dan. And, uh, you know, it is such an iconic high-speed track here, uh, you know, going through Tamburello, that, you know, that, that really difficult hairpin at Tosa where it almost doubles back on yourself. And it's so easy to, to outbreak yourself, especially possibly in these uh in these lamborghinis it is indeed We're actually you know looking at the onboard lap you see how much curb you can actually take with these cars the good thing with the gt3s i think it's again especially with that lambo it's a really stable platform but the amount of curb you can take is crucial to getting a fast lap run here you don't want to cut it too much obviously you don't want to get any uh, uh, potential uh, penalties or anything like that but you can really throw these cars over the curb but you do have to be patient though with this the, these gt3 cars as you were saving david going through toaster as well You've got to be patient because you can induce some understeer if you're not careful. I'm sure we're going to see again some, you know, I, I, I can't wait for this race to get out of the way. But yeah, what you're going to want, want to see is just how patient these drivers are going to have to be, especially on throttle coming out of the, uh, the hairpins like just Tosa. A very good evening as well on YouTube to Ian at Cosman and to Yukari there in the chat. And uh, they, they almost raised an eyebrow when you were uh, mentioning that the STs are stable. I think they uh, slightly disagree uh, on that one. Okay. Uh, oh, 
it all depends on the setup though. And uh, if you would like to get a very fast, stable setup, head over to coachdaveacademy.com. Hey, there we go. Right, that's the bills paid for this half hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, joking aside, Dan, obviously we're, we're just a couple of minutes away from qualifying here. With it being a 30 minute race, how important is uh, how important is qualifying tonight? I think to be fair, it's one of those things where you really do have to be conscious of the qualifying. It's track position is key. Uh, somewhere like Imola, you know, a 30 minute race, yeah, it's, it's a sprint race essentially. You've, you've got to, it doesn't mean you have to be going flat out 100% all the time. You still got to be, you know, you've got to be tactful with your overtakes and uh, as such, but you've still got to be conscious and that track position is going to be very, very key. So you think if you have a, a poorer qualifying, you're starting at the back, if you have got the pace to be sort of top five and so you've got to try and get through all of the other drivers as well there's a lot of cars out on track and there's going to be a lot of cars in this race so i think trap trap position is something that people have got to be conscious of i don't think though it's something that you need to dedicate 100 percent of focus on you know the race it's 30 minutes a lot can happen in 30 minutes as we both know so well the other point i want to very quickly uh, touch on with you dan is the fact that we we do have racing royalty with us tonight in the form of the number 93 car uh, of our very own michael hamlet taking to the grids now um we're gonna have to have some uh, predictions we were talking to michael beforehand and we may be blessed actually to get an onboard chat while he's driving about so we'll make sure we pick the most uh, awkward moment to actually do that but um you know I, for for somebody that, that dips in and out of a Settle Corsa competition, how easy is it to to sort of just jump into to this top split? Do you think he's he's going to have problems tonight, or do you think he's uh, going to be able to hold his own? Well, I think when you're looking at the when you do look at the grid here, there are a lot of quick drivers here. I mean, to be fair, uh, yeah, I think we're going to see. I've not actually seen. To be fair, I've not seen Michael race yet. This is good. This is going to be my first ever taste um, of uh, I haven't seeing Michael on track. Uh, uh, so at the end of the day, I think as we can see his car there on screen now, a uh, lovely looking uh, blue, blue um, <laughs> uh, the team. Like, is that? Uh, oh, look at that! He's put a love heart with David. Oh, look at that! David. That's nice, isn't it? That's nice. I'm glad he's done that. I'm glad he's. Done. I feel a bit left uh, out. But I have to admit, but it's fine. We'll, we can move forward with it. Um, that's forward with it. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm feeling <laughs> the love. That's uh, I'm, I'm genuinely blushing here. Thank you very, uh, very much for that, Michael. I've got to be honest. There's there's some uh, team names. There's some team names that we saw in some of the other races that, um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, one minute 45 left to go in free practice then, Dan. Uh, we've got at the top of the timing screens just now, 144.8 from Ben Norton. Nobody's even uh, really close to that apart from Marcel Fuzzi with a 145 flat. Everybody else in the high 145s right now. Yeah, it's true. We're actually looking as well. You've got that is uh, Adagon the Rab, who's currently uh, just seven hundredths behind. Uh, and then we've got a big gap. Yeah, to be fair, you're right. So, you know, between first and third, there's what separated by a tenth. This is free practice. You know, again, it may not necessarily be 100% what we're going to see in qualifying. Uh, but yeah, it's a bit of a gap then between uh, P3 and P4. Whether we're going to see that in qualifying, like I said, we're going to find out in a second. Uh, but it's going to be close either way, isn't it? It certainly is. So qualifying is about to begin, ladies and gentlemen. 10-minute qualifying session and then a 30-minute race. This is going to be awesome, awesome stuff. If you like what you see tonight, remember to like the YouTube channel here and give us a subscribe. And if you want to hit the notification bell as well, that would be very much appreciated. And head over to the simgrid.com and uh, sign yourself up for all of our fantastic daily races and championships right the uh, the the banter is about to end because we're getting the serious business now of qualifying um i i've got to be honest i think variante alta is going to be a hot spot for things going very very wrong tonight yeah, I think, uh, I, to be fair, all the chicanes are states to a certain extent. There's only 10 minutes worth of qualifying, so these guys have got to be out on track and getting their laps in as quick as they can. Trap position, I suppose, in the, in the sense of actually getting out early, is key. That's almost potentially uh, more key than actually uh, uh, getting a fast lap time because you don't want to be hitting traffic. Uh, so, yeah, I think the chicanes, you're going to potentially see a bunch of people up. They're all going to try and make a little bit of space. We see there that was a logic that's gone ever so slightly wide going through the Tosa hairpin. Uh, yeah, so trap position in terms of not getting um, held up by anyone is very, very key. But yeah, I think all these chicanes, Tosa, it's, it's, it will bunch people up. They have got to be careful of that. 
weather is going to play an important factor to tonight because the uh, the way they've got this entire uh, event set up is that each of the races takes place on the same day in terms of uh, climate so it looks to be uh, looks actually quite dark out there I wonder if we're potentially going to get rain for these uh, first two races we'll keep an eye on that because the skies are looking very very cloudy overhead here but uh, the in game time the in sim time will match the real world time up until the 2.4 where it'll be off slightly um, but that's to do with uh, some some logistics actually getting this up and working but uh, You'll, you'll see the track transition in real time and uh, it'll be very, very interesting to see, especially for the Porsches that are coming up in about an hour, to see how they deal with the darkening conditions. That's very, very true. But yeah, looking as you say, David, looking at the uh, looking at the overcast, it looks very, very overcast, doesn't it? So yeah, I'll be potentially going to uh, see a, a spanner thrown into the mix um, in uh, you know, not, uh, not very long. At the moment, we're just about to see. So all the drivers just come around now. They're going to be starting. We're going to see some laps be put on the board now. So who's going to be as we're currently um, on your focus with Mr. Michael Hamlet? And we can't see his team name uh, at the moment, but obviously we know we know what it says, don't we? Um, we, we certainly do. Aren't we? <laughs> Part of me wants to see an onboard actually with Michael just to uh, to actually watch and, and critique his driving style. Um, obviously. Uh, Work uh, work with Michael on a, a fairly regular basis, so there's a a lot of love there. But um, yeah, I, I've got to be honest uh, because, as I say, um, from from my um, dealings with Michael, it's all been here at Simgrid and it's all been uh, commentary based. But actually seeing him take part in the race, this is great fun. So uh, yeah, and I, to be honest, there as he's coming through uh, Aqua Mar uh, Minerali, cars looking very very smooth indeed. And yeah, to be fair, again, um, to me that's one of the things, again, you can see the you know, nice smooth application of steering throttle, patience again, like I was saying before, patience is key to get the power down, you don't want to be pushing too much under the steer as well, just going to watch him go through uh, Ravazza as well, using up as much of the kerb as you can on the outside, that's free lap time essentially, you know, if you can get, again, there, you see how much kerb that is being used, and again, run nice and wide, just maximizing the exit. A little bit onto the gravel there, but that won't slow him down that much. And I believe this is Michael's very first timed lap. So we're going to see, we can actually see uh, Norton with a 145 dead. So no one into the 44s just yet. I'm wow. sure that will change. Look at that. The 145.676 straight out of the back for Michael. Very good lap indeed. That certainly is. Um, I'm quite impressed, actually, at that one. I wasn't expecting that because uh, the the pre-event chat was he was quite pessimistic about his pace and how he was doing, and uh, it, it, that's very very close to the, uh, the the practice times anyway. And yeah, that puts Michael in a very very good position. However, however, let's not count apples before uh, the the uh, the the qualifying session's over because five minutes left to go a lot can happen in that five minutes Dan and uh, I think these guys are just getting started right now 100% 100% you, you look at it in qualifying especially it takes at least two or three laps for these tyres to get really up to temperature so these times are going to come down but like, yeah I mean Ben Norton look at that a 145 dead and that was his first lap uh, and that's yeah, a six tenths gap between uh, North and Hamlet. So we are going to be seeing these times come down. Don't be, uh, you know, don't be surprised if we do see several times in the 44s as we go on with the number 44 car. Oh, that is uh, Bram Depriatre. I believe. Apologies for these name pronunciation, David. You're gonna have to help me out on this. A Dan, and oh my God, I'm so glad to have somebody that can't pronounce the names either. Oh, I mean, it's a joy. Fine. Do you know That's what? Fine. Let's have half an hour of us just trying to pronounce this entry list. Right, Ryan Whitlock is uh, seven tenths up, uh, eight tenths now as he comes across the line. Ryan Whitlock, I uh, goes third fastest there joint seconds with wow. exactly the same time there 145 603 dan wow i mean <laughs> let, let's be honest one you know of all the times you can have look at how close that is like i said you got two people joint p2 or p3 depending on the way you, you look at it here as we've got uh, marvin blank just can go across the line he stays in p12 and then we've got uh, Samir Falk, we've got a second up. Look at that, two tenths for Samir Falk. He's now put in, that was a 145.258. So again, it's still no one's broken that 144 magical number yet. However, Falk is getting very, very close indeed. And I think Norton's got to be a little bit worried now. 
Yeah, he certainly is. There's still, uh, it was a little bit closer in practice, however, I mean, that is what, uh, seven drivers within a second of your uh, pole sitter. So that bodes very, very well uh, for the, the race indeed, as we see Brum, the Praetor, uh, making his way round through Piratella and down towards Aqua Minerale just now. Beautiful, beautiful camera angle as he comes up that hill and then it's almost a, a blind entrance into Variante Alta and it's one that I consistently botch up. I am terrible at this circuit. I end up going over and so is Bram. A big power slide from the Lamborghini but he's still, he's still got it I think. We'll uh, see what he's done because surely he was uh, several tenths of a second up on that uh, on that lap, Dan. But uh, yeah, I, I think he might have scrubbed it. Yeah, no, that was going to be uh, that was going to be a good lap indeed. That was definitely going to be a top five, potentially um, even more than that. Um, so yeah, we're going to we're going to see what happens when he comes across the line. He's got a little bit of a toe from the car in front. Can't quite see who that is, but what time is that going to be? He still goes third, even with that. Wow, that's. For a moment going through out of the Variante chicanes and he was still he's only now what's that three tenths off pole so he's got some time in the bag here definitely Alexander Drab goes across the line just Whoa. three one hundredths of a second behind Ben Norton straight into second place and now this is starting to get very very serious indeed this is the number 13 of Mark Bastida he's four tenths up could go into third place he does go into third place I'm quite happy with that that was some on the fly that was very good there. that was very good I like that we're just being told as well so ryan whitlock is currently half a second up and if you look how far he is behind uh norton he is 5.6 he's 0.564 of a second behind so just over half a second so if he gets another good run again go through aquino uh, minerali got to keep as much of the curve as you can not running too wide and he gets that absolutely um spot on variante four this potentially is going to have one more lap after this um, but yes, how he's going to take the Variante Chicane. Again, you see he's just using as much curb as he can. Jump it. Wow. I mean, that's probably as much curb as you actually want to take. It's all looking good so far. I don't know how, um, you know, has he improved on this half a second? He was up um, at the start of the first half of this lap. We're going to find out. We've just been told as well he's still half a second. So, Ravazzo is going to be the key. But I'm not too sure. As we see, Norton, I, th I think this is going to be a quick lap, David, don't you? Oh, wow. Oh wow, Whoa. 144, 649, my goodness me, talk about absolutely laying the gauntlet down, that must be so demoralising, uh, Ryan Whitlock improves 4 tenths, but look oh. at that, oh, no. Br Bram de Pertre, he goes up into first place with a 144, 463, and then Marcel Fusi up into second place, Ben Norton, who was looking all comfortable and cosy in pole position there, has been absolutely relegated down to third place there, it's still not too bad, but uh, yeah, he's going to be not too great with that. Uh, Michael Hamlet completely bins it on the uh, the final one there, and oh, he ran out of fuel. Ah, oh, never mind. So we're just being told as well that if you look as well, uh, Hamlet is actually Michael Hamlet is on identical times to, uh, and that is Ryan Whitlock. So look at that, 0 0.681 behind uh, pole position, but I mean, yeah, like like you said, David, Ben went from P1 to four tenths up to being just under two tenths down. Uh, but I mean, to be fair though, you look at it. I mean, you look at the times. You've got um, you got the top two separated by. Yeah, I mean, let's let's be honest. That's that's nothing, is it? You got a hundredth of a second. That's absolutely nothing. And then you got a tenth. Still not really a lot of time. So, you know, when you look at it, you look at a tenth, you think all oh, third place. You know, could, obviously, could have been better. I mean. P3, is, Ben has got to be happy with that, hasn't he? Oh, for sure, for sure. And I think the thing is as well is that it sets them up very, very nicely to the race. And it showed you just what a level of uh, pace that they've got here in these Lamborghinis. I mean, that's what, nine drivers within one second of that pole time. We're still not finished yet. Several drivers still on laps. Uh, Alexander Rab from Rab Racing in the 150, he was three tenths up. So that would have taken him up to fourth position but i i think he's uh, pretty much scrubbed that one this is vyachlev vlodja in the uh, number seven Kroyas, uh seven ten top so that would be enough to take um vyachislav into the top 10 i think if that's um comes around the corner yeah interesting to see how that goes around but a minute left in the uh 
in cool down time. And this is where the there we go into the top ten. What did I say? I am I am absolutely on fire. You're on tonight. fire, David, today. Wow, well, you're I, getting... it makes it. I'm, I'd be happy just being awake right now, but I'll I'll take that. <laughs> Muckley three tenths up. He that's going to move him up to P. 13, no, P14 he goes down, so slight improvement on that one, but there you go, wow right at the end, right at the end Dan, it all changed It did indeed, like I said, we were saying, it's amazing how much stuff can change in 10 minutes, I, I think that's what I, I that's what I like, I do there's something about short qualifying that it's just almost that sort of like that, it's not panic That it, it's, it's the wrong word, panic is the wrong word, but it's just the, all of a sudden it's just from nothing to 100% right go you've only got 10 minutes off you go so it's just such a small amount of time and you've got to make sure that you're on the ball 100% from the word go and it just throws up like we have seen here the pressure I think is more if you've got 20 minutes 30 minutes of qualifying pressure is slightly less you've got more time but in this sort of instance you have just got to go at it 100% from the word go so yeah and this is what I, I do love about short qualifiers well, we'll wait to see how that unfolds in the next couple of minutes, though. But Marcel Fuzzi takes pole position from Brian Depertre uh, in second place. There, Ben Norton in third, and then Alexander Rab in fourth place. It's going to be Mark Bastia in fifth place, alongside Ryan Whitlock in sixth. Row four is going to be Michael Hamlet, our very own Michael, out there on P7. Samir Falk in P8, and then it's uh, Oscar Saristo in P9 alongside Vyacheslev Vlodja in P10, uh, Gergli Kunzabo in 11th place there, Matt Hubbard in 12th, alongside uh, row 7 is Chad Dillon and Steve Muckley, row uh, 8 is Alexander Dowling and Sandro Baccio, row 9 is Marvin Blank and Mark Gibson 17th and 18th place, 19th place is Alexander Duderev alongside Felix Ksef in the uh, 20th position, 21st is Ryan Renoir and then in 22nd is Artur Storazowski and then 23rd is Christopher Ligriston. So there we go, that is uh, 23 cars that we've got taking part here. We're about a minute away from going green. Dan, what are you expecting? Wow, I mean, to be fair, like I said, I, I mean, it's too close to call, isn't it, really? Like I said, you've got the top three separated by, like I said, it was less than two tenths of a second. In a racing scenario, when everyone's battling, that is not a lot of time. It seems a lot in qualifying. It's not really going to be a lot in the race, I don't think, because again, the consistency, if you can hit that lap time, you know, it's probably going to be very, very hard to be that consistent half a tenth to a tenth of a second quicker every single lap. There is going to be some close racing throughout the field, and I'm sure we're going to be having a lot to uh, to commentate on, David, to be fair. Well, there we go. Thank you very much to uh, Kylo in YouTube chat for telling me that it is uh, pronounced Fosh, uh, Samir Fosh in eighth place there so thank you very much for that as uh, if you genuinely know the pronunciations of the names and we're getting them wrong please do let us know and uh, we will do our very best to uh, try and say it and not butcher it up anyway um, because I'm Scottish I get a pass for uh, that sort of thing anyway and I think that's why half the viewers <laughs> tend to tune in uh, right green flag lap is underway here at Imola for our first of three amazing races here on Super Saturday you are very welcome and thank you very much for joining us tonight there's a lot of things that you could have been doing and uh, you've chosen to spend your time rather wisely with us uh, first up is the uh, We've got the uh, Super Trifail race, then we've got the Porsches, and then we have the 2.4 hour endurance race. Uh, the temperatures, Dan, is a little bit concerning. It's a very, very cold or cool 15 degrees Celsius. I know, yeah, it's very, it's very, very cold. We've just been uh, just been hearing from from uh, Mr. Michael Hamlet that the tires are all of a sudden the temperatures are dropping. So you, you're only, you know, these guys are only going round at a formation lap pace. So they're only going 50, 60, 70 k's. So they haven't got any heat in the tires, and they're going to be, as you're probably going to see there, they're at some point, especially getting through to the laptop, they're going to be frantically trying to warm their tires up as much as they can. Uh, it's currently running on board with, that is uh, Ben Norton. This is Ben Norton's camera view. Again, you can see acceleration braking, trying to get some residual heat into the tires as well, using the brakes to heat the rim up, to obviously then heat the carcass of the tires. So that's one thing they're going to try. You're going to see them weaving as well. So literally, absolutely everything they're going to do is try and get some heat in these tires. But it's going to be a sketchy first lap, I think. It's going to be a very sketchy first lap. You've got to wait at least two laps for these tires to warm up and to get that race pace um, that people are going to be used to as they've just had from qualifying and free practice. 
yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that one pans out with it being a 30 minute sprint race as well. It really does change the mindset because obviously we see um, here at Simgrid, we do see some of the longer endurance races. We'll see one later tonight, for example. But these 30 minute dash for the cash, it's, um, it's kind of all hell for leather um, in that first couple of laps. And it's, it's really all made or break. Uh, make a break on the, the, the first couple of corners. I mean, going into Tamburello, I would not be surprised to see several cars go flying. Well, I think, to be fair, if everyone keeps it nice and clean, the, the main thing is, like I said, as much as, yet yeah, it is a sprint race and you've got 30 minutes, like we were saying earlier, you've still got to be tactful. You've still got to be cautious and careful. You've got to make these moves in a position where you're confident to make an overtake rather than just sort of throw it at the inside and then, you know, almost in a way hoping for the best. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone's going to be as, as calm as they can be and as collective as they can be. Yes, it's going to be a little bit because everyone's going to bunch up going through Tamburello. That is one of the things we're going to have to watch out for. I suppose going into um, uh, the Variantes chicane as well. But we are just about to get into the way. I think, oh, I thought we already went there. I thought we already went there, David. Yeah, very, very close indeed. The car's getting their orders to line up double file. It's a long, long run to the green here at Imola and uh, some of the cars try to play a little bit of mind games but they're all managed in the sim they all have their little marker that uh, we can't see but the drivers can see of where their car is supposed to be on this run up to the line here we go then 30 minutes it's the super trofeo race here race number one of super saturday here at the sim grids and we are getting ready to go green the cars jolt about it's fuzzy and depreteur side by side on the front row then and uh, we are getting ready. And there we go. Just coming up to the line now. It is such a long, long run because here we go with the green flag finally flies and that is a brilliant, brilliant start on the outside. There's still two abreast all the way down the pack down into this first corner, Dan. And uh, it's all been very, very well behaved. It has indeed. You're looking at the top right corner of your screen. You've got the aerial camera there. The uh, the helicopter shot looks absolutely amazing. Loads of people side by side. At the moment, though, the top four are on their way, and they are just gone at the moment. Look at the gap they've got already from the um, uh, from P5 back. So this, you know, the, the, the top four have already got their little um, uh, their little battle going forward for everyone else. A little bit of scrap in there going through, as you can see in the top right -hand corner um, of your screen. Look, there's almost three wide going into the Tosa chicane. That's not going to be ideal. Uh, still too wide uh, for a little bit, but it's all starting to bunch up. So those guys got to watch out. Already losing a lot of time here. Yeah, you look at the gap from Norton and Rab. The gap is four tenths of a second already. And it actually looks to be a little bit longer than that. Uh, apologies, it's 1.2 seconds. Um, so apologies uh, for that. I was getting the, the timings mixed up. Yeah, a little bit further down the field. Look at Hamlet. So we've got currently on the main focus of the screen here. He's doing well still in seventh place. And uh, again, just sort of you know, patience, getting the tyres, waiting for those to warm up, getting some confidence. And then I'm sure we're going to be seeing some moves made um, in the next couple of laps or so once everyone's uh, really found their feet. For sure, for sure. Marcel Fuzzy still Ooh. in the lead. Oh, and who was that that uh, just went off? Was that uh, Whitlock? So that's Ryan Whitlock, the American, off into the uh, field. And uh, he might as well have a picnic while he's there because that is going to send him all the way down through the order there. But it's still Marcel Fuzzy in the lead from Bram de Petre in second place there, just half a second behind him. And that leading group now is a group of five cars because at the back, that is going to be uh, Bastida in the number 13, Mark Bastida, that is caught up to the uh, end of that there. And I'd be interested to see if there was any contact uh, that was uh, involved in that one. So there is our very own uh, Michael Hamlet uh, just behind. And he, he's had a solid start. He's had a very, very good, solid start. No dramas, no issues. Just pick off uh, some of the cars one by one. Yeah, it's very true. But, you know, P6, again, obviously from Whitlock's unfortunate uh, unfortunate spin out of Variante. Yeah, I think, to be fair, it was doing really well. You've got the Bastida only a, a couple of tenths ahead. We've got a replay here, and this was indeed of Whitlock. So we're going to see a little bit of a gap there. So I don't necessarily think contact, uh, contact was made. I reckon it's going to be a bit too hard over the curbs on the inside. Yeah, again, cold tyres over the curbs, clipped some grass, and then the car was gone almost before... Um, the, uh, pretty much to be fair before, I think even the real exit of the, uh, of the chicane, I think jumping over that curb, especially a couple of that with cold tyres, it was it was never going to end well, unfortunately. So, yeah, a little bit unfortunate for uh, for Whitlock. Um, he's all the way down. I'm just looking. He's all the way down in P18. He has got the pace, I'm sure, so we're going to see some positions. Uh, he is going to gain some positions, I am sure. But I think it's more of damage limitation for him now at this point. 
Yeah, we'll see how that one pans out. But fifth place of Mark Bastida uh, just ahead of Michael Hamlet. Samir Falk in seventh place there. And uh, Samir all over the back of Michael. Michael getting a little bit of breathing room. And Samir actually coming under pressure now from uh, Saristo, from Oscar Saristo, the number nine car, just behind him in eighth place. So it, it, one thing I love about this track and these cars is that it, it kind of, it's like a pendulum. It goes back and forth. One lap we'll see uh, two cars fighting out between themselves and then the next lap, that car, the, the car behind will drop off and have to defend itself from the, the car trying to get up. So we've got two separate groups going on right now, Dan, but that lean group of Fuzzy, Depreteur, uh, Norton and Rab are absolutely away right now. They are, in, they are indeed. Again, you just look at this gap here. They are, at the moment, um, on their own, as we see. Uh, so, yeah, this is uh, Rab and uh, this is uh, Norton Burr. But I think Saristo actually was looking um, pretty racy at the moment. So he's in P8. Obviously, there's a battle by the looks of it, I believe, for P5. It is indeed. And that uh, is coming up now. So you've got Bastida almost, I think, bunching this pack up here. So if you look as well, almost going two by two, there's there's almost like two little battles going on. You see a great shot there. This is the, the rear view cam of Bastida's car, uh, the number 13. Again, Hamlet, I think, again, he's just, you know, biding his time here, I think, seeing where uh, potentially you've got Bastida's maybe a little bit slower, where he goes slightly offline as well. So it's all about patience here. But just further back, you've got, I believe that was, uh, what would we say? That was, is it Fook or Fock? Fock. I can't, I, Fosh, that was it. Apology, apology. Fosh, so we've got Fosh and Saristo here for P7 and P8. So it's almost like um, two uh, smaller um, battles going on within this group. As I say that, whoa, that was very, very close indeed um, from Fosh. That, that and we've that also was... got a car off in the gravel on the right hand side, Dan. Just that in the background, that yellow car that you can see off of the car, that is uh, Ben Norton. He was up in fourth place. He lost the place from Alexander Rabbi, what started in third lost the place to Alexander Rab, and I wonder if he's just overcooked it at that uh, chicane again so that's two cars that we've seen caught out there yeah I just think as well it's just a little bit um, it just looks to be potentially we're hopefully going to see replay in a second but it could again just been a little bit more curb too much curb um, on the exit I don't think the entry curb is the problem it's more so the exit as we've got here this is going to be a, a potential move here for Howard he's going to go up the inside going into Tamburello and that was I mean, that was textbook, wasn't it? That was just up the inside, last of the late breakers, and off he goes. So Hamlet inherits now P4, because Norton has had um, his small instant. He's now in P11. But yeah, textbook move there from Hamlet. That was really, really good stuff. Yeah, that was fantastic, fantastic move from Michael there. You could see that he was feeling backed up by Mark Bastida, the number 13 there. But uh, this is the battle for 12th, 13th and 14th place. That is, of course, Steve Muckley in the 42. As we see, uh, that was uh, the number 22 of uh, Marvin Blank trying to have a look up the inside of Alexander Dowling didn't really come to anything right now but uh, also have a look at the, the gap to the leader now the gap uh, between Marcel Fuzzi and Bram de Perche uh, in second place there was down uh, as little as one tenth of a second but it's eked out a little bit there so we'll have to keep our eye on that but uh, Marcel's going to be doing the Porsche Cup as well I, I think uh, later on after this one so Great to see these drivers getting involved in all of the different races that we've got going tonight, Dan. Yeah, it is indeed. It's very, very true. Although one thing they will have to be a little bit... Oh, no, we've got another car off there. I'm not entirely sure who that is. That looks like the number five car. And that was uh, Alexander uh, Pavlik. That is... Uh, sorry, that is actually, I believe... Sandro, uh, Sandro Baccio. Sandro Baccio. Apologies there for, um, for the wrong car call for me. As we got side-by-side -side action, that was, again, couldn't quite see who that was. That looked like the number 42 car. Steve Muckley going side-by-side, -side, going through into the Ravazza. And, whoa, that's very, very close indeed. How... No contact was made. I have no idea. Uh, that was uh, Alexander Dowling, who's lost out big time on there. So you've got uh, Alexander uh, uh, Dudarev. We've got lots of Alexes in this uh, in this field today. But all of a sudden, this battle for P... I believe this is P12. Also, the battle has gone very, very close. How are these... How are they keeping these cars in a straight line with how much they're driving on the grass? Almost like a rally cross stage at the moment. I didn't know Imola had a rally cross track. Uh, but these guys just seem to be making one at the moment. Uh, yeah, battle for P13 is raging on. It's getting ever closer. If these guys keep battling, though, all of a sudden this three-car battle is going to turn into a five-car battle. 
We're going to have to get John Anderson of Gladiators fame on the case here and <laughs> the guys at bay because this is getting absolutely brutal with these four cars. You had two of them. Oh, there's contact, two cars spin, and there's an absolute melee at the back of the field. Three cars, four cars, five cars caught up in this, and that car is going to have to wait there to get back on. I think that is it. Tell me that's not... Oh, that is. That's Alexander Duderev who was left just sitting in no man's land at the exit of the corner. And... Uh, yeah, uh, I think that was that uh, Aqua Minerale that, that that all happened on. I believe that looked to be uh, the Tosa, uh, the Tosa chicane. Uh, sorry, the Tosa hairpin. Do you know what it looked like? I can't remember who that was in front. I, I, I couldn't see who that was in front, but I believe the car that spun in front obviously caused Duderev to then back off. So obviously he was reacting to the car ahead, obviously that had that spin on the exit, and then obviously as he backed off. Again, you know, I can't remember again for apologies. But we're actually hopefully going to see a replay of what happens here exactly. So we have got, and that was in the, yeah. So, oh, actually, no, no. It was fair. tandem, tandem signal. It was tandem, wasn't it? I, I thought it was a reaction. I thought Duderev was reacting um, to the uh, to Lamborghini ahead that spun. That wasn't the case. That we actually lost it on his own accord. So interesting there. It looks to be obviously slightly offline as well, defending there. So. You know, again, you've got to try and compensate for that. If something like that happens, you're offline, you've got to compensate for that. You've got to change your braking, your steering, but it's lot of input. Everything has to change. So, yeah, that would be uh, unfortunate through there. Um, but, yeah, that was uh, a racing incident, unfortunately. Yeah, I'd be interested to see that, that replay again because it can actually tell you exactly what's happened. In fact, here we go. Um, what What's that? If we can get that, that replay back later on, I think what's actually happened is both those drivers have got their uh, their brake balance set up quite far to the front and the car behind has seen that car in front spinning, has slammed on the brakes and the rear end has just spun out at exactly the same time as the, uh, the, the car in front and uh, you know these cars are fast and they're nimble but they will bite you and uh, you know it, it just looks here so here we go. That's, that's just him recovering. But that's that's exactly what it looked like when we saw it from that helicopter view, Dan. It did look like the first car went off and he would have just been in the immediate vision of the driver behind. That's very, very true, I suppose, to be fair. Quick reaction then from Duderev because, like you said, they tandemed um, uh, drifting there. So uh, interesting. But we have got some side-by-side -side action going here. This is between... Uh, this is uh, Ligerston. And I'm trying to do that was the number two, four, three car. That is um, Felix Chef. Um, so these guys are battling again. A bit of side by side action, I believe that is. So um, Felix has got in front of, uh, that was Christopher there going through into the Varianti chicane. All seems to be okay. Both running a little bit wide, but that's not um, gonna cause them any penalties or anything. No, uh, no track limit warnings, I don't think. So that was all good. So we get a textbook move going through there. Very, very nice indeed. And yeah, this is the replay here. This is an onboard replay, I believe, of this is Duderev. So we're going to see exactly, I believe, to be fair, David, I didn't actually think of what you were saying there, but I believe this is going to be uh, pretty much exactly what you said. So the reaction just caused that car to spin around because obviously you panic at that stage, don't you? So he is offline. Yeah, yeah, I think, again, you're right. It was just off balance. He reacted to the car ahead. And obviously the rest is history, as they say. Yeah, I, I might change my opinion on that. I think he maybe just botched it himself, completely unaided by anyone else. Uh, but uh, it, it is what it is. This is the uh, the battle then at the tail end of the pack here. Now, here's what I want to know. What has happened to the number 11 of Gergely Kunzabo? Because he was fairly high up the pack to start off. I believe he was around about, what, maybe 6th or 7th, if I remember rightly. And look at that, he's all the way down in 20th place. So I wonder if he got caught up in the uh, the lap two shenanigans. This is Oscar Saristo though for Lightspeed Esports in the number 10 machine. Looking absolutely resplendent in that uh, white and red livery. Chasing down Mark Masida who has uh, pretty much started going backwards after releasing Michael Hamlet into that fourth place. And Michael is, is fairly caught in no man's land because he can't get up to the... Uh, to the leading group right now. Alexander Rab, Bram de Perite, and uh, Marcel Puzzi in the lead. We do have a replay here, and I believe this was, the, yeah, number, oh, the number 11. So yeah, that was, he was saying, that was uh, uh, Kanzabo. I think he got helped round a little bit there by the looks, going into uh, 
uh, going into oh. and, and he decides to oh. do a pirouette himself. Look at that. I mean, for the crowd, uh, not best for trap position, but for the crowd, uh, they're definitely pleased with that. But yeah, that looked like he got helped round a little bit from Varianti uh, in the Varianti chicane. You hate to see it. You really do hate to see it. Ryan Renoir, Ryan War in the Notice Me Senpai 732 machine. Um, great to see some some humour getting injected into this evening. Uh, chasing down Duderev right now as they're coming through the, uh, the first half of the circuit here. 16 and a half minutes left. Well, can you believe we're almost halfway through this first race? I know. Look at the, I mean, to be fair, with the action that we've had, it has gone quick, hasn't it? <laughs> Oh dear, I'm sure the last 15 minutes are going to absolutely fly by as well. A little bit wide there from uh, Renoir in the uh, very, very uh, bright uh, yellow and pink Lamborghini there. But yeah, this is uh, again on board. So this is the battle for P22, which is still ready. It's great to see, isn't it, David, as well, that we've got battling happening all the way through the field. Even, like I said, down in P22, we've still got the battle going on. I think, looking at it though, I don't know whether it's set up base or something like that, or, or whether it's just confidence in the car at the moment. Uh, but feel it. Look at the drive that he had out of um, the Tosa hairpin compared to uh, Christopher. There, I'm I'm still kind of distracted by Ryan Renoir's livery on that thing. That is an absolutely <laughs> cursed car, if ever I saw one. That is uh, some obsessive oh, anime. Oh, and that is Duderev going very, very white, and he's just cost himself that place. Duderev goes down to 17th place and almost. Uh, drops down to Dowling as well, but uh, yeah, that is uh, hard line to. It's so easy to do into that corner, isn't it? It, it is, because I think as well, because again, they're jumping over the chicane, and you're jumping over, it goes a little bit wide there as well. You're jumping over the chicane. Um, I think it can, you know, if you're not careful, it can almost push the car wide. If you jump over it a little bit too much, one of the inherent things with uh, ACC that I found is if you hit the curbs and really jump over the curbs at the wrong angle, it can just sort of like essentially get a massive amount of lift at the front. Uh, and it just dr it just drifts you wide, so I'm guessing that could have been a, a thing there. Potentially, this is uh, Redwar's tactic here, so we could be uh, using this livery. But as I said, this is Ben Norton trying to move back up the field. So he's currently in P13. So he was in P18 when he spun. A little bit sideways there on the exit. That was of I'm trying to think of the uh, that was uh, the very anti uh, Villeneuve. So that was the chicane going through there. Wow, this is very very close indeed. This is Dowling trying to go around the outside of Duderev again. So Alexander Duderev dropping back ever more. And uh, look at Volodya. So Volodya is going to probably going to uh, try and have a look um, on Duderev as well because he wants to capitalize on this opportunity. Uh, at the moment, Duderev is outside of position. He's probably not comfortable where he is at the moment. He's been overtaken a couple of times. He's, he's a bit out of sync, I think, with himself. So this, I think, Volodya needs to capitalize on this and try and get past him as quick as he can so that the cars ahead don't pull away from him. Yeah, they're uh, being led in that train by Ryan Renoir right now. A little bit late on the brakes into Aquamanorale up the hill then. And then it's on the run up to the chicane. And this is where we see, again, time and time again, so many cars getting it wrong. It's fine to take some curb there, but it's the second curb. If you take too much of that and uh, have your foot on the throttle, you are going to be in for a bad time. But 30 minutes, 55 seconds left to go in the race. It's still Marcel Fusi by a second in the lead over Bram Depertre. Uh, then it's Alexander Rab in third place. And then Michael Hamlet, our very own Michael Hamlet, uh, into fourth place. Mark Bastida in fifth place as well. So uh, I, I think that's starting to settle down at the top. And all of the action right now is this battle for 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th and 19th place. It's a five-car train right now. And Ryan Renoir in that, that resplendent livery. I, I've got to be honest, do you think he's trying to disguise that car as a Pokemon? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it could be a tactical sort of way of, of distracting a, you know, distracting his, uh, uh, his fellow drivers, because it is. I mean, you look at that, you have to do a double take in the rearview mirror, I'm sure, uh, when you can see that car. Um, because it, 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 it's a striking livery, I think is the best way to put it. Would you, would you agree, David? I think, uh, uh, I think it's the word. I, I would agree that it's a striking livery, but I still <laughs> say that it does look remarkably like Jigglypuff. <laughs> do, do you know what? I, I, that was a Pokemon, wasn't it? I never, I, I'm not. I don't watch, I don't watch Pokemon. Is that bad? Are, are, are you not down with the kids? I'm not down with the kids, as it turns out. I was more of a Yu-Gi-Oh <laughs> person myself. Oh, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, error. Oh, as we see there. Sorry, we've, we've got a race going on, haven't we, David? So that was uh, Norton actually going a little bit wide. So he's up into P12, three tenths behind um, Fosh at the moment. So that was uh, Smith Fosh. So 
he's trying very, very hard. Is a top 10 on the cars for him? Potentially. I mean, to be fair, you look at 12 minutes left, you've got 4.3 seconds between Whitlock and uh, Fosh. So depending how quick Norton can get by him, potentially we could see that gap come down again, depending on the pace that Norton has um, at this current time. But you can tell he's trying so, so hard. I saw the conservation has just gone out the window completely. And he is now just 110% um, trying to make up as many positions as he can. Samir Falk, though, that last lap time, 154.456. That is not a fast lap time, uh, indeed. He goes a bit faster that last lap round, though, 146.461, but it's still not as fast as Ben Norton. And uh, also, have a look in the background there, because I think that uh, Mark Gibson is going to have a little bit of a say in this as well, in the 101 car. You can just see him getting ever so closer in the uh, the distance there with 11 and a half minutes to go. What a wonderful camera angle this is. A huge oh. thank you to uh, Mike Kiai from Simpler Race for constantly surprising us with these uh, amazing, amazing treats and the, the lick of the flame Ooh. on the dead ship. Oh, and he's gone wide. He's he's absolutely binned it into the, uh, the corner there, cooked the brakes, and that hands Ben Norton that place on a silver platter, Dan. It does indeed, yeah. Just a little bit again. You actually, I spoke to you. You spoke about it beforehand, day before the race, didn't you? Going into that Toshi uh, hairpin, it's very, very dim, and it's very, very easy to outbreak yourself. Exactly what happened there. And yeah, Ben Norton was just like, "Well, thank you very much. I won't have to battle anymore." Slips on the inside, and then off he goes. So I'm sure we're going to see that gap um, open up very, very quickly. Uh, indeed, but the gap uh, this particular lap was just under five seconds between Norton and Whitlock. Is that going to come down in 10 minutes? It's what, maybe five laps or so? We're going to have to see. Anything can happen. Like I said, we saw that in qualifying. That was 10 minutes worth of qualifying. You know, we've got 10 minutes left of the race. Anything can happen. Uh, but currently uh, on your main focus is Duderev. Look, and he's lost it again. That was Duderev going through on the entry this time. You can see how much he just got over the curb. Dan, um, hang on a second. What has happened to Fuzzy? Fuzzy has lost the lead and Bram Depetre is into the lead. Marcel Fuzzy has been dominating this race so far and he's down in third place. He has indeed. Yes, we're just looking. So we're just being told as well his last lap was in the 150s. So with a spin obviously somewhere i don't think cause he wasn't racing anyone so that, that there was you know, there would have been there would have been any contact because he wasn't racing anyone for position so it was obviously just a mistake on his own accord not ideal at all so we've got action happening at the front currently action still happening this is the battle for p16 gonna go to uh we're gonna go side by side going through we're just uh, actually being told as well very anti alta was where fusey lost it and that is dowling gonna try he tried to go around the outside going through into tamborello was never gonna work in a million years because you knew due was going to shut the door straight away um yes yeah, so due has now inherited p16 and off he goes the gap is already and uh, that's well over a second as we've got a replay here and this oh, no. is indeed fusey is it oh it is again oh, it's no. alta. it's very anti it's very anti alta again it's almost a carbon copy of what whitlock did within the first two laps he's very lucky though that he can just jump straight back onto the uh, the tail of that train so uh anybody else that would have been a disastrous moment but with nine minutes left and the fact that he is essentially four seconds off of the lead right now he could very easily still win this race so uh yeah that would be crazy if he he actually pulls that one out of the bag this is chad dylan the number one car in seventh place right now trying to catch up to oscar saristo uh, just ahead of him in the number nine as they come across the line to start their uh, next lap eight and a half minutes left just now and uh it's such a wonderful run this uh, uh, along the run down to tamborello you know early into the brakes and then you just want to let the car drift in Ooh. you don't want to touch oh there we go almost contact between the two of them chad dylan takes that place but i think saristo is going to have the inside line yeah yes indeed they're still going to go side by side i think yes we have chad dylan has to back out of that but he gave it a good old go he tried to capitalize on the opportunity as much as he can but look how he seems to be you can see as well as saristo is now just slightly off balance here he needs to get his composure back nice and quickly because otherwise something like this is going to happen almost we see dylan there there was no contact made but he almost forces the door open still doesn't quite get the move done look at the i think the traction that saristo had going on the exit obviously seems to be some grip more so uh, obviously in the race on there is more grip generally than um where dylan was placed in uh going out of the toes of hairpin but uh that was very very good indeed really good stuff really close racing from these guys as well as we see again dylan closing up that gap 
look at that. This is good. this is going to be a very, very good move here. Is it going to be a move going into Variante Alta? I think these guys can go side by side. Two does not go into one chaps at the best of times, let alone into a chicane like that. All oh, that and absolutely, I, I that I, that wasn't commentator's curse. I I, I call that. Um, that was just unfortunate. Yeah, two cars don't go into one there. Well, um, I normally have a plethora of words at my disposal for commentating, and I'm absolutely lost for them. Um, right, remember on lap one, Ryan Whitlock spinning out. Ryan Whitlock is now up into P9 at the moment. Uh, so I don't know how that's happened, but that's, um, yeah, so we'll see how that goes, because uh, I'm hearing that he might have improved as well and gone up to, to P7. Oh, that was we'll, some uh, of the background that. spinning. Oh dear, we'll uh, that check was, that. Was that Hubbard? That could very well have been, yeah. It just, is, yeah, it is. Watch yep. him drop down the order there. What is it about that chicane that, uh, I mean, you'd, you'd think, Dan, that they see one car doing it and they maybe learn their lesson. Well, potentially, I mean, but it, it, it's, it's hard to get it, you know, it's hard to... I think when you've been practicing it for so long, it's hard to get out of the rhythm. It's hard to, you know, especially going over there, because you've almost got to put yourself in a position where you, you get your car set up and, you know, from testing it, I've done rhythm, but you almost put your car into that, into the line that you want to go. You're almost a bit of a passenger through the second half of it, because again, you're jumping over that curve so violently that you have that front lift and it almost just like puts the car in a position where you can't really do much and then you have to sort of let the car settle down. It's just, if you're slightly offline, you know, it really can seem to go. So we've got a replay here. Um, and this indeed, I'm trying to think who uh, this is a replay of. Oh, that's number 27. Oh, that was Hubbard. Hubbard. That was Hubbard. So the incident that we had. Oh, um, oh dear. So that was just bad from worse. He got just put in the wrong position and uh, got. Um, yeah, that, that that was not ideal. Not ideal from Hubbard. Then. That was that went from bad to worse in the space for about five seconds. Um, chat, we need to get some some rather large Fs on the go. We've had a first retirement tonight. Sandro Baccio. Uh, the number five car has uh, thrown in the tile and absolutely given up. So if we can get some Fs in chat for that. Uh, Felix Sefno makes the move over. Uh, I think that was uh, Vologia in the uh, the number seven car. We've got a replay here. And this is side by side into Variante Alta. Oh, that is so unfortunate. It, it wasn't deliberate because the, uh, the white and red car just obviously uh, over rotated and spun into the other car there. Oh, we've got another car spinning out there. This is just commentate. I think this is just commentator's curse at the Alp, at the Variante Alps of Chicane, isn't it? It's just almost all of the incidents that we've seen have all have all been at um, Variante Alta. So are we going to see any more? We've got, we've got just under five minutes left. Are we going to see any more? I think at the rate we've seen them, uh, there potentially is going to be one or two more that we're going to see. At the moment, though, this is the battle for P3. So, sorry, this is the battle for P2, actually. Apologies. So this is um, Rab against Fusey. And again, a great onboard shot. Eh? Going through into Minerali. Wow, that is a big, big closing gap there. A little bit slower on the exit. So you gain time through the midsection, then you lose on the exit there. Because you need to get that good trap position uh, and the good exit speed there. But look again how much he closes up. Wow. Rab was almost, almost looked like he came to a stop through there. Weather again, like we were talking about, actually, David. Is he a little bit cautious? He's seen Whitlock, he's seen Lot, he's seen Norton, he's seen lots and lots of people that have spun at the uh, Alta Chicane. Is he being a little bit more cautious now? Obviously, we didn't see Fusey make any of that sort of uh, uh, cautious move going through there. So, could that be something that we're going to see now for the remainder of this race? Uh, quite possibly, but we saw Rab going very, very deep in towards the, uh, the final corner down in towards Ravata. Um, and really compromise them. I've got to be honest, I think Fuzzy's now going to get the toe done, and this is going to be on the run down to Tamborello. We can see them going side by side, and Rab's going to make him work for this place. Fuzzy is going to try and go right the outside. They're side by side. Oh, what a move from Marcel Fuzzy on the entry to Tamborello. Take a bow, son. That was absolutely beautiful, Dan. That was so... <laughs> That was definitely the highlight that I've seen um, for this race so far. The highlight I've seen definitely, I think, this year and all the commentating I've done um, so far this year. What a mood. That was just textbook. Uh, to be fair as well, I mean, look at Rab. He gave the space as well. He knew exactly how much space he needed to give. Didn't give any more or any less. That was exactly so great racing from these guys. As Yeah, I, I mean, Fusey, what a mood that was as well. That was just... <laughs> so so good indeed could it be a role reversal now this look at you know you've got the, the such a long straight going into tamborello i mean to be fair could this be a role reversal if we see 
Rab is close enough. He's going to grab a little bit of a toe. Are we going to see him do pretty much a carbon copy? Not if he keeps doing that going through Minerali, because that's going to um, open that gap up. As you can see there, so the gap's now probably about three or four tenths of a second. I don't know what the real toe window is um, going on the straight, but he seems to be losing a little bit more time there. So we've got some more action going through. This is Ben Norson going at the inside of that was a blank there going through, and that was 4p8. We have now it's here. Although, blank, Louis Sudem, we've got a 10-second penalty for him. So that's going to drop him down the field a little bit more. So potentially he's going to drop down maybe to... Oh, why should I say that's not going to help his time and that's not going to help his penalty at all. So he's going to lose potentially another position he already has done. Um, and that was to Saristo. So he's now split Saristo and Fosh up. So that's put the spanner in the works for those two. Chat, we need another big F, please, for number 55. Alexander Duderev is no longer with us. And it uh, looks like uh, that's Marvin Blank getting a 10-second penalty. I'm just hearing in my ear for ignoring yellow flags. So obviously he's tried to to be a little cheeky white boy and uh, he's been well and truly caught there, Dan. But uh, back with the battle for second and third place, Marcel Fuzzi trying desperately to hold on to this place right now. And I was confident that there's a good chance that uh, he was going to be able to catch up with the leader. Not a chance now. The more that he's entrenched in this battle with Alexander Rab, it's done. Ram the betrayer is uh, going to take this win if he can make it round uh, without any issues here. Yeah, exactly. Four and a half seconds, although, you know, as we have seen from Fusey, mistakes can happen. It depends where you are. Uh, it depends where you are on the field. Um, we also were we were told just before. So Blank was, for, I think, was ignoring yellow flags. Is why he's got his um, was why he got his uh, stop. Uh, well, sorry, why he's got his ten second penalty here. Yeah, the battle at the moment still is four tenths of a second. It's probably a little bit more than that now, maybe about half a second. So I don't know. And I'm guessing we're going to be going on to uh, one more lap after this. Yeah, so is there going to be a position from Rab to Fusey again? I'm not entirely sure. I think the gap is a little bit too much, although barring any mistakes could all very well change. Uh, so we're going to have to see as we go through. Uh, but yeah, the, look at the battle. So if you just look on the timing screen to the left-hand side. So you've got the battle for... 10th and 11th but as you can see um in, in the bottom right hand corner of your screen that is um Depretaire, who's coming through uh, yes that is the leader in the bottom right hand corner of your screen so we've just been told as well final lap so we see now Depretaire is on the final lap but the battle is going through is it going to be that was interesting look like rab was on the brakes a little bit earlier whether he was trying to get trapped position not entirely sure um, but yeah very very interesting there like i said it almost looked like he had to back off a little bit um going through is he gonna try and buy this time and get himself up maybe going through into those again you see he's just being cautious he's not trying to make moves where I, where he doesn't think he can is it gonna be a late enough going to toast he looks has a look doesn't quite make it stick i mean david if there's gonna be a position had here where do you think it's gonna be done Oh, well, that is a big, big question because they're on the run down to Tosa. I think it's going to be a a Aqua Minerali. I really, really do. Aqua Minerali. Interesting stuff. Interesting stuff because that is what we're going to find out in a second. He's very, very close. The gap is only about two tenths of a second now. He goes for the outside. Doesn't, I, I think, again, he backed out quite wisely there because that a gap like that does come down very, very oh, quickly and unfortunately has gone wide. So, yeah, that was, I think... Barring no mistakes, again, touch wood, hopefully no commentators curse is going to be happening there. That is going to be Fusey with uh, P2 in the bag because the gap is you know, it's getting over half a second now. Two more corners left, though. One last time uh, for Depriter into Rivatsa, and he does indeed take the win. I mean, he has just uh, he's done what he needs to do, hasn't he, David? It's been an absolutely fantastic drive from Bram. He must be absolutely delighted to take that one because he he really didn't look like he was going to have that one at all because Marcel Fuzzi was so comfortable in the lead and then we saw that spin there that cost him. Uh, and Marcel Fuzzi, brilliant job to get that second place and Alexander Rab just unlucky to have that second place stolen away from him. And look at that, Michael Hamlet taking a fourth place. That is an amazing result right now. But we'll come back to that in a second because we've still got... Uh, battles going on left, right and centre. Oscar Saristo still trying to catch up onto the back of Samir Falk there uh, in the number nine car. The three of them going to make their way across the line. I think it's as you were. And Blank is going to be very lucky to hold on to 11th place right now. But it is Falk from Saristo and then uh, Blank. But again, when that finish flag comes out, um, 
we'll have to see how that penalty affects him. But a brilliant, brilliant race there, Dan. Oh, it was indeed. That was so, so good. So my first ever sim grid race, and I am glad it was this one because that was very, very fun indeed. Still battles happening here. This is uh, Str uh, Strzewski. And I believe in front, that is uh, Gonzalo. So again, not the best race from him, but it's going to be a bit of a drag race down to the line. Although I don't think any more positions are going to be made up. And yes, so that is uh, Gonzalo takes P17. Um, as we Oh, look at the fireworks there. Look at that. That's, uh, you know, in, in what is an overcast day. Uh, but that's, that's, that's brightened up a little bit um, here at Imola. No, I, like I said, for my first ever sim grid race, I, I, I can't, you know, that was really, really good fun. And I've got one more to go this evening. I can't wait. Yeah, Porsche Cup is coming up shortly, but uh, we're going to take a very, very short commercial break. And when we come back, we'll have some live driver interviews on the lead up to our next race tonight. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to a breathtaking start to tonight's Super Saturday here at the SimGrid. It's David Christie here alongside me. Joining us for the first time here on the SimGrid is Dan Handover. And uh, Dan, that was a, a fantastic, fantastic Lamborghini Trofeo race there. It was indeed. That had a bit of everything, to be fair. We did, uh, I think, to be fair as well... I, I wasn't all to be honest, I wasn't expecting the amount of action that we had. You know, I thought it'd be, you know, not necessarily um you know, we had action all the way down the field, which was amazing to see. We had battles going through in, you know, P twenty two, P twenty three, then P seventeen, P eighteen. And then we had as well, you know, battles obviously going up the front as as well. We had lots and lots of things that switched things up and moved things about. And yeah, it was just incredible. And and these cars really suit Imola. It's just a great racing, and it's nice to see this sort of spec series happening. It's it's really, really good to see. So I have to hold my hands up, unfortunately. I was uh, thinking about getting some drivers in, but because we're on such a tight schedule tonight, uh, because we've got all three races coming up in quick succession, uh, we're not going to have any time to, to have a chat with the uh, the drivers from this race or, I believe, from the uh, the Porsche Cup because it will then be straight into the uh, the 2.4-hour endurance race. So um, next race we've got coming up then, as I say, is the uh, the Porsche Cup. And uh, yeah, these are these are an absolute treat to behold. If you thought the uh, the Lamborghinis were something to enjoy, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, have you had the uh, the chance, Dan, to to sample the Porsche Cup? I have indeed. Yes, I absolutely have. And I have a soft. We were speaking about this beforehand. Uh, I have a soft spot for the Porsche. For I think Porsches in general. Like they're one of my favorite car manufacturers. I absolutely love driving them. They're always such a unique driving style, which is what I think I love about them, is they've always got some character. It's the same thing, whatever sim you go through, the Porsche, the GT3s or the GTEs, they always just have a certain character about them, which I just absolutely love. There's a specific way to drive them. And if you can really master it, they're a really, really enjoyable car to drive. So yeah, this is going to be amazing. So it's going to be a very similar setup to what you've just seen here. It'll be a 10-minute uh, qualifying session and then a 30-minute super sprint race uh, with the uh, the Porsches. And uh, I mean, we, we've seen that we had the Porsche Championship um, a few months ago here at the Sim Grid, Dan, and it was... It, I've obviously been lucky enough to, to see quite a few events here at the Sim Grid, and by far and away, it was just the most amazing sight seeing some of the drivers uh, take part week in, week out because the, the level of competition that was there and the level of respect and, you know, door to door racing is is just um, absolutely stunning. However, here at Imola, whereas the nimble and uh, quite, quite lightweight, I'm going to use that word in a completely incorrect uh, term here, for the, uh, the Super Trofeo, because it is one of the heaviest cars on the grid, but it makes itself feel like, it makes it itself feel sprightly, like you can throw it about. But the Porsche, you have to be very, very smooth with this car. You do indeed. I think the main thing as well is, is when you look at the actual, I mean, look at the layout of the Porsche. I and mean, it's really, it's rear-engined. 
and rear wheel drive. Essentially, what you're driving with is a big pendulum on the back of your car. That's essentially what you're driving along with, if you think of it um, in that sort of sense. So if you are really, you know, shifting the weight about from front to rear to side to side, if you're really pushing that weight around really quite drastically, all of a sudden, if you're going to get to a stage, I suppose, again, the perfect example is Tosa. The Tosa hairpin. If you get on the power a bit too soon and you get a little bit of rearward rotation, all of a sudden, like I said, you've got all of the weight over the back end and that just allows the car and it just picks the car up and carries it around. It's so, so, you've got to be so careful because otherwise, before you know it, you're, you know, you're, the, the rear of the car is trying to go into the corner um, first, which obviously you don't want in a racing scenario, let alone, you know, you don't want it on track at all, but especially um, in uh, one of these races where the competition is so high and the competition is so close that any one mistake, as we saw in the Trofeos, can be three, four, maybe even five positions um, in a race. Yeah, I've got to say the rear end going in before you do is uh, it's not the optimal strategy really for, it's not, uh, is it? for the race. Um, to bring you up to speed with some of the drivers that are double stinting from the Super Trofeo race over to the Porsche Cup, we have got the return of Ryan Whitlock. We have also got Mark Bastida. Uh, I can see Marcel Fusi in there as well. And if there's any more that pop out, I will uh, certainly let you know. Now, Dan, um, this is a great thing for me because I can tell you about some of the uh, the drivers that are a little bit more familiar here, uh, you know, week in, week out here at the SimGrid. So uh, drivers the likes of uh, Luca Tavernari, uh, again, Ryan Whitlock, Kieran Prendergast, uh, Gianluca Gantz, and uh, Richard Lindhorst. Richard Lindhorst, who I actually saw during the, uh, the Porsche Cup uh, a couple of months ago, but, uh, you know, Florian Couturier. Uh, a lot of these drivers we see quite a lot, and they are very, very fast. And it'll be interesting to see how this one is actually going to pan out because I think we're going to see a very different race to what we saw with the uh, the Lamborghinis. Yeah, I know. I think, you know, it, it promotes a completely different driving style. It promotes a completely different um, style of racing as well. Um, and this is uh, the Porsche Cup entry grid, um, as you can see on your screen at the moment. Uh, yeah, it, it just promotes... It's such a different car to drive Every, not only does your driving style changes, but as you were saying, David, it, everything about it changes. The, the way you, you know, the way you attack, the way you defend, it all changes. And I think, especially for the people that have just driven in the Super Trofeo, could that be a little bit of a hindrance to them because they've had the Super Trofeo, they they know what the cars like, they understand what the cars like, and they've just had a half hour race. There's a lot to change. There's a lot to change with driving this Porsche Cup, as you can see on your screen here. So the first, we are now in the second of three events for this Super Saturday here at Imola on the 23rd of January. And yeah, so I, I don't know if that's going to be a slight disadvantage there, David. It's a, it's a difficult one um, because obviously, you know, the, the, they're going from the one to the other. But I think to get a fairer assessment of just how different the cars are, it's time to hand it back over to Alex Goldschmidt for another one of our awesome track guides. James Parker takes us on lap here at Imola in the Porsche 911 GT3 as we have crossed the line at over 250 kilometers an hour in sixth gear. Into Tamburello, hard on the brakes, down into third gear at 120 through the first apex, through at 135 on the second, and then through at fourth gear on the third apex coming out of Tamburello. Down towards Vilna, breaking from nearly 230 k's in five, down to third gear now through the second phase of the exit coming out of Vilna, up towards Torza, going from fourth at about 180 down to second gear at about 80 kph. As now Parker hits the throttle down to the floor as we head towards the incline up towards Piratella. Now fifth gear at 200 kph, a bit of a lift off and break and turn in here at Piratella. He's now down the dip once again in the Porsche, building the speed into the first right hander at Aqua Minerale taking about 180 clicks in fourth gear in the first part, third gear at about 105 and that loses the back end to the left hand side but manages to catch it rather nicely as now it's the run down towards Variante Alta down into second gear at about 100 kph on both apexes runs the car a little bit wide to the right hand side on the approach down towards the final double left at the Rivazza under the bridge pushing about 240 in six going down on the brakes into second about 100 through the first apex up into third short shifting to help keep the traction exits the corner at about 120 kph now goes up the gears up to fifth gear 
now up into sixth and will cross the line at over 240 kph. Welcome back then, we are live with qualifying here for the Porsche Cup here at Super Saturday at the Sim Grids. And uh, one thing that I didn't actually mention there, Dan, um, just very quickly going back to that Super Trofeo race, you know, imagine watching this for the first time uh, on, on YouTube and being used to public server racing and seeing that very, very clean start. That is uh, it's quite something to behold, isn't it? It is indeed. When you actually look at, you know, I, I suppose, Again, everyone knows what we see some racing in the background already, chaps. It, it's qualified. The race hasn't gone away yet. Let's, uh, you know, let's let's just save the racing for for the actual race itself. Um, yeah, I, I think everyone knows that online lobbies and public lobbies can be a little bit somewhat aggressive, shall we say? I think is the best way to put it. Uh, and then, yeah, when you see something like this and, and racing happen here, I think as well it gives people that sort of, you know, they want to get involved and they really want to. I know I do. After watching this race, I've sitting there going, I, I, I want to get involved. After watching the Super Trofeo, and this will be exactly the same. I want to get involved in this sort of racing because everyone wants a good race. I normally all these people that as long as I have a race, it doesn't matter where I am along the field. And we've seen that as well. We just see there's just racing and battling throughout the entire grid. So it's really, really good to see. And having, I said, it's just all so close. And I've just looked, that is an amazing livery. That Look at the Mac. I love that. Gorgeous, yeah. I that love a, that. A nice bit of work there. I, I've got to say, Dan, I'm, I'm going to be controversial here. I have to disagree with you. I, what could possibly be aggressive about 15 random cars going 95 miles an hour into turn one at Monza? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's oh, to be fair, it's only pot luck, isn't it? Really, with uh, with some online public lobbies or spa. <laughs> or spa. It's, it's, spa. it's Monza or, or spa, that's it. Yeah. That, that's all you get to race. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, it, it's one of those things where always being in that control. Look at the spit of flames there from these. Oh, I can't. I, I love these cars so much. You're going to hear me sort of like, I'm not going to mutter to myself because I'm commentator, but I'm, I, I'm just, I just love these cars. I get so invested in them. I just look, I, we're seeing some amazing liveries. I love these. Some of these liveries on here are absolutely incredible. Uh, the colour scheme, they're just, they're just fantastic. Yeah, I, having the... Um, and having the sort of close racing that we have seen, uh, yeah, put it in a structured way as well. I think, again, people like the structure. I know I do. You've got, you know, the championship sort of style that we do and the championship style that is going on, even like in these special events here. It's all really structured, well presented, and it's just, I say, good, clean racing, which is, at the end of the day, what we all want. Alexa, order some paper towels for Dan, please. <laughs> I think he's going to need it by the end of this race tonight. Uh, there's going to be a whole puddle of drool uh, by the end of this one. 6.25 left to go in qualifying for the Porsche Cup tonight here at the SimGrid Super Saturday. And uh, this is now going to be the first uh, couple of times coming in for the uh, the drivers here, Dan. And uh, yeah, I, I think we're only about a minute or two from seeing who's uh, going to be challenging for pole. Indeed, well, Daniel Felipe is the first man on the board with 144-172. Uh, I don't actually know what in terms of qualifiers. We've got Whitlock again. We saw him in the Super Trofeo. He's just put in. Uh, and that, that all these times are coming down. All of a sudden, it was 144 was the top of the time sheets. Now it's a 142. So, you know, these times are coming down very, very quickly. So uh, this is uh, Juan Luca Gans, who is currently on pole, eight tenths ahead of uh, Xenofels. That is in P2 with a number 64 Porsche, as we see. And that's now Gans has just got in with a 142.5. Oh, no, sorry. That was, I don't know why I, for some reason, decided that Gans had just put in another lap time. He didn't. Uh, so he's still uh, currently in uh, on pole position. But look at that. I mean, you know, we haven't, this is obviously not the last to qualify. And we've still got some more times to be had, absolutely. But he's already eight tenths of a second up on P2. I mean, I know we sort of, we, we did see a similar thing. I mean, actually, to be fair, um, David, we saw, we, we thought that was going to be a similar case where Norton was just going to run away with it. And obviously that changed within the last two minutes. Um, do you reckon we're going to see something the same or is this going to be potentially what's going to happen for the, uh, what's going to happen for the race? It's a difficult one because I, I feel in my comfort zone with some of these drivers because it's, um, you know, recognisable names. So we, we see Jean-Luc Agantz week in, week out in, in the championships here at the Sim Grid. However, a lot of these other drivers are just unknown variables. So I, I, the great thing about it is because these cars are all identical, it, it lends itself to the fact that it's unlikely that they're going to run away with it unless they're just amazing behind the wheel of the Porsche. Um, and again, 
it's just a case of basically waiting and seeing. However, to have a 7 tenth advantage in qualifying, I mean, that's coming down very, very quickly. Florian Becker with 6 tenths slower, and then Luca Tavanari, another name that we see here week in, week out at the sim grids. The times are coming tumbling, but I mean, that is still a significant gap, 5 tenths of a second. If anybody can improve on that in the next three minutes, we'll, uh, we'll be finding out. Indeed. Well, yeah, just the clock has just ticked to under four minutes as we've got Paul Batty, um, or Paul Beatty, sorry, Paul Batty, Paul Beatty. Uh, that is, I believe, that's going to be P5 for him. So, six tenths of a second behind. I mean, look at the time. So, you've got Gans, who is currently with that 142.507. And then look at how close it is there. So, you've got um, P2, so four tenths. But then you've got um, Lindhorst in P3, another tenth behind. Then you've actually got half a tenth behind for P4. Then another half a tenth for P5. So <laughs> I'm just looking down from sort of like P2 to, what's that? Probably I'd say P7. There's only about three tenths in it. So it's really, really close. And it, well, we, these guys have probably got two, maybe even three laps left um, of qualifying. Actually, I say it, no, they're, they're already probably going to have two laps left. Uh, we've seen a few people that haven't qualified, though. So you've got Fusey there that we saw very, very quick um, in the Super Trofeo. So he's now in the Porsche Cup. Uh, obviously, class you can see down currently in P20, but he hasn't set a lap time uh, as of yet. This is uh, Javier Sifuentes. He is now put in. That is P2 with a 142.945. So he is just um, Zenefels. He's just pipped Zenefels for P2. So that's dropped him down to P3. But again, that's very, very good. Look, that's two thousandths of a second separates to p2 and p3 yeah that's that insane is, uh, crazy crazy stuff and we're seeing diego delgado showed us disqualified from uh that's that's some effort to get disqualified from a i'm i'm i think we need to give him a, an, a, an award so uh presumably that'll have been he's, he's missed the driver's briefing which is uh very much a no-no here at the uh the organized events here at sim grids um purely because it's uh it's just one of those respectful things that you do um to, to hear about the what's expected from your driving standard so if you don't turn up then uh yeah you get a I want to say a slap on the wrist, but I think it's a little bit more severe than that. So uh, we'll we'll keep it we'll keep it PG. But uh, I, I think he'll still be able to join the race. So it just means that he'll start at the back of the grid. So um, yeah, well that's um, it's disappointing for that because it, for for Diego again we we've got no idea of his, his true pace, but having to fight through uh, twenty one fight through twenty one other cars, you know that that really puts your hands behind your back. Well, it does. You're already on the back foot. You know, you're you're already on the back foot with that. Um, so yeah, we'll have to see. Again, you know, it's all about the racecraft. Again, it's it's that sort of format. You, it, it's a sprint race, but at the same time, you've got to be you've got to persevere. Look at that, dude. Another bright pink and and lime green uh, car, which is uh, one of your personal favourites, by the sounds of it. Yes, yes, we do love the. Uh, well, we call that watermelon, the uh, the bright pink and the uh, the lime green. Uh, but Florian Becker in the Scuderia KKS number eleven. Now again, one of the uh, the new names that we've seen quite a few times here at the Sim Grid, and again knows his way around with a Porsche. You can see that there jumps up to sixth place. Jean Luc Aganso still in pole position, though, uh, as we see Paul Petit up there three. Uh, tenths of a second just behind him in that second place there. So uh, Paul Petit moves up and takes that place from uh, Javier uh, Cifuentes. Richard Lindhorst is on a flyer right now. I think he's going to move up into P2. He does uh, one tenth of a whole time and this is going to change thick and fast. We've now got uh, 15 drivers, Dan, within one second. That's going to be so, so close. Is that even closer than the Super Trofero qualifying? I think it is. Yes. Um, that's going to be, again, it's just going to put so much. We see that is Mattis Kopf. He's just gone in to P5. Look at that. Identical time. Look how many identical times we've seen. We saw this a couple of times in the Super Trofero qualifying as well. So we've got Sifuentes and Kopf with uh, 0.387 off of the current poll time. Uh, and we've got, that's only, again, three thousands of a second is Zenefels in P6. So, you know, it's one of those things like that almost 1% less of braking, you know, or, or, or brake pressure or that 1% less throttle, to, you know, or that fraction later can cost you, as we've seen here, potentially like three or four positions. So this now gets to the stage where 
you've now got to switch because qualifying is this close i think quite early on you've got to switch your mind to the race and focus on what you're going to do for the race and how you're going to approach it because qualifying is, is this close there is realistically a lot of positions to be wow. had and if the mistakes are like that you know a, a mistake can cost you five six positions Xavier Sifuentes and uh, the number 91 of Matisse Kopp tied 0.387 behind pole position there in fourth place. Um, that is that is an incredibly quick time. Here's Baptiste Capricot in the number 36 car. Moves up to third place out of absolutely nowhere. Capricot was down in ninth place there. And uh, wow, 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 Ryan Whitlock not able to... Uh, to really improve and that might be going back actually to what you were saying about the the drivers struggling to transfer from the uh, Lamborghini to the Porsche but there you go that is how they qualified it is pole position for Jean-Luc Agantz ahead of Richard Lindhorst Richard Lindhorst uh, just sneaking in uh, with about two laps left to go in uh, qualifying so we saw of course Jean-Luc Agantz in the uh, the Academy Cup in the the, the Porsches as well and uh, Luca Tavanari actually finished seventh in that championship so you know he knows his way around those cars but it is uh, Jean-Luc Agantz in pole position ahead of uh, Richard Lindhorst that is your front row in row two it is Baptiste Capicot alongside Paul Petit in row three is going to be Javier Cifuentes alongside Matisse Kopp row four is Bastien Zenefels and uh, Florian Becker in that uh, pink and purple machine and then on uh, row five is going to be Luca Tavanari alongside Marcel Fusi. It's then Daniel Philippe and uh, Florian Couturier in row six. Row seven is going to be Victor Rodriguez Magnussen alongside Adrian Velodier in uh, 13th and 14th place. Row eight is going to be Lucas Verrill alongside Chris Rubilar. And then row nine is Carol Mates alongside Jose Antonio Lopez. We've got J-Lo on the grid. Can we crack out the J-Lo jokes, actually? Um, <laughs> we've then got uh, in row 10, Ryan Whitlock. I'm only saying that because it was in uh, YouTube chat. Uh, Ryan Whitlock is in P19. And then Chad Dillon alongside on row 10. Row 11 at the back of the grid, Mark Bastida and Diego Delgado. There we go. So Bastida and Whitlock were both in the Super Trofeo race and both of them doing very, very poorly in qualifying. I know, yeah. I, I, again, could that, like I said, could that be where they're just not necessarily used to, they, you know, you've got to change, like I said, you're changing all your driving style. Everything's changing. You've got to change so, so much. You know, these cars, they just don't behave like full on and full spec gt3 cars they, they, they you know they don't they've got less downforce they've got less you know less braking ability like you you know you have to drive them just think i lit you know just a little bit smoother um, and yeah maybe that's something that they just need to adjust to i i think though to be honest we're gonna see some we're gonna see some good race pace so you know again touch wood hopefully no commentators curse i, I i'm not gonna say it, but i will you know if these guys can move through the field they are going to make up a, a fair few positions i feel well, we're only about 20 seconds away from finding out. The green flag lap is about to fly here and the cars will make their way round in formation. Good evening in YouTube chat to Sheldon Musket, one of our regulars here at the SimGrid, taking part. He is uh, a spectator tonight and it's awesome to hear from him as well. Uh, as always, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you're seeing here tonight, remember to hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Hit the little notification bell as well and you'll always Always keep up to date with our videos uh, if you can give us a little like as well you know just it's just me you and a couple of friends what can you do um, get that done and also when you have finished that head over to coach Dave Academy if you see the guys here and you think I want to be as fast as that and you don't know where to get started head over to coach Dave Academy they have got uh, pre-made setups that you can buy and you can just stick into your Assetto Corsa Competizione and they will give you an instant burst of pace. They've all been professionally developed by their in-house team of sim racers and esports experts. So head over to Coach Dave Academy, get one of them. And uh, as always, thank you to Coach Dave Academy and to Thrustmaster for being our supporting partners uh, and wonderful supporting partners they are too. Dan. 30 minute race with the Porsches what are we thinking is it going to be similar or uh, yeah I'm, I'm a bit scared 
<laughs> yeah. I, it, I mean, it's going to be close on the way, isn't it? I honestly, I this is going to be. I just feel this is looking at the times in qualifying. This is just going to be a. We're potentially going to see like a train from P1 to maybe P7 or P8. You know, if these guys can, and I think this is one of the things as well. I like said it's a sprint race, but at the same time, I think maybe if these guys actually work together or at least maybe a group and say the top five or so. We actually saw that in Super Trofeo. Um, and uh, yeah, we saw that in the Super Trofeo. The, the top four actually pulled a bit of a gap really quite early on. Potentially, if these drivers work together, are there going to be some breakaways in terms of, you know, maybe the top four again, like we, like we saw? Or could it be even further than that? I think, you know, again, the track temp as well. Track temp's cold. All the tyres are quite cold as well. So that's going to be something that they've all got to be uh, conscious of as well. And we did see that going through um, the last chicane as they're coming up to now, um, going through uh, the uh, Varianti Alta. Again, you've just got to make sure as almost look at that on cue and everyone starts trying to warm their tires up. They can obviously hear what we're, uh, they can hear what we're talking about. Um, yeah, it, patience again. It, it, you've got to get the tires warm, get everything up to temperature and then get a feel for the car before you can really start to make some positions. So what I'm potentially, I think what we're potentially going to see is maybe not as much racing to start with until at least the first couple of laps. That's my theory, anyway. I we'll could be completely wrong. We'll soon see if uh, Dan Handover's prediction comes true. Meanwhile, the car's making their way down to Ravazza for the first time. They're under the formation lap, so the cars are going to go in a double file and line up alongside each other. And then it's that long run down to the start line and at which point Jean-Luc Agant is going to be the man who holds all the power and will set off 22 Porsches into life here for the next 30 minutes, Dan. I am so, so excited right now. But we look like we're ready to go. We're race number two here for the SimGrid Super Saturday. It's the Porsche Cup. Up next is going to be the 2.4 hour endurance race. And uh, we wait with bated breath to see Jean-Luc Agant, Richard Lindhorn, uh, Rich, sorry, Richard Lindhorst uh, on the run down to Tamborello for the first line and uh, almost at the uh, starting line just now. The green flag is about to drop and we are about to go racing. There we go then. And as Jan Lukagant on the green cab on the outside, it's Richard Lindhorst on the uh, the pink and white. And the, is that uh, Capricot trying to have a look up the inside? He's too far back. But that means Jan Lukagant into the lead then and uh, holds off from Richard Lindhorst as they go through Tamborello for the first time of asking. And the cars all seem to have made their way through that first couple of corners without uh, any sort of incident. They're on the run down to Vilnov just now. And uh, again, the car is still just fighting for any spare position on the track right now. It's then up the uh, hill to Toza, that left-hander. And these cars are going to struggle with that rear end that's going to wash out. And you're going to see a couple of uh, brave, brave moves just now. And then after they've hit uh, Toza, again, on the run up the hill to Piratella, the left-hander, a very, very fast left-hander. And we can see uh, at the bottom there, that looks like the, uh, the number 28 car of uh, Diego Delgado who started last is uh, up into second last so he's made a little bit of a position there actually he's, no, he's taken two places there so uh, yeah he's trying to make his way back up through there meanwhile Jean-Luc Agant through Variante Alta and uh, this is exactly what you were saying Dan uh, we've got a little bit of a, a break going on right now we have indeed, yeah. <clears throat> Actually, just looking through, that was a little bit of a, a little bit of contact there coming out of Alta there, the Alta Chicane. Not too sure who that was, but yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, so we've just been we've just been told as well that it was wasn't contact. It was just uh, again the guys getting a, probably a little bit too a little too happy on the throttle with the tyres are cold. But this is a position uh, for this is P18. That was uh, Carl Mass who has now gone up into uh, that was down into the uh, second half of the Ravazza. So he has made up some positions there. Listen, up into P. 18 by the looks of it uh, but yeah like we were saying as well as we say there this is Sifuentes oh that was contact that was never going to end well it looked like um, Sifuentes he's now just sitting there and he's got to oh no that did not go as well as he'd hoped I don't think that was not ideal there luckily he doesn't collect any more cars on the way yeah I think he was a bit of a passenger there at the point he sort of had to sit there it looked like he moved forward ever so slightly uh, I think contact would have potentially already uh, had been made but I just don't think that that extra little bit um, helped at all. Uh, yeah, that was um, yeah, that was uh, that was not ideal 
um, from there. So, uh, yeah, bit of contact that we've seen early on. Uh, but apart from that, relatively uh, clean, though, as I see, actually, we're going to go three, potentially three wide going through uh, into uh, Piratella. Uh, and that's now backed off going two wide now to Pimitero. So that is uh, Matt and Delgado. I think this is going to be close. Uh, still side by side, but I believe that is Matt who has got the position on uh, Delgado. So, actually, no, apologies, that's not Delgado. Um, that was a little bit uh, further down the field. Uh, but, whoa, that was someone taking an opportunistic move. That was a car number 20. That was Delgado, absolutely. So that was indeed Delgado. So he was trying to make an opportunistic move going to uh, into Aqua uh, Minerali, but doesn't quite get the move dark. They're still side by side. I think he does get the move indeed. They have to back out. Sensible driving going through uh, the Alta Chicane there. Again, everyone backing out, not trying to go over all at once because two just do not go into one at a chicane do. Oh my goodness me, my heart is absolutely <laughs> racing right now. We're only four minutes in to this Whoa. race right now. Oh, and that is uh, off at the back. Was that uh, Whitlock that just went flying off there? And uh, we saw something going very, very wide. This is the battle then for eighth place. Florian Couturier uh, ahead of Felipe and uh, Magnussen. And what a battle we've got going on right now because uh, all three of them are uh, duking it out, but the two behind are in the slipstream right now. Oh, there is the uh, number eight. Eight, that's uh, Luca Tafanari in seventh place. He's getting it all wrong into Tamborello. And uh, yeah, he's going to get absolutely mugged very, very shortly. Yeah, exactly. So that was, um, yeah, that wasn't good for Tavar uh, Tavarani. Uh, Tavanari, sorry, apologies. Yeah, going through into Tamborello again. It's really easy to outbreak yourself. Again, we just have to get a replay of this here. So this was going in through into Tamborello. And it just looked like trying to think who uh who there was the uh pink and green car but oh that little bit of front movement i think just going just forward ever so slightly i think that didn't help with the contact there it may have been a slight brush beforehand but that just uh yeah that didn't help the situation at all um yeah it looked like it again for the life i can't remember who that was but he just came across into turn one did it almost like as if as if he thought the car was wasn't going to be there as if he got the move done i've seen just unfortunately the car was uh, was still there so yeah a little bit of a shame uh, a little bit of shame for that, I believe. Was that Becker? I'm just looking at the car, and we can see the car livery yeah, uh, just for that. So I believe that's Becker. Was, yeah, Becker. I'm trying to ID the the white car that, that clocked into him. Um, it, w it wasn't uh, Cifuentes, was it? I, it, it was. It was yes. Cifuentes. So, uh, uh, chat. I think we're going to need to get an F in chat for Cifuentes for uh, what happens with race control because he's a bit get absolutely destroyed for uh, coming back onto the track like that. That's. Uh, and this is exactly the sort of thing that they go over, Dan, in the uh, the, the pre-race briefing, uh, you know, the, uh, about keeping your foot on the brake and, and not rolling back on the track. And it's even worse because he he didn't roll onto the track. He actually, you know, tried to squirt the throttle, get the car turned around. Oh, and Daniel Philippe gets it all wrong Whoa. in the Tamborello. How the heck did he hold on to that one? Well, I don't know. He still hasn't held on to it yet. He's still doing rallycross. So again, the Imola rallycross track uh, showing its uh, showing its colours here. But this is uh, uh, Felipe. That was uh, that was uh, Felipe losing out a couple of positions. So Becker has now got ahead into P10, as you can see uh, on the left-hand timing tower uh, that you can see on the main screen here. So uh, yeah, that was uh, Felipe losing out of position. I honestly don't know how that was uh, that was held because that looked to be out of control. That would that looked to be out of control for a good six or seven seconds um uh, where he was on the grass so fair play for holding these cars these cars are tricky to drive at the best of times let alone when you're on the grass doing well over 120 k yeah and the worst part is is because that car's went over the grass his tires will take um several corners to scrub that dirt off uh, he'll notice a loss in traction such as the level of simulation that you get here in the set course competition meanwhile this is Bastian Zenefels on uh, the back end of the 91 of Matisse Kopp they're uh, on the run down towards Rivazza and this is looking very very dicey here for uh, Kopp right now he overcooks it but managed to hold on and uh, the two of them are going to do the run towards the line I think Zenefels has got that, uh, that toe right now but I might be corrected because Cop just looks like he's holding on. And then you see Xenophils just starting to creep forward. Indeed, there you go. I think Xenophils actually lifted out of that there. He could very well have done again, just you know, trying to sit back. He doesn't want to race too much. Although, as I said, he had a look, you know, had a bit of a sort of very, very aggressive um, change of direction, uh, actually. Uh, so, so you've got Cop in his mirrors that is looking at that and obviously going to potentially be compensating for it as well. So, again, if he is lifting out, Potentially, I, I I would 
would have thought the Xenophiles would just sit behind him and go, oh, a little bit wide on the grass going through there. That was outside of uh, Vilna, the Vilna chicane there. That's lost him a little bit of time. Again, he's picked up some, some dirt on his tires. You can also see that was a great, great shot. You can see the wheel adjustments and the wheel movements there. So all these little small corrections, you're always balancing the rear of this car. I think it's generally the quickest way to drive them is to be always, I know you've got to be on the limit anyway, but that small amount of slip, that was very, very uh, sideways there. That looked to be, I think that was Whitlock again. Um, so that was, uh, that was uh, it was indeed, we've just been confirmed uh, that that was Whitlock. So again, struggling with these tires. Look at the side, that was Delgado. Was comp oh no, I, as I said, that wasn't commentator's curse because he already lost that by the time I said it. Um, so he <laughs> looked like he went into Piratella sideways, picked up some grip all of a sudden, and then the car swapped itself round. So a bit unfortunate through there, but again, like you're saying, that pendulum effect, it's amazing how quickly it can just take the car, and obviously in that instance, just swap you right around the other side. Yeah, these Porsches can be a bit of a meme sometimes. Oh, that's a nice corner. It'd be a shame if it was turned the other way. <laughs> um, Chad Dillon, though, is all over the tail of uh, Lopez right now. Uh, Jose Antonio Lopez. This is, of course, the 28 of Diego Ooh. Delgado. And, yeah, he's just too much power. Tries to hold into it. Uh, Overcorrects. The, uh, the car grips and then it's sent to uh, space, basically. This is, uh, let's see, Chad Dillon getting past. Now, this is almost three wide going across the start line here, Dan. It is going to be three wide going into, or potentially three, it was going to be three wide going into Tamborella, but all these guys have played it a little bit safe. As I say that, we've got Dillon that's going to have a look. That's Whitlock that's going to have uh, a look uh, up the inside of Lopez. They all do back out of it, and now they are gone. They've now back into their standard position. But yeah, Lopez, Whitlock, and Dillon, this is the battle for P14. Again, Dillon having a look on Whitlock doesn't make... Uh, the moose he's just put himself in his mirrors put himself out of position trying to upset whitlock although we do see that look at how they're so so close to this utilizing all the track available to them uh, i think dylan if he can get that was potentially going to be i think he actually went a little bit too deep going through into the tosa hairpin there and he's dropped off a little bit of time um but that is uh villain Dier, who also as well wants to uh, get a little piece of this action as well so Whoa, that was very, very wide from we just saw coming into shot then. Lopez decided that he wants to make up his own trap. That looked to be uh, uh, just a fraction too wide there going through. Uh, that's definitely going to be a, a warning for trap limits, I would imagine, as they go through Aqua uh, Minerali. The gap has sort of closed up a little bit. Uh, obviously, that smaller uh, uh, off-track uh, for Lopez has pulled the gap up. Is Lopez going to try and hold Whitlock up into the clutches of Dylan? Obviously, Dylan into the clutches of uh, Villandier. So... Yeah, this all of a sudden, this uh, battle of a P14 has just now become a four-way battle and is, yeah, oh, I, this is going to be so... These cars look like they are just on the ragged edge constantly, especially into the braking zones. Again, those sort of like small minor corrections, but they seem to be happening constantly. You know, you're always correcting for that sort of rear rotation that, you know, these cars are so, uh, so known for. Um, but yeah, so Lopez, again, he's going to lose out because he's got no one in front of him. So he's got no toe at the moment. Well, obviously, the guys behind him all have. So, but I don't think it's actually making that much difference. It looks to be maybe the sort of, I don't know, David, but maybe the half second, maybe the f sort of four tenths of a second is the magic number that you need to get that toe. I don't know. Yeah, uh, four tenths of a second uh, under is going to be uh, in the in the line of fire. But the thing is, is that Lopez is inadvertently being an accordion here because they'll, they'll stretch out and then they'll, they'll squeeze up together. And I've, I've got to be honest, Dan, listen to how excited you get over these uh, these Porsches. It is just a, a absolutely fantastic thing. And uh, it's gone there. Oh, there we go. That is, uh, I think that's uh, Dylan that that's gone very, very wide there. And it drops to the back of the pack. Or was that uh, Whitlock? I that think was Whitlock. that was Whitlock. Yeah, that was Whitlock again. So he's just struggling with these cars. It, it, it's just... Uh, um... Yeah, I, I, I know, he's probably he's obviously so used to the Super Trofeo, which is actually, you know, when you actually look at the cars, a lot more planted. I know people were slightly disagreeing with me in chat um, that the, the Lamborghini wasn't exactly a planted car. I think it seems to be a lot more planted than the uh, than the Cup car. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, so, yeah, just a little bit of a mistake. That look going, uh, going out uh, onto the exit of the Tosa hairpin. Look how much these guys are jumping over the curves. And again, Whitlock just had a little bit of a moment. He's definitely not settled in this car. So he needs to get his composure back. And, uh, and go again. I've just seen Becker as well. Look at P10. Becker, he's got a 10 second penalty. Could that be for track limits? I wonder. I think it might have been for the contact with Sifuentes, and uh, Sifuentes has, has got uh, a drive through, and I've got a funny feeling that that'll have been for uh, coming back onto the track in an unsafe manner. 
Yep. So confirmation uh, in our ears that that was for failure to hold the brakes. And to be honest, he's very lucky he only got that because the uh, the replay uh, was a little bit damning. But anyway, we get back to the race. 17 and a half minutes left to go in our Porsche Cup race here for Super Saturday. It's David Christie here alongside Dan Handover bringing you live coverage tonight before our amazing 2.4 hour endurance race. But... Uh, yeah, this is uh, an awesome, awesome race that we've had so far. And this one, weirdly, we're coming up to the halfway, halfway point, Dan. But this feels like a longer race. It does indeed, actually. But I'm, I'm getting a sort of similar feeling. Uh, whether that's because I think we're just. You know, I, I know for me as well, obviously, I'm maybe a bit more used to the format now because we have other super trofeos. Uh, so I'm sort of uh, now. I don't know. It could be a number of things, but uh, I mean, I'm okay with that. I'm completely fine with having as much uh, as much time on these porches um, as we can. So, you know, more than happy for me. A great shot here. This is uh, uh, Zenefels as well. Um, and on the back, we've got uh, Fusey here. So this is the battle um, for P5. Top five, very crucial position here normally. These, these guys are on their own, actually. You look at the gap ahead, you've got 1.5 seconds of the gap ahead from Zenefels to Kopp. I did actually see, oh, actually, as we say that, this is uh, uh, Magnussen going through up the inside. Oh, that was very, very wide and onto the grass going through into the Ravazza. And that was, I was trying to ID that car. I'm trying that to was think the uh, triple two Florian Couturier. Oh, that's not good indeed. That's a place you don't want to go. You jump on that gravel. It's very, very hard to get off. But the gap at the moment, this is uh, Fusey going to go through. Textbook move. That's going to be contact. How that wasn't contact, I don't know. But they both got through. That Hang was, on. I mean... Did wow. I, uh, we need to get a replay of that, Dan. Did wow. he just go around the outside <laughs> and just that act was, like that car wasn't there at all? It did. I, th that was just, yeah, literally, We that was just incredible. How, again, I suppose, to be honest, that was like, that was too hard for both of those guys. Like, the the amount of room that Zenefels gave, he could have not given any more room at all. He didn't need to. He gave exactly the amount of room that he needed to we've just got a replay here so this was just on the outside is a brave move to say the least anyway and he just cuts it off exactly where he needs to and Zenefels just didn't have anywhere to go he it was either sort of I think as well Fusey was sort of putting him in the position of well I'm putting in this in your hands if we do make contact or not because I'm not backing out to be fair he was ahead at that sort of point he was actually ahead so he was well within his right to try and take his operation in line but yeah I mean around the outside into a corner like Tamburello. I wow, fair, fair play. Fair yeah, play that me. was awesome, awesome stuff. Back looking at uh, that was uh, Magnuson that we were keeping an eye on there. Lucas Ferrell uh, get a 15 second time penalty in the Star Trail Snow Shot in 904 Porsche there for avoidable contact. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much completely torpedoed his race given that that will almost certainly drop him to the back of the grid but 15 minutes left to go we've just crossed the uh, halfway point in the race here and uh, just to, to bring you up to speed at the front Jean-Luc Agant absolutely away with it right now over Richard Lindhorst that gap is now nearly seven seconds from first to second place. In third place, it is the number 36 of Baptiste Capicot. And then in fourth place, it is the uh, number 91 car of Matisse Kopp with Marcel uh, Fusi doing that stunning, stunning move into Tamburello over the uh, number 64 of Bastien Zenefel. So amazing racing that we've had so far. This is uh, Lucas Verrill and he is under all sorts of pressure right now from Rubilar, Rubilar in that glorious uh, purple machine around the outside again, he's seen what's happened and he's just went and done it oh no, oh there's contacts oh well, so he's, he's seen what's happened with Fuzzy and uh, yeah that's not happening And it, it, but he's doing the good thing and he's waiting for the cars to go past before he rejoins the track Yep, to be fair, like so that's why they have briefings because you've got to, you know, it, 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 you've got to be reminded of these things sometimes. You know, it, it's a lot because you've got so much information to process. Like having that briefing just to remind yourself of these sort of things, making sure to hold the brakes and etc. That's always what you want to do. Again, we're going to go two side by side, go into the opposite chicane. That's never going to work, uh, and it doesn't. To be fair, but Becker did have a very, very good look on Magnussen there. He's definitely put his car in a position where Magnussen knows that he's there. I think that's probably the best way to put that. Uh, whether that was always going to be a move that he wanted to make or it was just, yeah, to try and put Magnussen offline ever so slightly. Again, he's going very, very deep. You see how much he's trailing and getting the car into the corner. And again, same here. As we see, that was Magnussen going a little bit too wide 
actually on the second half of the Ravazza turn number 18. Drag race down side by side. Is the move going to be done? Because Becker had such a good run and had such a good exit, is it going to be a move that's already going to be done even before going through into Tamburello? No, it's not. Is there going to be a carbon copy of what we saw a couple of laps ago between Fusey and Zenefels? No, there wasn't, but there was nearly a, a big accident there. Uh, and as I say that, we do have, that was Maxon going off. I think, to be honest, he uh, he's still going off. Oh, that's a spin. And he luckily goes um, actually offline uh, and does avoid. That was uh, looked like Felipe. Um, and he's going to lose a few more positions again. Potentially lose a few more positions to uh, Vel and uh, Valandia. So is he going to lose something? No, he doesn't indeed. So he sticks. Um, that is P12 uh, he then goes down to. But yeah, unfortunate to him. It looked like he just drifted a little bit too far over to the right-hand side. I don't think he was expecting Becker to still be there. Oh, my dear. That was... Um... I can imagine the, the air in that cockpit is turning a rather Italian blue uh, as we uh, get back to the to the race there and uh, coming under all sorts of pressure now from the, uh, the number 20 of Adrian Velodier. Uh, what do you say to that? Because the two of them were, were fighting, you know, very, very fairly and uh, it, it just looked like they came together under braking and he tried so hard to, to hold on to it. But again, I, I get the feeling that that's going to be uh, some more race control action. Uh, potentially, yeah. I mean, I mean, to be, whoa, that was a big sideways moment from uh, uh, from Ho uh, Jose Antonio Lopez there. He's dropped a lot of positions, but the move at the moment, uh, Valandia and Magson is going to be, again, another round the outside movement. But it's not, oh, that was a bit of contact there going through into the breaking zone of Rivatsa. Doesn't look like it has done much damage, though. And both cars are still going round. But Fusey and Cop, this is, he's just done it again. Fusey has just done exactly the same thing, although it's not going to make it as easy of a job. And Koff is putting him still under immense pressure, but he's done the same thing. It's just happened to be a corner later through turn four instead of turn two. I, honestly, how, as we see there, <laughs> that was, oh, that oh, that, was, that, that was a little bit cheeky. That was that was a little bit, I think, to be fair, it looked like he actually backed out of that move then. He obviously braked a bit too late. He did. You, I, I think he would have passed him had he not have backed out. So, yeah, recognize that was a bit of a mistake. Uh, and then did pull the throttle back. So fair play. Yeah, a little bit cheeky initially, but you know, like I said all all seems to be uh, all seems to be well. No love lost there, or all being well. But yeah, I can't. He's, he's just done it again. That's just, I think that's now his signature move. I think at Imola, that's his signature move now. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree, David? I uh, I absolutely would. I'm just um, kind of taken aback at Fusi and uh, the progress it's made. I believe it was tenth that he started. And he's up to uh, to fourth place just now. But uh, we're on board then with Adrian Velodier and uh, just trying to catch down Magnussen in a 15-second time penalty for Velodier. So, uh, well, we'll have to, to see what happened there because uh, we saw the, the little bit of a nudge there. But um, or, or that might be for something completely different for uh, some unrelated issues. But, um, yeah, right. Magnussen then just managing to get away because Velodia is he's really really trying too hard to uh, to get past there and you see that he's he's almost overdriving the car back. Yeah, he seems to be he seems to be a little bit as well. Yeah, it's almost like all the corrections like I said you want to be balancing it on the throttle and balancing it on that sort of you know always on the edge of grip but it just seems to be yes yeah, just a few too many adjustments and again like i was talking about it's shifting the weight around probably a little bit too much for uh, for the cars like it and it's not necessarily going to be going to be responding uh, that well although i say that so gaps come down a little bit the gap was about half a second it's now dropped down to just under half a second i'm guessing obviously that was because uh, a little bit of toe um, that helped there as well. But at the moment, everyone stays the same and everyone is staying the same going through there. A little bit wide though, again, going through turn four. Could we be seeing as well, David, as the, the tires that people, if, if, if guys, you know, if the, if the drivers, some drivers are using up their tires more than others, are we going to be seeing this? I'm sure we will do. Are we going to be seeing this actually in, in this letter, you know, closing stages of the race, we're down into the last third of this race. The tires actually dropping off and some guys that have conserved their tires a bit more, are they going to make some late, you know, they're going to have like a, a second wind as it were. Normally, I wouldn't have said that tyre wear would be an issue in a 30-minute race. However, the, the aggressiveness that, and, and the, the shenanigans that are going on with some of the drivers locking up, going very, very wide, you know, really, really throwing these cars about might actually uh, lend itself to, to some form of, of tyre degradation, but not too much that we would normally see in a 30-minute race. But, yeah, that, that certainly might come into... To, 
uh, fruition. Because of course, what happens is when when you do tend to to walk up and you flat spot these tires, and um, what will happen is. Any time that you, you go heavy onto the brakes, it'll it'll keep flat spotting in that same position as well, um, because that's that's the the flatter part of the uh, the, the tire surface. So, I, I doubt it would be tire wear, but I, I do think that it's just people trying to get into the rhythm, and it's that whole accordion effect, Dan. So you know you've got say three cars here, and if they bunch up, that car at the front is essentially controlling the pace. If one backs off behind them that stops all of the other cars as well so it sends them off in that uh, concertina effect the other uh, point to, to raise is uh, something that mia rose has just mentioned in youtube chat as well uh, the fuel load lightening is going to give a significantly different uh, balance and dynamic to these cars and you know while they may have practiced the track while they may have practiced the car they may not have practiced the varying fuel loads that's something to also because I didn't think about. That's a very, very fair point. I can imagine that fuel will have a, a big effect again because, you know, all the weights, again, as we've been saying, um, all the all the weights over the back. We've just been told as well um, that Vell for the 904 Porsche has just picked up another penalty. Um, I'm just, uh, just want to confirm what that penalty was for, um, but that... Um, uh, we've just been told that was a, for avoidable contact. So, yeah, two 15-second penalties, not ideal in a... Not ideal in a race that's uh, 30 minutes long, and you look at the gaps, and they're between one or two seconds. Um, each car is between one or two seconds apart, so that's probably put him, uh, I'd say, near enough last, I, I think, unfortunately. So, not ideal there. Uh, not ideal there in the slightest. Um, but, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, damage limitation, just got to keep going and get out and see what you can make of it. Because again, anything can happen. We've still got, you know, five minutes, 40 seconds of the race. We still, anything can happen. But at the moment, Zenefeld and Kopf again are going to go at it side by side going through. I'd look to be, I thought that Kopf was actually going to back out of it then, but they're not going to indeed. Side by side going through into Tamburello. They're still side by side going into turn four. One of them is on the grass. That was Zenefeld's on the grass. But the move is is done as i say that no actually it's not because coffee gonna try and go around the outside again <laughs> this is really really close up they're still side by side david this oh. is what i love about the uh, the the sim grid drivers dan is the fact that yes there will be you know door handle to door handle but for the most part the respect that they show for uh, for the drivers and one another is just absolutely uh, fantastic to see. So, yeah, awesome, awesome stuff. This is on board with uh, Adrian Velodier. This is on the run up to Toza, the hill, the uh, the left hander, and uh, Velodier trying to get that run out. And he's still trying to get past Magnussen, but uh, he's also he needs to get past that and get as much time up the road as he possibly can to to minimize the damage that that 15 second time penalty does stand so you know it's four and a half minutes left to go here's the battle again between cop and uh, xenophiles but you know I, I think we have to look at the the lead for jean luc Gantz and think yeah, it's done yeah that's uh, it's very very true Ooh, we're gonna see we're gonna go again side by side going through into ravatsa these guys are going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe again, as we have seen. But Kopf runs wide. He has actually gone wide. So Xenophels ran, uh, ran wide going through into Ratsa. And uh, Tabanari has just gone, thank you very much. He slipped up the inside, almost sort of out of the blue. Uh, to be honest, I don't know about you, but almost for, in a way, nothing bad at all, but almost forgot uh, that uh, Tabanari was there. And then to be fair, he's just gone, capitalised on that on that move there, and just gone, thank you very much. Off he goes, but he's already back under pressure from Xenophels. I don't, that was very, very brave there. I don't know, I think potentially Xenophels should see, maybe for the next lap or so, if uh, uh, if Ta Tavanari, if he can catch up with Koff, because they, it might be worth working together at this point, even though if it's just for a lap, to try and close that gap down. Well, we'll have to see how that one uh, pans out because I, I think it's a bit late for uh, tactics and, and keeping calm heads and, and thinking, you know, 3,000 IQ strategies. Uh, looking back, <laughs> though, at um, Velody, Velody is just hammering this car around right now, Dan. Uh, I, I get the horrible gut feeling that something bad is about to happen here because look at uh, Verl as well. He's fallen back into their their clutches and he's already got a 30 second time penalty so essentially he's got nothing to lose right now his his race is done and dusted he just wants to try and hold on to that position right now uh, yeah very true Ooh, a little bit wide there going through as we're saying that was uh that was a little bit wide 
for uh, that was um, Magnuson actually he went wide himself the card that we're actually focusing on uh, yeah, this, this is a battle. As you say, these guys have got nothing to lose. Still want to have some close, clean racing. Obviously, we always want clean racing. But yeah, it's one of those things that... That's a very, very... Oh, these guys are really utilizing the brakes. I think they're probably... They're not allowing much in the tank, I think, for these cars to provide anything else for them. They are just on the limit, and there is no leeway. There's no margin for error. As we saw, like I said, with... Um, uh, Zenefelt. Uh, there's just no margin for that one small amount of braking zone that you break a bit later, or you know, two or three percent later, or a you know, fraction later. As we see that again, another small mistake from Vel, and that's going to cost him one, potentially two positions. It depends um, what uh, Veladier can actually do. But I think at the moment, the move is done and dusted. So Magnussen is in to P11. So Vel's going to have to pull back in. And as we see there, look at that. So we've got the car, uh, car number 20. He's now pulling up as well. Has a bit of a look. Doesn't quite. Um, make the move, uh, doesn't quite make a move, they was way too far back. Um, as we got as well though, we've just been told as well, Fusey is on the back of P3. And he started P10, so he moved up six positions, and to be fair, like I said, with the field that he's got, look at that battle there. So it, are we going to see, on the last lap, if he's close enough, are we going to see another one of Fusey's uh, uh, trademark moves going through into Tamburello? Uh, quite possibly around the outside at Tamburello will uh, wait with bated breath, because at the moment, uh, it's right on the run up to Aqua Minerale, and then I'm just having a look. So Fusey is doing a 143.263. Um, that is second fastest time. That is outrageous. And I've just been told in my ear, Marcel Fusey is taking um, all three races tonight. So he's done the STs, he's doing the Porsches, and he's going to do a two and a half hour endurance race, or just under a two and a half hour endurance race, as Bastian's Zenefels is side by side again with Luca Tavanari. Luca having to defend with everything that he possibly can, and look at Florian Becker in the background as well, just waiting for any tasty morsels to be handed out by these two. But I think Luca Tavanari is going to have the measure right now of... Uh, Zenefels, here we go, Marcel Fusey around the outside, you called it already, has he done oh, it again? Wow. Unreal, three times! He, he doesn't, he hasn't done it, he hasn't done it yet, we've got Capricot that's given him a hard time and potentially going to try and go uh, going through into the Villeneuve chicane this time, he doesn't quite do it, has to back out. So he nearly, as you said David, he nearly did it, I called it, I knew he was going to attempt to do it, couldn't quite make it stick though. But again, we've got the battle down here for P5 that is still raging, actually apologies, the battle, uh, no this is the battle for P5, yes apologies. So we've got Kof Tabanari uh, and uh, this is Zenefels, that's a bit of a move going through there, whoa that was some big side by side action, that was, uh, I, that was a racing against yeah. the looks, I don't think those two um, unfortunately, that was a big, big shame. That looked to be uh, Becker and Zenefels, yeah. That was a big, big shame um, going through there. But yeah, just a little bit wide. Oh, that was never going to work. That was a way too late on the brakes for Fusey. You can again tell, like I said, any small mistake. Luckily, it didn't cause any any harm. Like I said, again, no harm, no foul for Capcot. But you know, again, how hard are these cars uh, being driven by these guys? Look at the speed that Fusey is carrying through the large chicane. I think it was too little, too late. Uh, but we have got, look at uh, uh, Gianluca Gans. The, what a dominant display and a dominant drive. And you can tell he's happy in the way he's flashing lights. You don't even need to see what he's, what he's uh, saying in the car. But look at that race win. What a, what a win for him. Yep, fantastic race win there for Jean-Luc Agant, a commanding victory over Richard Lindhorst there. 7.4 seconds. It's going to be Capricot holding on to third place then, despite the bumper cars from Marcel Fusi. What a drive. What a stellar, stellar drive, though, from Marcel Fusi. Started in 10th place, finishes in fourth place. It's going to be uh, Kopf in fifth place. Luca Tavanari is going to hold on to six. We've got side-by-side -side action. They're still fighting towards the line. This is Lopez and uh, Dylan. I think it's uh, going to be Lopez, Jose Antonio Lopez that just holds on. And who is that going very, very slowly across the line? Um, yeah, that that is... Uh, is that Dylan? I, no, I think that was Veril, actually. Um, anyway, goes across the line. Um, I wonder if fuel might have been an issue there. Mm. Very, very true. Yes, yeah, so it could have been actually, you could see <laughs> just then, again, it, he's very, I think he's actually got the line. I couldn't have been Magnuson, actually. I was just looking at the timing tower. I could very well have been Magnuson, but yeah. So we've just, uh, yeah, right. So I see, yeah. So um, 
yeah, it could be some uh, some issues with the, uh, the the amount of fuel that was put into the cars then. But I, I, I tell you what, David, that was I was not disappointed with that at all. That that lived up to every bit of my expectations and exceeded it greatly. Um, I think though, I mean, driver of that event, driver of that race. I mean, that was Marcel Fusi. What, what, I mean, just to not only make an outside move around Tamburella, because you think as well, you're not only on the outside for turn. Uh, I suppose that would be turn I suppose, two, three, and four. So you've got the section of Tamburello, two, three, and four. He's not only outside for one of the corners through Tamburello, but two. So again, he's on the outside for two out of three of the corners, and yet still managed to pull it off. Not once, but twice, and nearly even a third time. Yeah, a stunning, stunning drive there from Marcel Fuzzi, but a dominant and uh, almost controlled win there for Jean-Luc Agantz there, uh, taking the win from Richard Lindhorst. And uh, amazing, amazing stuff there. So, Dan, your first taste of the action here at the Sim Grids. What was your night like? Oh, it was absolutely incredible. I, I can only hope that you guys will have me back because that was absolutely amazing. The yeah, broadcast looks fantastic. Everyone getting involved on the chat as well is amazing. You know, and also as well, I've just looked. We've got seventy likes. Seventy likes on the stream. It's just it's 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 mega. It's it's really really good. Yeah, this is. I, like I said, I hope you guys will have me back for more because I, I, I loved it. It was so much fun. Really, really good. Clean racing throughout all the field and racing throughout all of the field as well, which is even better. It gives us, I think to be fair to it, gives us a lot to commentate on, which is, uh, which is even better. Well, it was our pleasure uh, having you here and uh, cannot wait to have your dulcet tones back on the airwaves here <laughs> at, uh, at the Sim Grids. And uh, just waiting for to see if there's any drivers coming in from the Porsches. But if you hear that, that is the sound of a bus that I'm going to throw somebody under because one of our uh, drivers from the Lamborghinis is actually with us just now, uh, Michael Hamlet. And uh, I'll, I'll very quickly actually ask you, Michael, what was what was that like driving the uh, the Lamborghinis? Because that was a well deserved fourth place. It's um, it's a bit of a tricky car, the Super Trofeo. Um, it you get a bit of oversteer. Uh, sorry, you get a lot of oversteer on the exit. You get a bit of uh, understeer on the entries. You, you never quite feel secure in it. Um, one minute you're understeering, next minute you're oversteering. A bit snappy at the rear, but it's enormously fun to drive. Um, and, you know, I just set out to be very careful at the start, not gain anything, not lose anything, and then just hope for people to lose at a very anti alta. And that is exactly what happened. Well, thank you very much for that. So, uh, without further ado, we've got a, a lot of drivers, uh, so we'll, we'll get a quick chat with some of them. Um, let us go and have a chat to, uh, to Ryan Whitlock. And Ryan, um, very good evening, my friend. Doing both races tonight. You are a, a glutton for punishment. <laughs> you could say that, especially the chicane at the curb or the curb at the chicane. Goodness. It's it's been a difficult night. I think that is the term we'll use for you tonight, Ryan. Um, d do you think you'll be uh, having nightmares about that chicane tonight? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, I mean, I was definitely disappointed about what happened in the Super Trofeo race. Uh, like, you know, I was hoping for a good battle with Michael there. But, uh, I mean, even though I started fifth, I still managed to recover all the way up to seventh, made some good passes, so I'm actually not too upset at all. When you're uh, as close to Michael Hamlet as you were in that first race, is there ever the temptation just to, to give him a little nudge? Uh, a little bit. You know, in the driver's briefing, he said, oh, you know, punt me and you get banned. And he said he was <laughs> kidding, but um, he you said he was kidding, you but know don't want to take that chance. Don't want to yeah, take that's, that that's chance. That's a life, lifetime ban from the Sim Grid. But, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's it's been a great fun night tonight. And uh, are you joining us again for any of our uh, future events? Um, I'm not going to be doing the 2.4 hours later. I, I need lunch. But, oh yeah, I love doing CSG events, and it was nice being in Split 1 for once, you know, and actually being competitive. Excellent stuff. Well, congratulations, Ryan. It was awesome stuff seeing you tonight. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Right, so let's see who else we've got. We've got uh, Baptiste Capricot, who uh, did such a, a fantastic, fantastic job holding on to that, uh, that uh, 18th... Uh, sorry, not 18th position. I was getting mixed up there. Um, We'll uh, bring him in and uh, have a chat because, of course, he finished third just ahead of uh, Marcel Fuzzi. Uh, good evening, Baptiste Capricot. Uh, you were uh, in the, the firing line from Marcel Fuzzi at the end there. 
great on the last lap. I think I, I made a mistake, a major mistake on my setup. I had too little camber. And uh, I thought this would help for tire saving, but it didn't in the end because uh, I lacked uh, a lot of temperature on my front tires. And so at the start, I had no grip. In the middle, it was okay. And from lap 10 onwards, I had massive graining on my front tires. So I was struggling a lot at the end. And Marcel caught me. And uh, yeah, he attacked me on the last lap and we had a great side-by-side -side moment. But uh, thankfully, I could hold it. And then into Aqua Minerale, he almost uh, ran into the back of me because I needed to brake so early because I had no front tires grip anymore. And uh, he kind of fucked it up. And uh, so he threw away his last change to overtook me, maybe into the last corner. And I could hold on, but uh, yeah, intense race, uh, really fun. Excellent stuff, Baptiste Capcott. Thank you very much for that tonight. Uh, final driver that we'll have a quick chat with is uh, Richard Lindhorst, second place. Uh, Richard, good evening, my friend. Uh, second place, and uh, you, you were kind of just all by yourself there. Hi, guys. Yeah, um, I've outperformed, uh, or I've overachieved in qualifying a little bit, um, and I was lucky to uh, get on with Jan Luca in the first one or two laps. And then there was a gap of two or maybe two and a half seconds already after two laps. And then it was just more or less a lonely race as uh, Jan Luca was so much faster than the rest of us. Um, in the end, he slowed down a bit and therefore we could um, we could uh, make some some ground up. But in the end, he was just too quick. Was it a, was it a fun race tonight, though? Of course it is. Um, every time you you uh, organize a race with a cup Porsche, it's fun and it's just the best car in the race, if you ask me. I could have put it any better myself. Well, well done on the second place, Richard, and uh, we'll see you very soon. Thanks, guys. So there we go. That is us done and dusted for the Porsche Cup. And Daniel, um, this is time to say goodbye, isn't it? It is indeed, yes. It's been an absolute pleasure, gents. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. And, and like I said before, you know, thank you to everyone uh, for having me on. Thank you to you guys for having me uh, and, and be a part of it. Uh, and I look forward to, to seeing you back in the commentary box again, David. Well, I very, very much look forward to that. Dan, hand over, ladies and gentlemen. And with that, we're going to take a very short commercial break. When we come back, we're going to have the build-up for the 2.4-hour endurance race. Well, hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, that's plenty of time for you to calm, to take a deep breath and to get your heart rate back under control because we're about to elevate it again with our amazing 2.4 hour endurance race here at Imola. Joining me for it tonight is none other than the one, the only, Mr. Alex Goldschmidt. Alex, 
Good evening, my man. We've heard you throughout the night on your awesome track guides. We're going to have another one in just a minute. But how are you, my friend? Good. Um, fantastic coverage so far of Super Saturday. Um, and really glad to be a part of uh, the finale and the 2.4 hours of uh, Imla here on SimGrid. Uh, yeah, it's just been a fantastic uh, event and credit to everyone at SimGrid. You know, Mike Kiao from Simply Race is always with the fantastic broadcast angles. Uh, good to see uh, Michael Hamlet getting behind the wheel and uh, giving someone, uh, everyone something to think about uh, on the Super Trofeo race earlier on. But Marcel Fuzzi doing three races in a row. That man is a machine. Yeah, he, he certainly is. And he's shown uh, the the intent that he's got, Alex. I know you were watching the uh, the races there, but the the way he was able to, to manoeuvre that portion, the, the raw pace that he had, is now hopefully going to be translated into Aston Martin power because that's what he's driving tonight in the 2.4 hours is the AMR V8 Vantage. Yeah, very much the case. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we, we've got quite a good uh, myriad of different cars here. You know, you've got the Bentley Continental, which has got the biggest fuel tank out of everybody. Um, you know, a lot of the grid, probably at least 30% of it, looks to be Mercedes power. You know, a combination of both the Evo and also the non-Evo AMG GT3. You know, we've got a few mid-engine cars. You've got the Lamborghini. You've only got one Lamborghini. You've got a couple of, uh, I think, one or two Audis at the very most. Uh, the McLaren 720S. I see hardly any of them. Uh, Joe McCauley, who we saw trying to uh, battle against uh, Zoldatov back on Thursday night, um, back again behind the wheel of the NSX. So, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of different things that we need to talk about here about the different cars that are being used here tonight. And uh, we're going to have plenty of time to chat about that over the next two hours and 24 minutes. Uh, so this is, of course, here at Imola. It is going to be a 2.4 hour event. And uh, I'm really, really excited for it because obviously we're about to get qualifying underway very, very shortly in uh, just about eight minutes time. And I'm looking at the entry list for this, Alex. And the great thing is, is that now you're getting to to, to know some of these names. Uh, you've got Jack McIntyre there. You've got uh, Matisse Kopp, for instance. Uh, we've also got uh, Michael O'Brien. Uh, we've got Sigur Ludvigsen, uh, Marcel Fusi. A, a lot of these names we hear time in, time out here at Simgrid. Yeah, I mean, also one that we've got to keep an eye on, uh, actually a Maltese driver, Sheldon Muscat, uh, in the number 14. He's rapid. He runs with GT Omega RPM Esports. I've had the pleasure of uh, commentating on him. Yeah, uh, Alexander Palik, who I've, I think I've, I've seen pretty much on every single grid that I've commentated on here on SimGrid and, and also other things as well. You know, George Boothby, who won uh, Thursday night's GT3 at the Stacked Out Spa Spectacular. Uh, Macaulay um, Van Droyten was running in GT4 at Spa, um, was in contention uh, for it as well. You know, uh, Jack McIntyre, I know from uh, a few other things that, you know, he's pretty rapid in his own right. Uh, David Kalosai, Michael O'Brien, obviously, uh, he's from British GT. So you're getting a good amount of crossover here tonight for the for the two points of four hours here at uh, Imola. Interesting spread of cars as well. Now, we do always see this throughout the events, but again, a, a very different mix tonight. We see Alexander Pavlik and uh, I believe it's Rob Taplin are the only two representing the uh, Lexus RCF GT3 car. As you mentioned at the outset there, uh, Alex, the Mercedes seems to be the, uh, the, the popular car tonight. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff, uh, you know, quite a few Porsches out there. I think I count at least three of them. Uh, Yannick Huoff, who I've uh, had the pleasure of commentating on in other leagues, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's he's going to be, uh, you know, he's going to really have that opportunity of, of maybe, you know, but then it comes down to the, the mid, the rear engine cars, uh, that kind of stuff as well. The agility is going to be a key point here, but also the straight line speed. So you've got to have that car that's right between the middle. Uh, of of those you know and to get the right balance on the car because at the end of the day it, it's not about how fast you can go in a straight line it's how consistent you can be around this circuit just over three miles you know there's a lot of turns here as well and that can really really make all the difference but then you've got to look at the strategy call you've then got to look at say it's three mandatory pit stops 
in this race. They could be taken at any time. You know, you could see the likes of the Kaiser, Kachalo, Scattergood that are in the Bentleys. They could go long on the first in and not have to put so much fuel into the cars. And with that, having a heavier, a lower center of gravity in the car with a, a heavier fuel load, it's going to give the car a bit more traction. But as that car raises, as the fuel lowers and the tires sort of wear away, the car, of course, is going to get quicker. But it's not going to help the aero that much in comparison to what it might have been with, uh, you know, a full tank of fuel. Uh, a brand new set of tires on it and it's also dependent on how far you want to push that envelope and we've seen it before where drivers have gone long in the first in uh daniele bramila for instance thursday night in gt4 perfect example no 90 minute race left both pit stops until the last six or seven minutes if you do that you and you're in contention with the victory you need to make sure that you to your strategy in a better way and look to do the longer undercut on the drivers that you're battling with so you can really really give yourself the best strategy call possible for sure for sure five minutes then to go until we head into qualifying and then we actually have the race in at 20 minutes after that but uh we, we've seen some really wild racing tonight, both from the Lamborghinis and then from the Porsches as well you know, they're, they're going to have to be a lot more patient rather than the 30 minute sprint races where you can kind of just throw everything at the, the kitchen sink and hope something sticks. With this, they really are going to have to uh, to take their time, aren't they? They are. It's not about, um, you know, we all know in endurance racing, David, you can't win it at turn one. You know, the, the, the thing is, you've got three apexes to deal with at Tamburello. And that in itself is, you know, it's as its own challenge. And the drivers that really, really sort of keep their nose clean, cross the T's, dot the I's, it's going to be, it's going to be that person that has that perfect balance. Okay, we know that not every driver is perfect. They're going to have those little sort of nuances that they're going to have to get over in order to make sure they get at the sharp end of the grid. And with George Boothby coming into this race, having won at the Spa Multiclass on Thursday night he's the one on form at the minute and now he's the one that's got the target on his back well with just a couple of minutes to go until qualifying i think now would be a great time to hear your dulcet voice again alex for the uh, the fantastic track guides that you've uh, narrated for us we're now on board with the 488 gt3 evo quite apt that we are in imola on the 4.909 kilometer circuit as we go on board with Craig Schill as it's the run down towards Tamborello as up to sixth gear before slamming on the anchors with around about 125 meters before the first apex through at second gear at about 135 kph now building the speed as we're going to make our way down towards uh, Villeneuve is the chicane just here into the left down to third gear down to second for the second part of it or the next left hander at Torza down from third gear at about 180 k's down to first gear tight into the apex before pushing the throttle down hard up towards the next left hander at Piratella as we build the speed going up the hill and down from around 220 and fourth down to third gear at about 140 on the apex down the dip as this uh, track sweeps to the left hand side before the double right at Aqua Minerale through the first part in fourth gear through the second part in second gear because now you start to wrestle with the car on the apex and on the exit up under the wards the bridge before heading to Variante Alta taking it second gear you've got to really make it nice and neat and tidy through the chicane otherwise you will be pinged for track limits before the next uh, couple of corners go under the next bridge run down to Rivazza here in the Ferrari down from fifth down into first first apex taken at 100 kph now building the speed with a bit of a lift off the throttle trying to go out to the car to rotate through now building the speed up to fourth gear foot flat to the floor and across the line at just over 230 kph in fifth gear for you if you see that and you think how can i not drive like that 
get yourself over to Coach Dave Academy and have a look at their uh, pre-made setups. We've mentioned it a few times tonight, but uh, they are our wonderful partners here. So we will take every single opportunity to tell you just how fantastic they are. You can see that there. You can get yourself ACC setups that are pre-developed by some incredible esports drivers. You've got track maps is there. The a new service that they've actually started offering, and we haven't really spoken about this, is Sim Coaching. So if you want that one-to-one -one touch, you can actually get in touch with them, book a session, and they'll remotely watch how you do things in a set of course of competition. You can get the legend himself, David Perel, Jordan Pepper as well, and Nick Foster, Kelvin Van der Linde, and uh, yeah, they are some big, big names uh, for getting your game up to speed. So head over to Coach Dave Academy and uh, get that sorted out for yourself as well. And also another huge thank you to our uh, other partner, uh, Thrustmaster, for the uh, wonderful support that they always provide us. If you're enjoying the stream tonight, remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel, give us a like, and uh, go, and, go and buy some stuff from Thrustmaster. Right, Alex, race time. We are ready for qualifying. Um, what are what are your thoughts ahead of it? Well, I mean, looking at the track conditions at the moment, sunshine peeking through the clouds here at Imola. Um, and there is a bit of a wind pickup as well. So depending on where you are on the circuit, you know, if you're on the, one of the long straightaways, you know, heading from Rivazza down to Tamborello, if, if it's blowing one way, it's going to be a headwind. If, if not, it's going to be a tailwind. Uh, you know, qualifying is now underway. We're on into the first like minute or so. It's going to be rather interesting because Imola, we've seen before that it is a difficult circuit to overtake at. But if you get out of, uh, say, Aqua Minerale correctly and, and manage to get through Variante Alta okay, you're going to have a good throw, a run through to Rivazza, you know, coming out of Tamborello down to Villeneuve. You know, those are really, really good overtaking opportunities. But we could see that some people trying to thread the eye of the needle uh, as we now head out on track. We certainly do. We see the, uh, the number 125 of James Bacon in the... Uh the Aston Martin Vantage, a, a nice little representation for that. Uh, you've got Yannick Ruoff, uh, there's also James Bacon, Marcel Fusi, Segur Ludwigsen, Timo Burkle, and uh, just I'm going to scroll through the list. I think that is five uh, Aston Martins. Make that six. Florian Fleer is in that uh, car as well. So the, the British manufacturer getting some great representation and I do believe I only see one Bentley and that it no sorry there's three uh, Amadeo uh, De Kayser you've got Kim Cachilo and Ben Scattergood uh, all grouped together in the uh, the Bentleys there so it's going to be really interesting to see how this qualifying session pans out because track um, you know track space is going to be such a premium Alec yeah, it looks like uh, there's been a couple of driver uh, car changes. Jack McIntyre in the 37 has switched to the Mercedes from the Mercedes to the Ferrari, and uh, Nicholas Huben in the number 22 has gone from the McLaren to the Audi. So, a lot of drivers leaving it until the last moment to uh, uh, sort of try and get the right car from because these drivers will have been testing a lot before um, this race, and so they will have gone through you know several several different situations uh, as such and yeah uh you know the kaiser being one of the uh, many drive the three drivers that have stuck with the Bent bentley um so yeah it's going to be rather interesting uh, and obviously the handling characteristics of each respective vehicle will be put on test uh, as well as the driver skills tonight so a very good evening to everyone that is watching on youtube if you're uh, joining along let us know who you think who you're supporting for tonight who you think is going to take the uh, the win tonight who you think is going to take a uh, pole position and uh, yeah this is this is going to be interesting what you're going to have to do though is you're going to have to give the cars a couple of minutes just to get uh, warmed up to get some heat in the tires and to get some uh, respective lap times going in but we're already starting to see some a very very fast lap times coming in already i think 141 was our fastest during the brief practice session that they had but now we're straight away alex no messing about into the 140s yeah tobias kornwald in the uh, number 52 is put in a 140.374 kim kachilo in the number 10 bentley goes second and there's nearly seven tenths off uh and Florian Fleer in the number 23 Aston Martin at uh, eight tenths off. There's Michael O'Brien running in the, uh, well, the same livery that uh, 
Jensen Button's team runs in British GT at the moment, the uh, Rocket RJN colours in the number 22, so he should be trying to get onto a hot lap, but now 14 drivers out of the 30-something, uh, I think 32 cars that we possibly got on the grid, maybe 31, uh, now have set a lap time as Michael O'Brien uh, punches the throttle down in the McLaren 720S GT3. Currently showing in P20 as he goes P6. Great lap from O'Brien, a 141.295. And even with uh, 15 minutes still to go in this session, you know, track temperature isn't that great in terms of temperature at all. You know, 13 degrees. And look at the wind pickup, 15 kilometers per hour. For sure. And uh, what's also going to come into play is the fact that the time, it's 8.05 p.m., and it's just going to start getting darker. It's going to get colder very, very quickly. Uh, Jack McIntyre heads back into the uh, the pit lane. Uh, but, yeah, so it's, it's going to be dark, uh, uh, pitch black, by the time we get finished tonight, Alex. And uh, it's going to make for a very spectacular finale. Well, a bit like the... Uh the 90 minute multi-class spa on thursday night you know we went deep into the night and it looks to be even more the case here as we're now with uh, jack mcintyre in the number 37 running in these guy tempesta colors uh, as he comes through the second left at uh, rivazza so will mcintyre get himself up into uh, the top 10 we are about to find out as the ferrari hurtles its way across to the finish line and mcintyre on that particular occasion was actually a second down so might have had a bit of traffic to deal with i've got to be honest alex i, I really do like that livery of jack mcintyre very minimalist but very very pleasing to to see heading around the track here yeah uh then we've got uh, Attila Denks in the number 18 uh, G Simulation eSport car. That is a bright banana yellow BMW. Um, and that is uh, that could definitely be seen from Google Maps if you had a satellite a few <laughs> miles up in the air. I think he'd be, you know, uh, but then Jan, uh, Yannick Hema in the uh, number 241 Nissan. I think the only Nissan GTR we've got on this grid. So Godzilla not feeling the love here tonight at Imola. But one of the biggest things that I've noticed here is that we've hardly... I mean, look at the the barrage of other brands, apart from the likes of Ferrari, Lamborghini. I, I, I hardly... I see two prancing horses out of the top 25. That's incredible for, for a... a, a, a a mark such as Ferrari. You've also got Lamborghini. We, we were due to have one on the grid in the form of uh, Denis Suarez. Uh, and Suarez has switched to the Audi. To the, to the rebellion Audi, no less. Uh, the clues in the title, I think, on that one, deciding that the, the Lamborghini isn't for him. This is uh, Grigory Mostman in the number 77. Mercedes just making his way up through the hill there towards uh, Variante. And... Uh, the chicane has caught out so many people tonight through the uh, the previous two races at Variante Alta. Uh, do, do you think we're going to see more of the same tonight uh, in the 2.4 hour? Or do you think some of the drivers have seen what's happened there and they, they kind of know better? I think it is going to be one of those places on the circuit where it will catch drivers out at the slightest of moments. I mean... You know, on the on the hot lap for the Super Trofeos that I did earlier on for, for this evening, you know, you saw how Gregor Schill was you attacking those curbs. At Tamburello, you can get away with it, but Variante Alta, you know, it's a second gear uh, chicane um, and 100 kph, you know, you're not going to see two abreast. The drivers really will now have to be on their A game and sort of watch it a little bit because, as I said, you can't win it going through Tamburello on that one. You can't go go for the move on variante alta and expect for it to pay off because first thing you're going to get is an instant track cut and if you're on your second warning no it's it, it's going to put you on an instant drive through and that's not what the drivers want tonight they want to do three pit stops they don't want to have a drive through they don't want to have a stop go 30 uh, penalty after speeding through the pit lane uh, and that's where the drivers we, we've seen it before you know, British Classic, Japanese Night, and the Multi-Class at Spa, we saw mistakes being made. This is a bigger test for these drivers now, uh, especially for those that we've seen. Okay, yeah, they'll be good at what they do, but you can't, 
you, you can test the limits of human human endurance in both mental and physical but there's only a certain point before your mind or your body decides i'm getting tired and fatigue is uh, such a thing i mean i i can attest to that having uh, been taking part in uh, a, an endurance race on a, on a different platform today i'm actually in the middle of one I, I did a what was it? I think it was like a five or a six hour stint and by the end of it you, you know you, even by the end of two hours by three hours your wrist is cramping up your your neck is aching from from the concentration and you know some of these guys are doing it in VR as well so you know, all of this adds to the to the physical and mental toll um, of these these next two hours so uh, do you think there's any way that these these uh, drivers actually prepare for that sort of thing, Alex? Well, they've got to take it in the right sort of the professional aspects. I mean, I know for a fact that Marcel Fusi will be feeling rather tired after two 30-minute sprint races. And then you go into a 2.4-hour endurance race. I hope he's well hydrated because the thing is, is that if you're not hydrated enough, if you, if you haven't, you know, there are we know that there are professional sim racers out there and these drivers have to be on their a-game you approach it like if you were if you were in the real life side of things you've got to be on your a-game you've got to make sure that you're fed properly you you got the right hydration on board um you know electrolytes that's one of the key things in terms of you know real life drivers that have to use electrolytes as part of their training program that their tights rather important as well and um you know that's where it could all really really go for it as uh, we look to see that uh, Kevin Scolari in the 209 about to cross line currently P7 at the moment goes P3 on a 1 minute 40.533 but Grunewald uh, still leading the way on a uh, 1 minute 40.227 and what's really struck me about those times Alex is that despite having the flurry of first lap times coming in it's remained relatively static uh, since that point. We've now got uh, 11 cars within a second of your pole sitter, but um, I, I do wonder if the track conditions are meaning that they're really struggle struggling to improve on their, their previous laps. I think that could be the case, David, because once the track temperature starts to go, you know, the sunlight starts to fall and, and the biggest thing with that is that the residual heat on the surface of the tarmac is not is going to cool. It's then going to, you know, as soon as, uh, you know, Chemistry 101, you put warm tyres on a cold surface, what's going to happen to the warm tyres? They're going to start to lose their adhesion. Um, and that's where things could get a bit tricky. You know, the car could get a bit tail happy through certain corners. You know, you're braking from around 270 in sixth down into Tamburello at about third gear as uh, Sheldon Scott Muscat uh, goes. Uh, that was quite literally uh, rally crossing. I think, uh, I hope he's not trying to do like uh, Valentino Rossi would do at the, uh, the Monza rally, but he's got that Mercedes back out on the track. Um, but yeah, the, the, and Boothby is now two tenths up and he's running P5 at the moment. So this could put him around about the same sort of uh, pace as uh, Kim Kachilo in the number 10 Bentley. So Boothby looking to really put one on uh, the Frighteners on Grunewald and Kachilo in the number triple six Mercedes. Yeah, if he if he can do that, that's exactly right. He would potentially end up in second place, but I think he's he's lost a little bit in the uh, the last sector there. Indeed he does. He doesn't improve on his time. This is the uh, Keck Esports uh, machine of Eunice van Droyten, the 995 Aston Martin, and those uh, those colours are iconic from uh, Keck Esports, the uh, purple and green. Uh, he aborts his lap and pulls off into pit lane with six and a half minutes left to go. This is Nicholas Hulban for the Retronic E Racing uh, 24 Audi. He's currently three tenths up at the moment, and uh, I believe that looks like it's on the run down to Piratella and then through to Aqua Minerale. And uh, yeah, as soon as we put any attention on him, he's went and invalidated his lap. So Sheldon Muscat, we saw him, Alex, doing a little bit of rally crossing. He, he seems to be liking the exploring the track edges just now. Yeah. But it looks like, yeah, I mean, Muscat, I've, I've watched him. I've had the pleasure of commentating on him before. But Gronewald looks to be up. He could be going into the 39s. Four tenths up as he now heads towards the uh, 
finish line here in the number 52 Euronics Gaming Mercedes and puts in a 139, 7 for 1, and he's 7.5 tenths up on Kachilo. Ridiculous. That is, um, yeah, that's a bit of a bombshell, that, to go 7 tenths of a second at least faster than the rest of the field. Something's got to have... Uh, something's got to have triggered within Gronwald to, to be able to pull that together. That is an inspired lap right now from uh, Gronwald in that uh, number 52 Mercedes. Wow, I, I honestly don't know how to respond to that and I think I'm not going to be the only one because I don't think any of the drivers really, with what they've had right now, they've had 12 minutes already to show what they've got. Nobody's even coming close right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's the number 11 of uh, Gary Huang from the uh, Team uh, Fu 11 Pace uh, coming through into what is going to be up towards Piratella. But yeah, you could see like several drivers trying to really explore the track limits as Huang gets all the way over to the right hand side before he throws the car into the left hander at Piratella before the dip down into Aquaminadare. You know, a little bit of a kick up on, on the dust on the left hand side, but he turns it in nicely. Uh, gets on the brakes, lets the car rotate up through the uh, the uh, the ascent there, through towards Variante Alta. I mean, Gary Huang, he made that look very, very nice and clean. But now through Variante Alta, manages to get... He's two tenths up at the moment, but he lost it coming out of Variante Alta there. So uh, whether he can gain that through going into Rivazza is another matter entirely. As we go back to Germany's Niklas Huben, um in the number 24, he's uh, currently running P7, uh, just over a second off of Grunewald's impressive lap time. And uh, uh, Alpha Hylian on uh, YouTube chat says, incredible lap. We've even had uh, Mia Rose from More Female Races by Thrustmaster, which has its uh, finale this coming Monday night at this same track as well. Uh, Sheldon Scott Muscat in the number 14, the Maltese driver looking to improve from P9. He's just under 1.3 seconds off. I don't think he improved on that lap, lap time as uh, Amadeo de Kaiser currently sitting in P10 in the Bentley. And with only three minutes left to go, oh, Amadeo de Kaiser straight off into the barrier. That is all she wrote on that one, and that is good night as we see Kevin Scalari taking a huge chunk of curb over on the inside, trying to give a, a flash of lights, trying to warn uh, the, uh, the car in front, the GTR that is in front to uh, to stay out the way and I think they're not going to need uh, told twice I think that's uh, Yannick Hamer in the, the Nissan GTR in fact it is because it's the only GTR that we've got in the field tonight so uh, Kevin Scalari out of the final corner to try and improve goes across the line what can they do we'll find out in just a second I, I didn't look particularly fast but then again looks could be deceiving he doesn't improve on his previous time there now, Nicholas Huben is half a second up, so potentially, if he can make this work, Huben will go into P2 from P7. So it's all about these final couple of corners. Six tenths of a second right now. This could be a very, very big lap. And take that gap down to four tenths of a second, Alex, to Gronwald. Yeah, and that would put him P2. As he goes P2, just under half a second to drift to 1 minute 40.227. He got that lap together when he needed to. And Huben just absolutely wrestled uh, that Audi by the scuff of the neck. We're over with uh, Great Britain's uh, Ben Scattergood in the number 9 Bentley Continental GT. He's currently 1.4 seconds off the pace. And David, the biggest statistic here is that you look at his two tenths up at the moment. Um, the top 27 covered by just under 1.95 seconds as we go into the last 90 seconds of qualification. It's it's almost um, baffling to see just how close the, um, the, 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 the spread of talent is in this field. So we'll uh, keep an eye on that as we see Alexander Duderev go across the line. Uh, it's uh, 28th for Duderev. Here comes Ben Scattergood. This is a, a looking strong two tenths up. So this could move Ben Scattergood up into the top 10 beside Taplin and Muscat. And it does right in between them and uh, absolutely sandwiched alongside uh, Alexander Pollock, who's currently 23rd. 
looking very, very confident in that uh, Porsche right now, the number five machine, currently 1.6 seconds. Anything over four tenths of a second would be enough to move Pilek into the top 10. I'm not sure how that one's going to handle that uh, goes across the line just now. It's only 110, so it's just an improvement to P21. So the, the times are changing very, very rapidly now, Alex. Yeah, we're with uh, David Kalosai from Mugen Sim Racing in the number 25 Mercedes. And uh, he's two tenths up at the moment. And this could put Kalosai up towards the bottom part of the top 20, maybe even depose Alexander Paulik, who's running P21 at the moment. As he crosses the line, ah, not much of an improvement. One minute 41. 0.502 and um, yeah back to Jack McIntyre on that particular occasion and uh, he's currently P17 at the moment O'Brien is going O'Brien jumped from 7th to 3rd brilliant that lap there that was a 1 minute uh, I'm just trying to find that was a 1 minute 40.476 uh, from O'Brien there but McIntyre trying to do his level best to get that Ferrari up into the top 15 which will help him as the check is out for qualifying. Yep, so that's only fast enough for uh, fourth place because uh, Nicholas Huben into second place, George Boothby in third with a 140.428. But here's Jack McIntyre uh, coming down in towards the, uh, the final corner, in towards Ravazza for the, uh, the last time. And it uh, looks to be very, very smooth. But again, 1.3 seconds behind. Here is uh, Amadeo de Kaiser. We saw him coming a cropper at the end of Variante Alta. Goes across the line, 12th place. It does a 140.998. Uh, can uh, we see any more improvements? I think not. I think that is us pretty much done and dusted for qualifying, Alex. 139.741. That absolutely blistering pole setting time from Tobias Gronwald. I, I, I was really, really surprised when Tobias had actually put that seven and a half tenths quicker than Kim Kachilo, who's ended up in P4, thanks to the efforts of Nicholas Huben, uh, you know, who increased his lap time, despite every single lap before that, the German had invalidated it every single time, but got it together on the final throw of the dice and got to within half a second of him and puts him on, on row two. O'Brien, a great effort from him up from P7 on his final lap up to P3. Uh, Both B, a very strong qualifying ahead of Scolari, Balza, Muscat, uh, rounding out the top eight ahead of uh, Rob Taplin and also Yannick Hoff. A top 10 covered by just under 1.2 seconds. But even though we've had qualifying, David, the biggest thing from uh, my bone of contention here is that, okay, it's windy, it's dry, it's sunny, but it's about the strategy. We know, I've said it again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. You do not win the race getting into Tamparello first. You've got to work on the strategy call and it's about reacting to what your competitors do. And there's quite a lot of talent in here. You know, we're, we're about four minutes away. So uh, from, from go, uh, the formation lap starting, it's going to be rather interesting. Grenovald will be the one that's going to be hunted down by everybody else. And I'm sure that everyone will want to get bragging rights here for the 2.4 hour endurance, ra endurance race here on Super Saturday on the Sim Grid. Just want to touch on something else that you mentioned there, Alex. Now, you said that first attempt, I think it was covered by 1.2 seconds, if I'm right. After that, 11th to 20th, covered by two tenths of a second. Nine cars separated by two tenths of a second. That is frightening how close that pace is between that midfield. And, uh, you know, th there's a, a phrase that, that you always use, and I, I do love stealing it. It's maybe not as appropriate tonight here because it's not a championship round, but you always say, you know, times are for show, points are to go. I'll let you have that one. Benefit of the doubt. I do, I do like it. It's, <laughs> such, a, it's it, such a valid comment, though. You know, it's all very well being King Dog and getting the fastest time and standing at the top of the hill, but it means absolutely nothing in a two-hour endurance race. It, it doesn't. I mean, you know, my, my commentary career started in sprint races, in karting, you know, and, and that is very true there as well because I've seen drivers... Um, I was in Italy in late October at Adria Karting Raceway and there was one particular driver from the UAE, Lachlan Robinson. He a really, really bad qualifying session. Hardly any, he'd hardly had any racing in the wet. We go qualifying on the Friday 
We've had sunshine, low-lying fog all week that week in Adria up until Friday. Then the heavens opened on Friday afternoon. It got worse and worse. And when the senior road taxes went out, he qualified P31. The sunshine came back on the Saturday and in all three races, he made up 16 positions at the very least through all three heats. And that is exactly the same as what you're going to see in this kind of endurance race. The drivers are going to have to have their eyeballs on stalks. They're going to have to have their, their wits about them. It's not going to be easy. Uh, and that's what we're going to find out tonight. You know, <laughs> I'm really excited, mate. I, I, I can't say any more than that. Yeah, this is going to be absolutely awesome. Right, we've got 32 cars on the grid. Let's give you a rundown of the cars outside the top 20 that you saw written down. 21st and 22nd is Alexander Pavlik and Atea Denks. 23rd and 24th is Timo Burkle and Alexander Dudarev. 25th and 26th is uh, David Kaloksai and then it's Josef Dubez. And then in 27th place, it is James Bacon alongside Matis Kopp, uh, Karl Mathis, and then Oliver Kallenberg in 29th and 30th. 31st is uh, Gregory Mostwin. And then 32nd is Elias Buziuta. Right, Alex, one minute left to go. Uh, we've got the sun setting here at uh, Imola. It looks absolutely beautiful here, but that also means that the track temperature is going to drop down very, very quickly. Strategy, you've said this time and time again, strategy is going to be such an important thing tonight. Well, I'm not the only one saying that because uh, Mia Rose again in chat saying will be interesting how strategy is played, seeing as Imola is a really different track to what uh, Mount Panorama is. So traffic might not make a big difference, but it will be nice to see. I mean, yeah, I completely agree with what she said there. You know, that the car's now being lowered onto all four uh, contact patches. Um, as we're about to get things underway for the formation lap. You know, there are drivers that are going to really, really chance it. You know, there will be some that will think, I'm going to keep it consistent. I want to have a lower center of gravity. Straight away, that means, okay, everyone will be on fresh, cold tires, which they need to warm up as we're about to go underway with the formation lap. But those that have decided to brim the tanks to the full will have the lower center of gravity that will help the agility. That might also help with regards to mitigating fuel consumption. Because here at uh, Zimmler, it's not going to be easy at all. As the uh, cars make their way round for the formation lap, um, I'm, I'm looking through the list of the cars and the drivers on the grids. Uh, who who do you want to, to keep an eye out for tonight? For myself, I think Michael O'Brien in the 22 McLaren is going to be a bit of a dark horse. Okay, I'm going to give you three. I'm going to be greedy here tonight because it is 2.4 hours of racing. Uh, Michael O'Brien... Booth B is another one, and Sheldon Muscat. Those are the three that I think we need to watch out for tonight. When Muscat is on it, um, you better watch out because uh, he, he can be rather quick. I've seen him in sprint race competition. I've been looking forward to seeing him in uh, a race such as this, and we'll see uh, how, uh, how he gets on. But it is about keeping your nose clean through, through turn one. You know, uh, they're being led um, by Grunewald going through. Uh, into Torza, you know, it's about now having, uh, uh, as, as Tom Christensen once said, you have to have your weapons sharp. That means tyres have to be up to temperature, brakes have to be up to temperature, engine must be on song, and the drivers must be ready to react at the moment the green flag flies. And that is where things really start playing out. And to be honest with you, David, the unpredictability factor. Anything can happen. You and I have seen that over three 90-minute races. Now we go for two hours and 24 minutes here at Imola. And with the sun fading fast, I won't be at all surprised if we see the temperatures drop into the single digits. I think you're absolutely spot on with that. The cold temperatures are going to be uh, a very, very difficult challenge for these drivers. But I do have to disagree with one thing that you mentioned earlier, just for the uh, the, the Tamburello. And uh, you can't win the race by, you know, charging down into Tamburello. I disagree. I think we'll just make it the first person in Tamburello wins. That's it. Job done. And uh, watch the carnage that unfolds. However, however, I say that time and time again, you know, jokingly, 
because obviously t taking part in the Settle Corsa competition or the public races is always, you know, any GT3 online races is, uh, it's, a, it's a real experience, but you never get that on these races. Always you see these races and it's, it makes you so jealous that you're not taking part as the, uh, the cars come round into their, their uh, double line fashion. Um, the, the fact that they, they have the utmost respect for uh, the, the drivers that are alongside them and they will fight you with every tooth and nail but they will make sure that they do not accidentally hit you or make you lose out because of that. But we turn our attention to the race because the cars go two by two by two by two all the way back down to 31st and 32nd, Gregory Mossman and Elouz Bizuota. But it's going to be Tobias Gronfeld and Nicholas Holman to lead the cars off for our 2.4 hour endurance spectacular here at the SimGrid. I'm ready. Alex is ready. Let's go racing, ladies and gentlemen. I am very, very excited, Alex. Are you? Definitely, ladies and gentlemen. Wait for it. Are we ready? Are we steady? It is time here at Imola for the 2.4 hour endurance race to go green, green, green as they head down towards Tamburello for the first time. Huben looking towards the outside of Grunewald as they make the run down there. Looking to be three abreast. O'Brien up towards the inside. I think he's uh, lost out a couple of positions and. Uh, Boothby going side by side with the McLaren in the 22 at the moment and uh, that means that O'Brien has dropped from third to fifth in just a couple of corners. Well there we go that's my pick sorted so that's uh, that's brilliant job Michael thank you. Um, joking aside though I mean again every single driver making it through those first two to three corners I mean you just don't get that in, uh, in, in public online racing it is a beautiful spectacle but uh, what a, a start for uh, Cachailo in the, uh, the number 10 car and uh, just look at it very very strong in that uh, Bentley right now Michael O'Brien left out to, to dry there by uh, Boothby and the two of them are just you know holding on and I'm hearing rumblings Alex of three wide further back in the pack yeah, someone's actually, and, and, and some three, three wide going to Aqua Minerale. Someone went literally exit stage left, going through the second part of that's the second gear corner at around about 100 kilometers an hour. So, uh, Michael O'Brien now coming under fire from Balta, Nick Balta in the number 50 Mercedes. So, O'Brien started on the inside of row two. He's back to where he was effectively. He was seventh before his final lap of qualifying, as now they hurtle their way. But Huben. Closing on Grunwald for the lead. It's Mercedes versus Audi, and they were covered by just under two and a half tenths of a second. Look, Huben right in the toe. And there's been a Denks in the BMW that has pitted after the very first lap, and a bit of a, a bit too much curb taken there by Grunwald through the first part of Tamparello. Uh, and he wasn't the only one, but you can just see now that O'Brien is being hounded by. Uh, the likes of, well, he's got past Baltzar, Sheldon Scott Muscat just behind Yannick Huoff in the 297 out, Aston Martin, and then you've got Taplin in the 214 Lexus. This is really heating up here, and this is the battle for what is effectively P6. I don't know about you, Alex, but next time they do this, they need to get an energy drink supplier to sponsor this, because this is just enthralling, and we're barely even three minutes into the, uh, into the race here. We're on to lap two. And uh, just amazing action as we see Gronvold under all sorts of pressure right now from Huben as we go picture in picture. It's the battle between first, second, third, and fourth on the inside of picture in picture. Behind, though, in the main picture, you see Baltar get all sorts of shapes as he comes through Aqua Minerale on the run up towards Variante Alta. And this is on the back bumper of uh, the McLaren of Michael O'Brien. And you've got uh, four cars all battling it out behind. That's Ruoff, Taplin, De Kayser, and Scattergood all just knocking lumps out of each other right now. But just behind them, who's got the ringside seat? Three out of three races this evening. Marcel Fusi in the 94 Aston Martin. He's only half a second off of Scattergood. And look, it's all kicking off in front. The eight and the nine go side by side coming out of the... Uh, second left-hander at uh, Rivazza and there is Fuzzi waiting for the opportunity slots in behind 
Uh, that is the Kaiser, I believe, just up ahead in the number eight Bentley, as uh, Scadigan has actually got past. And then Fuzzy, despite having done two 30 minute sprint races, is giving his absolute best here in the first four minutes of the race and goes up the inside of the Kaiser into Tamborello. Brilliant, brilliant stuff by both Fuzzy and De Kaiser. A great racing respect. Both of them gave room, and De Kaiser knew when to give it up there. Yeah, and he's uh, having a look, but uh, yeah, had to back out of it there. And oh, was that Fleer? I think that might have been the number 23 of uh, Fleer that went off into the barrier. We've got a car off there anyway. But um, I'll get an idea on that in just a second. If managed to rejoin onto the track, uh, being told in the air it wasn't Flair, but it was. Um, I'm not too sure. It was. It was in this little. Uh, it was in the battle of four cars, and one of them just went off at uh, Tamborello, or uh, sorry, uh, excuse me, at uh, Villeneuve. So we'll uh, find out. I'll uh, go and have a little look at that one, Alex. But uh, it looked like it's Gary Huang. Gary, yeah, that was, that, that was Huang in the Mercedes. Huang in the Mercedes went off the track. And that was the one that hit the barriers. There you go then. So early drama already. And we're barely at 15 minutes into this race. Uh, yeah. Any any thought that you had of these drivers taking a cool, calm, composed uh, look at this race has completely gone out the window as all hell breaks loose. Uh, and uh, everywhere you look, you've got these gaggle of uh, little battles going on. Top five is opening a gap at the moment because it looks like Michael O'Brien is kind of holding uh, the cars back from sixth place onwards. He did a, a 141.937 and the cars in front of him doing 140.9. Actually, hang on a second. That was uh, Tobias Gronwald doing a 140.9 on his third lap of the race. That is uh, a very, very fast time and it is already at least two tenths to three tenths faster than anybody else behind him. Scolari is actually quickest in uh, in sector one. I, I think that Grunwald's gone with the light fuel approach. Here it is, because I saw that Gary Huang's car had a very uh, discombobulated front bumper and bonnet. You can now see it. They come out of Tamburello, and you've got Fuzzi and uh, the Kaiser battling up ahead. And oh, it, I think he just hit the brakes, and the back edge just stepped out to the right, to the right, and speared him off into the barriers. I didn't see any contact with the Aston Martin in front of him. Uh, I'm wondering also whether Michael O'Brien might have a little bit of uh, a wounded McLaren there because the pace being that far off, I'm quite surprised, or unless he's on a heavier fuel load. I think we'll uh, we'll have to have a look because he's made, uh, he does look like a, a, a sitting duck, to be honest, because the way he's going backwards and the speed is he's going backwards, as we see Sheldon Musket doing a little bit of uh, fly mo action there, cutting across the chicane of Variante Alta, still manages to hold on to Ruoff and Tapley behind him. But uh, Balzar, I, I've got to be honest, I think Nick Balzar is... He's, his patience is going to run out very, very quickly being stuck behind Michael O'Brien. You can tell that that Mercedes is faster. But look at that battle behind between Muscat, Ruov, Taplin and Scattergood. Four cars separated by about, well, about a hair. That's about it. <laughs> There's nothing between them as they make their way down to Tamborello. Yeah, uh, Ruoff has actually got the jump on Muscat. He actually made the move up the inside of the Maltese driver through the second part of Rivazza, and that has allowed him to sort of start to get away as we go on board with Nick uh, Balta from the MRL Academy car in the number 50. So you're now going to see as he goes up the gears, up through third, they're going to probably push fourth before, no, go, goes down into first gear at around 80 k's. And, and one of the biggest things here, David, is that obviously with the onboard that we had a bit earlier on, you know, the different cars are going to be geared differently. So the Mercedes, you know, some cars will be, you know, some drivers might short shift to get the traction a little bit better coming out of Villeneuve and going into Torza. And then the run up to Piratella, you want to get as, mu as much traction as you get. As you <laughs> look, look at the commitment here. Balta, oh, gets a bit of opposite lock to the left hand side, going through the first part of Aqua Minerale. And I still cannot believe he kept that. And they have actually pulled away from Yannick Kowalf. Yannick Kowalf is 3.3 seconds uh, between uh, behind these. Uh, and look, Marcel Fusi looking up the inside of Scattergood, going into the uh, Variante Alta. And Fusi, I think, you know what? Those two sprint races have really kept him charged. Just look at the move there from Muscat on Ruoff, going towards the outside, through in towards Rivazza. And he makes the move stick. 
brilliant job there by Sheldon Muscat. And he runs wide coming through the, the first part of Rivazza. And he still keeps it pinned in front of the Aston Martin. Brilliant job there. Well, never mind GT3 racing, you'd be forgiven for thinking this is a, a TCR race going on right now as uh, Kevin Scolari all over the back of, uh, that is the number 10 of Cachailo, uh, Kim Cachailo in the uh, the Bentley is coming under all sorts of attack, but we move back to this incredible battle, Shell must get side by side, oh there's contact, oh and off goes Ruoff! That was never going to happen and so does Sheldon Muscat, I think that is just at the top of the picture there. And two cars Taplin's into the off. one corner. Taplin's off as well. Taplin got collected as a result of uh, Ruoff. But you know what? Is it me? Sheldon Scott Muscat got away with that. How did he hang on? I cannot believe it. Because Yannick Muscat, Muscat is still P8. He was unscathed. I think it was the thing was when you saw um, you know, Ruoff was in lunge range. He went for it. These two, I know, they've battled before out on track in on ACC, and that was definitely one of Yannick Ruoff thinking, "I'm going to get one up on Sheldon Muscat." And Muscat went, "Oh, I don't like the look of this." Kept his nose clean, and unfortunately, Taplin got collected as a direct result. But Taplin, as a result of that, went spinning off the track. Let's have a look at the replay here, David. You can now see the run. As they come across the start finish line into Tamburello. Ruoff pulls over to the right hand side. You can see Taplin just behind through the first part of Tamburello, and then Ruoff tries to go for it. A little bit of a touch, a little bit of sideways action there for Muscat, but then as a result of that, Taplin got collected because he had to take avoiding action, and one of the cars just behind. Uh, did give him a little bit of a touch possibly there so Taplin will be a bit uh, infuriated with that and Yannick Ruoff will now be kicking himself rather significantly saying I shouldn't have stuck it up the inside of that I should have just wasted for another corner well I think he's going to get a kick in from race control when they have a look at that one um, and joking aside though I mean when when you look back at that replay there doesn't look to be any any malintent and then you know, there might even be the accident if we can have a look at the, the replay again later on. You know, there's at some point, Shell Musk has to, he's obliged to, to give him some sort of room because at that point he was off the track, he was onto the kerbs. So he's got to go somewhere uh, and that somewhere has to be back onto the track. So we'll see how uh, that one ruminates. And uh, I'd love to be a fly on the wall at race control to see how they actually know. I take that back. I, I, I wouldn't want to, uh, yeah. <laughs> to to think about the, the stress that they have to go through um, having to deal with all this. But uh, six laps into a 2.4 hour endurance race and it is Tobias Grunwald. Uh, who is in the lead by 1.5 seconds and Sheldon Muscat is under attack he's had a moment and up the inside goes Scattergood and is he going to get taken by Fuzzy as well I think he is wow and that is amazing Fuzzy wow. Rat Fuzzy ran the outside, that's ridiculous. Through Valley Anti Alta of all places. Fuzzy just knew where to park it. And Musket, after that wobble, he got mugged. He's getting mugged again. Look, De Kaiser is trying to go around the outside. Oh, that's brave going through Rivazza. De Kaiser through the gravel. And here comes Van Droyten up the inside of De Kaiser. <laughs> we haven't even. What? Like, like Muscat had the massive, mass, the biggest wobble I think I've ever seen going through Aqua Minerale, and he's lost three, two to three places as a result of that moment. <sighs> Crikey. Yeah, but again, the, the thing coming out of that is how fired up is Marcel Fuzzi? We've seen him do it in the Lamborghinis, we've seen him do it in the Porsches, and he's doing it exactly the same thing in the uh, the GT3. So this is incredible stuff. Back to the uh, battle for P4 then, and uh, P3 as well. Kim Cachailo just up the road there, but we're going to focus on Kevin Scalari and the KSS 209. Under pressure there from George Boothby. George really didn't have the the best of starts and um, we know he's got the pace but at the moment he's just having to settle behind this battle for third fourth and uh just watching this alex as well grunwald has, has got a, a gap of about a, a second and a half and he's extending it all the time here so uh, do we think grunwald may just try and run off with this he could do i mean if he's gone for a low fuel strategy here and he's, he's running, uh, you know, nearly a tenth and a half quicker per lap 
in comparison with Niklas Horben. So, you know, as uh, Lazo O'Brien up the inside of Balza through Rivatsa, the McLaren goes on to the gravel on the in outside of the uh, first corner through there, but he still hangs on. That, I mean, that was definitely, definitely brazen at the very least from Michael O'Brien, but Balza looking towards the inside. I mean, the McLaren might not have the legs on the Mercedes as they now go side by side across the line. Oh, look how close Michael O'Brien was cutting across the nose of Nick Balza from Germany, in heading into Tamburello. Brilliant racing respect from these two. Again, you know, we're, we're, we're less than 15 minutes into this race and they are not giving any quarter. They are putting on one hell of a show tonight. Wow. They certainly are, and this is getting a little bit touchy-feely for my liking. Uh, Baltzar, I did say several laps ago, I think he's getting very frustrated uh, behind Michael O'Brien. He knows he's got the pace to catch up to the uh, top five, and uh, O'Brien is a bit of a, a cork in that bottle. But, you know, the, the two of them have just broken away from that battle of Scattergood uh, Fuzzy. And have a look at that as well. Eunice Van Droyten in the 995 Keck Esports machine up into 10th place. Now, where did Eunice start? I'm sure he started towards, uh, was it not around about sort of P15, 16 or 17? And he's already into the top 10. Yeah, but look how much quicker he is <laughs> than Marcel Fuzzy. He's a second quicker a lap as Balsa. Oh, that's brave and a half going around the outside. And that's coming out of Variante Alta into Rivazza. And Balsa is going to get the move done before the braking zone. Brilliantly textbook out around the outside on the exit of the chicane. My goodness me. And ladies and gentlemen, you ain't seen nothing yet as now Boothby. Closing on Scolari, going across the line, down towards Tamburello. The Italian now feeling the pressure from the Brits as Boothby sends it up the inside into the apex of Tamburello. And Scolari does the sensible thing there and allows Boothby to get through. And the reason why I say this, David, is that Scolari will now have the toe on the 666 Mercedes. Yeah, he will. And also, on top of that, it's an endurance race. And uh, what you'll find is that in the top 10, a lot of these drivers will remember that it's all about that two hours. Here we go. This is... Uh, let's have a look who this is. It's Daphne Martin. Ah, right, right, right. So let's see, around the outside here. And, That's uh, Yannick Ruoff we're on board with, yeah. yeah. It's a little bit of contact there, and uh, yeah... I, I, I don't know. I, I I think that there has to be some sort of room there, Alex, to to be given. Yeah, but to be to be completely honest with you, Sheldon Sheldon Muscat had, as we've now got our first penalty of the evening coming in. Uh, in uh, we've had a 10 second time penalty given to Alexander Duderev for avoidable contact on lap one with Timo Berkel. Um, so that's the first penalty, but yeah, I mean the, th the, th the, th the thing was it's it's very similar to the incident And I'm gonna take us back to spa on Thursday night Vasily Onufriev up the inside of Niels van der Kerkel through the source very similar kind of incident Because Gwarf was not completely halfway alongside Sheldon Muscat. There was enough room for him to get through So, so uh, and also uh, yeah, I think um, you know that's. I think that's going to be investigated. I would not be at all surprised to see a potential penalty going through to Yannick Worf as a result of that issue, even though it put himself into the barrier. I mean, we're going back to another replay now. So this is the wobble from this Muscat is... then on the entry, and oh look at that! The, the tail just slides out. He tries to hold on to it. He runs wide because he can't get the car decelerated in time. And that is it. That sets him up like a good one. And it's absolutely done. We knew what happened. All right. So here we go. Boothby and uh, Scolari side by side down into Ravato. Oh, wow. What a move from uh, Scolari to take that place back. And uh, I I've got a feeling this is going to be a very long night for these two. I've got two words, David, and they're quite appropriate. Mamma mia. <laughs> I mean, that was one hell of a move. Well, I mean, yeah, also, that one as well. Exactly. Uh, Fuzzi and Van Droyten actually have both gained five positions from the start. So Fuzzi was 14th, Van Droyten was 15th at the start. So they were in the bottom part of the top 15. Um, 
and you know Fuzi is what is he just um, just over two seconds behind Scattergood so the Bentley at the moment I'm just looking at the uh, the, the times at the minute I mean Fuzi has actually just put in his personal best of the race a 1 minute 41.790 and he was nearly th uh, four tenths quicker well, three tenths quicker than Scattergood. So the gap now coming down between those for eighth and ninth position. So just over two hours left to go in this endurance race, and really we're just getting started. 19 minutes. It feels like we've already done half an hour, but we've only done 19 minutes. That is just crazy, crazy stuff right now. Uh, we are looking at Michael O'Brien and the Jensen Team Rocket RJN McLaren down into uh i think that is uh tamarello no that's sorry vilma and then it is on the uh, run around the uh, left hander but he's he's done that uh that that move to, to nick balzar and i was expecting Ale uh, alex if i'm honest nick balzar to to streak away but he's not michael's able to hold on to the back of that car i think he's just playing the long game you know you said about endurance racing yeah, they're going to class this as a full-on sprint, but there is going to be um, some sort of strategy that Michael O'Brien will be using. Uh, you know, the, the, the drivers are going to have their own ideas on what they're going to do. You know, we're now back on with uh, Amadeo De Keza, uh from De Keza and Motorsport in the number eight Bentley, uh, closing down on Sheldon Muscat from GT Omega RPM Esport. So it's... Uh, Mercedes versus Bentley as they go through the Variante Alta and uh, that looks to be Van Droysen just up ahead so this battle is covered by about 1.3 seconds so you know De Kaiser at the moment he's uh, just having a look at his lap times he's just put in a personal best as has Muscat uh, both running in the mid 142.1s uh, so the consistency and where you see like we've just seen that Sheldon Muscat came out of the second left-hander at uh, Rivazza, kicked up a little bit of dust with the right rear. You want to do as little of that as possible, uh, whereas De Kaiser was fairly clean coming through that uh, double left-hander as he briefly looked towards the inside of Muscat but knew he wasn't going to get towards the inside. But look, Muscat again runs a little bit wide through Tamborello and De Kaiser just powers past the outside of the Mercedes. Muscat has a moment and then Suarez closing on the number 14 and then you've got uh, Rodriguez from Brazil uh, just behind there as well. Muscat feeling the heat in the kitchen. Shell Muscat has had 22 minutes to completely forget right now. He was up into the uh, the top five earlier on and he's going down, down, down and really uh, it's difficult to see where he would be able to, uh, to actually get from this because he just seems to be trying to either overdrive the car or something is very, very not right on that setup because he's very twitchy, very, very nervous. The car just looks all over the place right now. And again, going very wide. Uh, that is the run up to uh, uh, Aquaman Rally. And then, uh, yeah, that's going to be a warning for the uh, track limits there. And he is under so much pressure. So he's not only having to deal with a car that is all over the place right now, Alex, but he's now got two cars of Suarez and Rodriguez that are all over him like a rash. Yeah, very much the case as we now go uh, on board with the 297 of Germany's Yannick Hoff, uh, trying to close in on Rick, uh, yeah, that was uh, Rick Taplin just up ahead. Uh, Rob Taplin, my apologies there, in the 214 Lexus. Uh, and then they've got, um, I think there's another driver I just recognised there as well. Uh, that is Josef uh, Dorbes from also from Germany in the 83 uh, Mercedes. Um, yeah, it's, the thing is, is that if Muscat gets a drive through, again, as I said earlier, no one wants to have a drive-through as Dennis Suarez tried to close in on the Maltese driver. Again, you know, you can see how hard Muscat is pushing that Mercedes and there's going to be that point in time where he's going to have to sort of back off and sort of like pull it a little bit because otherwise he gets, I don't know how many track warnings he's got at the moment. If he's got two, he's, on, he's nearly on his third strike and that could spell disaster. That could really put him towards outside of the top 20 with a, a pit stop. But Yannick Hammer, the first driver out of the field, I think, along with uh, also Attila De uh, Dengs that has also uh, taken a mandatory pit stop. So Muscat will want to exercise a bit of damage limitation here. 
you know, he doesn't need to go for the best lap possible yet. It's when people start to pit around him, that's when he's got to start doing it. It's when the people start to pit around you, you've then got to push like crazy. Yeah, for sure, for sure, as we enter the two-hour mark left to go here at the SimGrid Super Saturday 2.4-hour endurance race here at Imola. It's Dave Crusay and Alex Goldschmidt bringing you all of the live action. We are on board with Dennis Suarez, the Rebellion Audi, looking back towards Gabriel Rodriguez in the 769 Aston Martin as they come through the, uh, the final corner there at Trevazza and then along towards the, uh, the start-finish line just now to start their uh, their next lap. And can you believe we've already done 14 laps here at uh, Imola? An amazing race so far, but it just feels like, you know, it, it genuinely feels like we've done about 45 minutes already. It, it, it's like you're wanting to wish time away there, David, but if you look on the left-hand side of your screens at home, you can see that from Denkstan to McIntyre, 23rd to 28th position, they have already taken their first pit stop, um, which is not at all surprising. There is going to be uh, those drivers um, that will chance it and go for broke and go for a very, very long first stint. Um, and in, in that kind of respect, you know, you could see, uh, I mean, I'm looking at the times at the moment. I mean, uh, Kevin Scolari has just put in a personal best of 1 minute 40.968. That is less than a tenth quicker than Tobias Grunewald, who is still leading by about 2.6 seconds from Niklas Subban, uh, with uh, Kim Kachilo rounding out the top three in the number 10 Bentley. Uh, so there's still all to play for. But look, the track temperature already... David is dropping to 12 degrees Celsius. So oh, Muscat having a moment coming out of Variante Alta. He's definitely feeling the pressure. And Suarez is not letting him get away in any way, shape, or fashion at all. One person out of that battle that's catching my attention is actually Gabriel Rodriguez in the 769 just behind them. He he just looks like he's poised, waiting for this to all go horribly, horribly wrong in front of him. And with the way that car is going for Muscat tonight, you certainly wouldn't bet against it because he is having to, to throw in all sorts of opposite lock right now. But Dennis Suarez, I mean, all credit to him, very, very patiently just prodding poking away at Sheldon Muscat, trying to see how much he can make that young man uh, basically, you know, fear under pressure from all of this attack that he's getting put on him right now from that Audi. It's, uh, it's fascinating to watch how much work Muscat is having to put into that Mercedes. Yeah, definitely the case. I mean, he's he, he knows that Suarez is coming and uh, and the thing is Rodriguez has got you know what we like to, which I uh, it's another phrase I like to use he's got the ringside seat so and he's just going to wait to see if anything kicks off in front and I'm looking at the lap times Suarez was the quickest of the trio so the Audi in the middle was quicker by about two tenths quicker than Rodriguez um, and Muscat um, was having a bit of a mare, a 1 minute 42.552. So the these three covered by about four tenths as Muscat goes defensive. Suarez tries to send him the dummy going through into Variante Alta to see if he's going to make a mistake. But on that particular occasion, Muscat gets the power down early coming out of Variante Alta and gets a bit of breathing space. It's not much, but that Audi, mid engined rear wheel drive, will have the agility. Uh, benefit in comparison with the sheer brute force of that Mercedes. Thrilling, thrilling action that we've got going on here. Of course, we'll keep you updated with everything else that's going on through the rest of the pack, but this by far is the uh, the closest battle that we've got going on right now. Um, we've also got Eunice van Druyten just ahead of this battle with uh, the Kaiser is just four tenths of a second. Oh, a little look up the inside from Suarez never had any intention of actually making that move but this is all about mind games on Sheldon Muscat this is amazing stuff to see because you can see look at them they're weaving from one side to the other Suarez tries to put up the inside he makes a move stick beautiful beautiful move there from Suarez that was time to perfection and that now leaves Sheldon Muscat as a sitting duck for Gabriel Rodriguez that move is going to come within the next two to three corners you said, you said, you said about uh, Muscat. Uh, you know, 
Suarez uh, sort of like what he did was he gave Muscat. Oh, oh, that's a big off of Van Droyten. Van Droyten in the barriers there, going through through Piratella into Aqua Minerale. Dramas, and that has dropped the 995 Aston Martin outside of the top 13 positions. He's lost out to Suarez, Muscat, and Rodriguez. And look behind, you've got the likes of Duderez, uh, Duderev, Taplin. Uh, is uh, literally on his back bumper as well as the 297 of Germany's uh, Yannick Huo from Good Time Racing. It is really, really heating up, especially in the midfield. And this is where the drivers, you know, we're going to see it very, very soon, I think, David, that one of the drivers will uh, count their chickens before they hatch, decide to go into the pits early and say, I'm not going to want to battle. But you can see now that Suarez is being hunted down by Sheldon Muscat. Jonas van Droyten into pit lane then to po possibly fix damage and I think I know exactly what's wrong with uh, Muscat's car. If you watch it under braking, the front of the car actually pitches up rather than normally you'd see the car pitching down. I wonder if he's got that brake balance set towards the rear rather than the front which is potentially why that car's sliding out from the, the bottom, from the back of the car. It would certainly explain why it's so twitchy but that's a very easy fix. You just simply uh, go into the to the in-car settings and you can adjust the uh, the brake balance on the fly. But that's certainly, for, for me, that's what it looks like. The tail end just washing out and uh, he's really, really struggling to keep that under control. Yeah, very much the case. I mean, you know, when you look at it, the Audi has got a different centre of gravity in comparison with the Mercedes. The Mercedes is going to be better under the brakes but the Audi has got the agility factor in its favour here as they're going through Aqua Minerale. You know, you, you, you can just sort of, you can just sort of see, look, Muscat, I mean, that brake balance is absolutely upsetting that car no end, and Rodriguez, as a result of that, has closed in on the number 14 Mercedes as they go through Variante Alta. It's kicking all, it's all seven shades of uh, kicking off behind them, you know, with the likes of Duderev, uh, Taplin, Ruoff, uh, Dobes also in there and that's the battle between 14th to 17th position as we now go back to oh Kim Kachalo under some severe pressure from Kevin Scolari from KSS in the number 209 Mercedes and in the meantime Scolari has also dropped Boothby in the process well folks nothing to see here just a, a dull boring sim grids endurance race absolutely not you can never say that about the uh, the sim grid endurance races and uh, they they kind of live up to the little the little label that and the hype that we give them alex yeah well i've just heard from race control that the it was declared oh Ru as i was just about to say yannick ruoff decides to go matthias ekstrom style through the chicane that was through tamborello and he's lost a handful of places. First to uh, Dobes, uh, there's Duderov, uh, Duderev, and then, uh, yeah, I think um, <laughs> Yannick Ruoff. Uh, that was definitely a runoff and a half there. But as I was about to say before Yannick Ruoff uh, put the defibrillator by my desk on standby, quite significantly there, uh, the incident between Yannick Ruoff and Sheldon Muscat earlier on has been declared a racing incident. And O'Brien, O'Brien's had a massive moment. He's he's crashed. It looks like he's DNF, David. Yep, that's it. From seventh place, and uh, he was struggling to keep on to the back of Baltzar. We we saw that Baltzar had more pace with him, and somehow we saw Michael O'Brien keeping up with that car. But again, the the balance of it just it, he was going backwards from the start. He had a great qualifying and then just went like a stone backwards and it was at uh, Aqua Minerale so we'll get a replay from that from, from uh, our production team in just a second but wow I mean so many bombshells and we're barely even half an hour into this race Alex okay well let's go to the replay now he's trying to chase down uh, the number 50 of Balza into Aqua Minerale oh goes in too heavy into the curbs back end steps out and the car is just going to go bang left front into the barriers that could be suspension damage to the upright and the shocks oh not great for michael o'brien unfortunately there yeah you hate to see it an hour and 50 minutes left to go in the race then and uh the the cards are gently laying themselves out on the table we've got another penalty just coming up on our screens here uh the instant on lap 17 for cars one two five and car five 
uh, it's going to be a five second penalty to car five for avoidable contact so that is the uh, the one two five of james bacon and the number five of alexander paulik that's a five second penalty to alexander paulik meanwhile back with this action here because look at uh, halbin there in the number 24 machine uh, desperately trying to to hold on with the uh the the audi and uh, nicholas halbin 2.4 seconds behind grunwald and he is uh yeah he's under all sorts of pressure yeah uh, that was the 86 porsche um of carl's uh, carl mathers that was actually trying to get out of the way um at that particular moment but kim cachado still uh, looking to keep ahead of kevin scolari as we have just under one hour and 50 minutes still to go thank you very much to everyone continuing to watch us here on super saturday here on the sim grid oh moment for scolari there going through the first pass of villeneuve wallop the curves with the left rear and that nearly pitched the back end skyward he held on to that like a trooper but that has allowed george boothby to try and close up if you haven't followed us on social media you can find us on facebook uh, at sim underscore grid on twitter and also you can see on the top right hand score uh, corner of your screen our discord id and also you can follow us on instagram uh, and also with that you can also head to uh, blog dot the sims sim grid sim for all the latest news and also the sim for all relevant information that you need and uh, there is ben Sc scattergood is uh, coming under fire from uh, that is the uh, audi of 116 uh to uh and that's uh Berkel and uh Scattergood has also lost out to Van Droyten as oh Berkel goes uh loses it and goes out breaking himself into the first part of Rivadza and that allows uh Scattergood to get back into the mix so very very interesting indeed Michael O'Brien yeah that's a real shame for the number 22 McLaren and they the drivers are being caught by back markers you've got third fourth and fifth so Cachilo. uh you've also got uh, the uh the other the two mercedes behind Sc scolari and boothby and they are at the back of that train going through into villeneuve the two in front scattergood and van droyten are going to have to watch their six they're also going to have to watch out for as Burkel gets cleanly out of the way nice spatial awareness there from the Audi as third fourth and fifth head their way up to the right uh, the left hander at Pilatella up the incline under the Audi Sport Bridge rotate the car in go down the dip you can see how much curb both Scolari and Boothby were taking and Scolari looking to wind up the momentum going through into Aquaminerali deep on the brakes behind Cachailo through into the second part up the hill towards variante alta but kim cachilo in the number 10 bentley continental gt3 still holding on as the duo of mercedes trying to catch him and you can see just by but nicholas huben is also uh, closing on grunewald as we head to josef dobbs uh, from good time racing in the number 83 he's running in the evo the biggest thing that i've noticed here as well is that scolari is running the evo the 2020 version of the amg gt3 whereas boothby has stuck with the original first generation and if i'm honest with you david it could very much be the case where um it's the old guard versus the updated facelifted model yeah, of course, and with the, the, the GT3 standards as well. Oh, and a huge wobble there from uh, Scolari, and Scolari now sent into the path of Boothby. Boothby round the outside, can't make it stick, but that was a massive moment for Kevin Scolari in the KSS 209. It's not done yet, he is all over the place right now, overcooks it into Villeneuve, and look at Boothby round the outside. This is on the run down to the left, and there. Boothby's going to try and get the cut back. They're side by side. There's a little bit of contact on the panels. And have a look at him. Um, is that uh, that's that's not Baltar behind? 
excuse me. But uh, anyway, watching Boothby on the left-hand side. Oh, there's a little bit of contact. They both run wide and they're back out onto the track. But Boothby is going to take that position. And that all started four corners ago. Scolari is going to have his head in tatters right now because that car is looking very, very unstable. Yeah, I think it was earlier on. Uh, Kalosai, in the meantime, in the 25 from Mugen Sim Racing, uh, goes into the pits as uh, Scolari getting a bit the untidy going through Varianti Alta through the first part of it. And that has allowed Cachalo to have a bit of breathing room. Look at the gap between Cachalo and Boothby, David. Nearly 2.8 seconds. That's exactly what Cachalo was waiting for. Just keep it planted ahead of Scolari and wait for the madness to unfold behind. And that is absolutely spot on, Alex. That's a great strategy to have, is that if you can afford that, you know, back your car that's behind you, that's putting you under pressure, back them up, let them get in a fight with someone behind them, and then you can just drive off into the distance and uh, have a, a fairly peaceful race. So Kim Kachaila there, brilliant, brilliant tactic there, and uh, just having to deal with some lap traffic at the moment. In fact, I think that's Eunice van Droyten up there in the uh, Aston Martin. But again, with the, with the lap traffic, that's its own uh, difficulty, because while most of the cars stay out your way, again, sometimes you can be your own worst enemy because these cars can't just disappear. You have to give them the room and you have to, to treat it accordingly. This is uh, Alexander Duderev in the 55 uh, machine just making his way around in the Aston, just behind uh, Dobes in the McLaren there. They're on the run down towards Tamburello. Uh, an hour and 44 minutes left to go in this race and I'll, I'll put my hands up right now and say I have got absolutely no idea what's going to happen in the next half hour. I did say about the unpredictability factor, didn't I, David? It's come true. Uh, and uh, that's where really things have changed. Suarez and Rodriguez in the meantime uh, have pitted. Uh, look at the gap now. Uh, Grunewald is being closed in on by Niklas Huben. Huben last time around was over three tenths of a second quicker. Gap now down to 1.25 seconds between first and second position. Make that 1.1. Huben from Germany on a charge uh, to try and catch up with Grunewald. And you know what? One of the good things about the back market traffic is David coming out of Rivazza down to Tamburello. If you're the one that has got clean air, you're the one that's going to be the sitting duck because the driver behind, if they've got back marker traffic, as I think that might have been Jack McIntyre just seen go off the track coming out of Tambor uh, out of uh, Tamburello, possibly. Huben, with having this advantage of back marker traffic, he's going to get a slipstream. And that is ever, ever crucial in decimating your lap times. Last time around, get this, half a second quicker than Grunewald and closing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, Grunwald doing a 141.793 and uh, Huben doing a 141.289. So, yeah, this is this is building up very, very nicely. And we're coming into prime time for the first of three pit stops because obviously it's just over two hours. Uh, normally with a two-hour race or a 90-minute race, we'd see uh, two pit stops. But we've got the three to deal with in this uh, this two-hour uh, or 2.4 hour race so again it's it's going to be seeing how these strategies play out because at the moment we just don't have a clue you can see Dex is actually the the highest placed car right now that's already done uh, a pit stop at the moment in 18th place Attila Dex the BMW M6 a GT3 so you know that for all we know he could be a dark horse with the fact that he's got that advantage having one uh, pit stop already but the other part in that is that Dex pit on lap one, so it's not like it was a strategy, it was because he uh, got himself into problems. Yeah, as we go now to the battle for what is effectively P10 at the moment, Rob Taplin coming under fire from Yannick Ruoff in the 297 Aston Martin. Ruoff trying his absolute damnedest to get past the Lexus. Um, and one of the biggest things now is that with drivers pitting, uh, Muscat's got a drive through, that's for track limits. I knew it was gonna, I knew that something was gonna happen for Sheldon Muscat, and he's got that third strike. He's now got to make four, four pit stops. So he's got to serve that within three laps, otherwise, that penalty gets more and more severe for the number 14 Mercedes. Ouch. Yeah, that is, um, how do I say this in the nicest possible way? But this race has just been 
an unmitigated disaster for Sheldon Muscat. There, there is almost, I, I can't see any way back from this to a, a, a reasonable result for Sheldon. He's got three pit stops to take and a drive-through penalty as well. Saying that, it can be done, um, but I think he's honestly going to be lucky if he can get himself into the top 20 with the, with the penalties that he's got and the fact that he's got three pit stops as well. We know he's got the pace. I mean, he is an incredibly talented driver, but there's only so much you can do with your hands tied behind your back, Alex. Yeah, well, I've just had a message from our broadcast director, Mike Yow, courtesy of Michael O'Brien, who said he was having game issues. He spun every time because going through Aquaminerale, he had a big freeze. And on that, that particular moment, finally, he lost the car as a result of it. So that's why he DNF'd. So massive dramas for Michael O'Brien. It was of a technical nature. Uh, and we've also had a disconnect there. I th Yannick Hamer in the Seoul Nissan, uh, the number 241, has also uh, DNF'd. So we are down to a couple, uh, a couple of drivers now DNFing. Uh, but now it's getting close to the top 15, now being that by uh, being close to being uh, initially that by the leader at the moment. That's how far we've got so far with uh, just under an hour and 40 minutes still to go. Yeah, it's, uh, when I said that earlier about feeling like 45 minutes had, had gone by, what I meant by that was the fact that so much action has happened. I, I just can't understand how we've managed to squeeze it into all that amount of, into such a short amount of time. It's, um, it's just crazy. I mean, you, you'd honestly think that this was a 12 hour endurance race, not a two hour endurance race. So uh, just looking at Eunice Van Droyten in the background there, uh, just getting lapped by Kevin Scolari. Uh, Kevin trying to catch on to the back of Boothby and I've got to be honest, I, I think Boothby has got the smooth driving style to, to try and get a break but you never know with this uh, lap traffic it, it could play into the hands of, of Scolari but also uh, picture in picture you can see the uh, the number 297 inside picture of Yannick Ruov uh, on the back of uh, let's see who's there. It's uh, Taplin, isn't it? The 214 of uh, Rob yeah. Taplin. Yeah, they've been uh, at loggerheads, haven't they? <laughs> Ever since uh, Taplin got uh, contact as a result of Ruoff coming together with uh, Muscat, who has served his drive through penalty and rejoins. Okay, Scolari, the first of the top six to blink. So the number 209 comes into the pits as Ruoff coming very, very close towards Taplin through Aqua Minerale as they head towards Variante Alta. And you, again, Yannick Roof is weaving to uh, from side to side there on the approach and sparks flying from the rear diffuser of the Aston Martin. But just by taking that amount of curve going through Variante Alta, that just literally gave Yannick Roof absolutely no opportunity to gather momentum. In, in want, want of a better phrase here, David, it actually cost him time, not gained him time. Yeah, it's uh, not really happened. Yeah. Um, right, Muscat has served his, uh, his drive-through and he's into P th P13, but he's still having the same problems. I I've got to be honest, I don't think that's going to be the only one he's going to have tonight. The the whatever it is on that car is just set up completely wrong. And a uh, little slide plug here, but maybe he should have went to uh, to Coach Dave Academy. Oh, you had to get that one in. But just... But just, uh, I think Denks could be possibly the opportunity of getting uh, ahead of Scolari. Okay, Denks has now crossed the line, and Scolari, uh, I think, has just come out of the pit. So Denks uh, was tipped, I think, by our very own Michael Hamlet in the YouTube chat, was saying uh, he's one of his favourites. So, uh, you know, by doing an early pit stop, and he started 22nd, he's now up to P11. So he's literally halved that in, what was it, 28 laps? Not a bad, not a bad first uh, first bit of uh, strategy call there from Attila Denks. Yeah, that is uh, some pretty inspired work right now going on. And uh, yeah, loving it. I, again, I go back to that, that car of Jack McIntyre. I, I love that livery. It's just, the, the purple and the, the blue just looks amazing, I think. Um, Right, something else we need to talk about that we're not seeing right now, fifth place, is uh, Marcel Fuzzi. I, I, I just don't understand where the bleeding heck 
the guy gets the energy from. He's done two sprint races tonight and he's doing a 2.4 hour endurance race and he's absolutely monstering it. Yeah, last time around he, he did a 1.43 um, last time around. So uh, he's, uh, to be honest with you, the amount of intestinal fortitude this driver has three out of three i think is the only driver i think today that has done all three races here on super saturday that is an impressive in, in split one in split one he's the only driver in split one of the lamborghini super trofeo race the porsche 911 gt3 cup and now the 2.4 hours of imola god you, you know what that just shows true commitment and in, in actual fact that's actually quite good training as well um for, for fuzi uh, who is about 25 seconds away from boothby uh, but is uh, coming up to lap a couple of cars just up ahead and one of which is a honda nsx's mossman in 77 and uh, now pits from p16 and huben now in the pits yep so huben out of the uh, top two is the first one to blink with just over an hour and a half left to go in the race three mandatory pit stops for all the drivers to be taken that means Grunwald will extend his lead and it moves Kim Kachilo up into second place provisionally until we get the uh, round of pit stops there you can see the uh, the 25th place car making his way round uh, that was of course uh, David Kaloxai uh, just making a move over the other Mercedes of Grigory Mostwin and uh, makes it stick very very cleanly as well now Boothby is uh, actually starting to catch up to the back of Kachilo now and uh, this is going to be a very interesting battle for seconds and third if this actually pans out that way because Fuzi has got 26 seconds so I think he's actually getting dropped by that let me just quickly check the times yeah so Fuzi did a 1.43.2 and Boothby doing a 1.41.3 is catching up to Kim Kachilo in second place Alec yeah very much the case i mean it's um it's just really really been interesting i think fuzi might just be conserving a bit of energy you know he's done an at you know he's done qualifying for two sprint races he's done both sprint races he's done the practice sessions for all three races today you know fuzi i think is just going to ch you know the adrenaline is really really um you know sometimes you need to conserve that energy fuzi has been tested big style today and i have to doff my cap to the number 94 aston martin i mean to just that that driver just to be absolutely fastidious and going i'm going to do the triple here on super sunday on split one and to now be running p4 on lap number 31 hats off to him and 10 places up from where he started started p14 and now has made it to p4 and is uh 4.87 seconds ahead of amadeo de Kayser, uh in the number eight medley yeah. and he could genuinely get some some more places uh after the uh, the pit stops are done but we're going to keep our eyes on this battle for second place as it's starting to develop now boothby does have the pace that gap is now just three tenths of a second between second place car of Kim Kachilo and the number 10 Bentley. Both of these drivers still got to make their first of three pit stops as they come round the corner here. And uh, of course, the other thing about this as they uh, make their way round to Aqua Minerale is the fact that, you know, it's going to be a battle of uh, psychology between these two. Who's going to blink first? Who's going to head into pit lane? Don't be surprised to see both of them heading into pit lane at the same time if Boothby is stuck behind Kachilo and he might try and get the undercut into the pits. But it's through Variante Alta with one hour 30 left to go in the race on the run down towards Rovatsa. And uh, yeah, this is this is getting very, very tense, Alex. And uh, Boothby does look like he's got the pace right now. Yeah, watch out for Denks. He's just pitted for the second time with, uh, yeah, just within, what, 50, 50 or so minutes? Attila Denks. Um, I think Michael Hamlet has called a bit of a, a little bit of a dark horse there. The sole BMW M6 we've got on this grid. And he's now in the pits for the second time. Uh, I'm definitely going to be keeping my eyes on the number 18 uh, this evening as well, because that is uh, to be up to what was P11. St having started p22 at the beginning of the race just kept his nose clean pitted on lap one everything else started kicking off in front with the likes of who and muscat and everybody else there 
you know, hats off to him. Okay, it's going to put Denks outside of the top 15, but then you now see that Boothby still trying to close on Kachilo. And look at the track temperature. Since we went green, David, it's dropped two degrees, both air and track. It's still, uh, you know, the cloud cover has sort of got away. The wind has dropped to around 9 kph, um, but it's still dry, which uh, could be uh, very, very interesting indeed in the next hour and 30 minutes. Well, I'm just watching that fight between Boothby and Kachilo, and uh, it was getting a bit sort of fisticuffs earlier on in the lap there. Boothby having to regroup and see as we see Kachilo taking a, an almost leap over the... Uh, the, the curbs are the inside of that corner there, but Boothby's going to have the run down to the uh, the final corner of Ravatsa and uh, thinks better of it. It's all about just putting that pressure on and waiting the time because I think he's going to try again, make that move on the start-finish line or Tamburello or the run-up to Vilnov. So uh, we did see it actually where the two of them were almost side-by-side side through the corner. We saw Kachilo taking the defensive line and then out-breaking himself and Boothby tried to slip up the inside, but was then forced onto the grass by Kachilo that last time round. So here we go then, Kachilo again having to defend from uh, Boothby. As you see, the sky getting very, very dark here. It's a beautiful, beautiful virtual evening here in Italy, but uh, at Imola the uh, sun has set and uh, we are heading into dusk and then in towards the night time over the next hour and a half here Alex uh, we've we've got almost uh, an hour out of the way here I, I mean what what do you think we can possibly expect over the next half hour well, plenty of things um, I could probably have a list of as long as my arm but my chain of thought is uh, somewhat quite interrupted by this mouth-watering battle that we're seeing in front of us still with Boothby in third Cachado in second place. I've noticed that James Bacon in the 125, Aston Martin, has pitted for the second time this evening. So both James Bacon and Attila Denks uh, deciding to go for brokers. Oh, now there was a bit of a lag there from Cachado, wasn't there? And a half going through Variante Alta. Um, uh, but I definitely, I, I had to do a double take on that because I thought, hang on, what what possessed that Bentley to fly sparks up and then decide to go up the quarter mile drag strip with the front wheels in the air? But uh, yeah, cachado has been doing a really good job in that Bentley. He's make he's made it as wide as possible. It's the heaviest car on the grid as well, and to still keep it, P2 yet to make a pit stop after what is it now? 30, 34 laps. We're now on. Cachado's done a fantastic job so far, I must be completely honest. And, he, and Boothby, uh, look, has dropped off the Bentley because the Bentley's got the legs on the Mercedes down the straight line, you know, down the, down the start-finish straight. So uh, some different strategies play being played out. It might be that some drivers, I think Balta and McIntyre, have yet to change tyres. They could be double stinting them, and that is very much an endurance property, you know, where, uh, like say back in, you know, the LMP one, the LMP days back when Audi and Peugeot were at loggerheads before uh, the uh, the hybrid era came into the World Endurance Championship. They were triple, quadruple stinting tyres, making sure that they could make them last as long as humanly possible whilst just sipping on the fuel. As now we've got McIntyre in the uh, Ferrari being chased by Brazil's uh, Gabriel Rodriguez with uh, Jonas van Droyten and Ben Scattergood. This is a four-way scrap that is going to be for 11th position. And McIntyre still hanging on all these four drivers have made their first of three mandatory pit stops with Attila Denks. Uh, also, I've just noticed that uh, Matis Kopf in the number 91 Porsche has also made two mandatory pit stops so far. So some drivers looking to... So uh, James Bacon has also made one of them. So uh, a lot of the drivers at the tail end of the field have really decided to throw caution to the wind. But then you've also 
got the same thing and good to see uh, Ross McGregor jumping up onto the chat saying yeah Denks is a proper alien so I wouldn't be at all surprised if he wins this uh, well put there Ross McGregor it's good to hear from you buddy um, ah, uh, uh, Amadeo de Kaiser now pits from P5 in the number 8 Bentley Continental GT3 so we'll drop possibly more than likely outside of the top 10 there's Ben Scattergood trying to close on Jonas van Droyten in the 995 Aston Martin so it's getting rather interesting so far 1 minute 25 uh, one, minute, 1 hour 25 minutes and 15 seconds as this quartet make their way up the incline from Aqua Minerale as they run down uh, towards uh, and De Kaiser is in the pit still so he's dropped down from what was P5 he's now uh, coming so Huben is out uh, Huben is up into P7 Huben was running uh, second behind uh, Tobias uh, Gronewald in the number 52 uh, Mercedes which still leads and has a gap of 14.3 uh, seconds ahead of Kim Kachilo in the number in the number 10 and De Kaiser will now come out of this battle he'll end up in what will be 14th position as McIntyre still hanging on to 11th position Rodriguez so De Kaiser now has got the headlights and he's come at oh Suarez gets past him and Gary Huang up the inside as well so uh, Van Droyten drops to 16th position after that but no, De Kaiser De Kaiser uh, definitely dropped down the order of a booth beat still closing on Cachalo as we go back to the battle for second and third position out of Torza down to Pinatella and uh, the track temperature still sitting at 11 degrees Celsius and the and De Kaiser I'm just wondering De Kaiser apparently had an extra uh, 10 seconds in the pit stop phase and that could possibly be maybe I think David for uh, maybe a bit more fuel to maybe make that second stint go a little bit longer it'll be such a, a key thing and I think that's what you're seeing here you're seeing all of the different rolls of the dice and to be honest if the first half of the race Alex hasn't gone your way why not why not try something maybe a little bit different that nobody else is thinking of uh, just to, to try and maybe out out oh. uh, let's go sorry only yeah. go, Alex. leaders leaders in the pits Gronewald after 35 laps in the pits so uh, good first stint there for Gronewald that's going to give Cachalo and Boothby that's going to be for the de facto lead but meanwhile here in, for 10th position Van Droyten gets past Rodriguez and now latches onto the back bumper of McIntyre uh, down the start finish straight heading into Tamburello will the Dutch driver send it up the inside of the brick through Tamburello we are about to find out neatly done McIntyre doing the right thing there letting Van Droyten get past he knew he had the run on him but McIntyre quickly on the back bumper of the Aston Martin and uh, also McIntyre back up the inside and Boothby up the inside oh clashes with Cachilo going through Tozer on the run up to Pinatella that was ruthless. Wow, there was absolutely no quarter left on the table for that one, Alex. And uh, back to this battle for 10th, 11th, 12th and 13th. This is mega, mega stuff. Eunice Van Droyten, remember, just five laps ago, he was facing the wrong way in a wall. Uh, and he managed to get himself back on the track very, very quickly onto the back of this group. And just systematically, like a sniper, he's picked these off one by one and he's got himself all the way through to the front. But you have to say, it's all about that cutback from Jack McIntyre. That was absolutely inspired. The way that he just had confidence in his own ability to get the, the cutback from that car. Right, we're going to go on the replay now. Oh, Boothby lunges it from... He does a Danny Rick up the inside of Cachilo through Toza. That was brave and brazen. I did see the slightest amount of door panel rubbing, but I think Boothby, that was just about on the edge, uh, in my honest opinion. It's going to be interesting because we're now going to go to another replay. We're on board 
with George Boothby himself. Look, look how he sends it. Absolutely nails it up the inside. Oh, there was a clash. Let but that was very, very last minute desperation. He did a Danny Rick right there and then. And I think that Cachalo might be sort of a little bit aggrieved about that. Yeah, to, to be fair, he left the door open and uh, yeah, he, he got the move done. And it looks like the contact that was there was already after the move was uh, was initiated so yeah it's um it's it's not like it was a sort of push to pass or anything like that i i can't see anything coming of it but um here's a, another replay this time from the uh the on roof camera and we'll look to the uh, right hand side yeah so the the move's done by that point because he's around the outside and it's because uh the, you know they're trying to turn in on a uh, boothby and that's just, that's never going to work at all. So, yeah, Kachilo, uh, now, yeah, so Booth being the lead in, and Kachilo, it's just, um, it's just what you would expect from somebody in that position. I think at the end of the, the, end of the day, uh, Kachilo has now dropped off, um, you know, 1.3 seconds. But one of the biggest things I noticed there was that Kachilo didn't actually seem so aggrieved as I thought he might be because there was no flashing of the headlights. If it was a if it was classed as a bad move, then Boothby would have gotten plenty of flashes from the front headlights of that Bentley from Kachilo. And now, David, we're going into nighttime well and true and proper. Yeah, the the sky is starting to darken quite quickly. You can see the stars appearing in the night sky here at uh, Emila. Just uh, the, 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 to have a, a, a final word on the uh, the the action there with Kachilo and Boothby. Um, I, I, again, I, yeah, I don't think Kachilo feels aggrieved. Um, what we don't know is what traction control settings they're running as well. It could simply be uh, Kachilo just booted it too hard trying to come out the corner, and the car just you know over rotates. So that that it could be a, a simple thing like that. So. Uh, back to the battle here though for 10th, 11th and uh, 12th place though. Jack McIntyre now starting to, to get a tiny little bit of breathing room uh, between him and Yunus van Droyten. But Gabriel Rodriguez has really impressed me with just how quiet he's been. He's just always been in the background, just waiting, poised. You know what the more interesting thing is? Look where Huben is in comparison with Grunewald. He's jumped in the in, in the pit stop phase. Grunewald is down in sixth place and is 4.1 seconds off of Rob Taplin. It looks like Huben had a quicker pit stop. Yeah, that's that's a great spot, Alex, actually, because he's completely done him on the pit stops. Now, whether or not that's actually going to be a, a sort of relative um, pit stop, we'll have to wait and see. Maybe uh, Huben has under fueled and that could compromise him in the second half of this race. But I I've got to be honest, with uh, an hour and 15 minutes left to go, you know, you're getting to that point where you don't really need to worry about fuel. It's literally just clocking off these pit stops. Yeah, I mean, Cachalo is dropping off the cliff. It seems like Cachalo's had a major moment. I think apparently his engine has cut off. Look, he's 12 seconds behind Boothby. Cachalo yeah. was running. Look, I mean, his last lap was a 1 minute 51.6. And it was on the run to Villeneuve. He lost nearly 10 seconds in the first sector. 10 seconds in the first sector. He lost to Boothby. Cachilo's strategy has been thrown an absolute curveball from left field. I think if we, we keep an eye on that, I think if it keeps going up, then uh, obviously that not just the, the strategy, but I think the, the entire race is in jeopardy right now. We'll uh, keep an eye on it because it's now down to 11.9. So whatever problem he's had might have uh, just decided to, uh, to start resolving itself. Yeah, Taplin's now gone into the pits from P5. Good recovery from not just him, but Yannick Roof as well, you know, considering there was the, uh, the, uh, you know, that the incident that happened involving Sheldon Muscat as well. So Taplin's going to drop out of the top 10. As now we see McIntyre van Droyten. Um, and it, that's Kachilo ahead. That's Kachilo ahead. And is he actually running up to full speed? I think we've got a replay coming up right now. Oh, his, his engine's just gone. Yeah. What on? Well, and that was going in towards, that was Villeneuve, wasn't it, I think? That's what they'd call in real life a control alt delete, I think. Uh, he's obviously restarted the uh, the engine and got it going back up, but 
again, he is uh, he is not on the pace right now at all. No, I mean, uh, yeah, the gap was is now twelve point eight seconds. Cachado absolutely siphoning time to Boothby as you just see these cars absolutely. Marcel Fuzzi in the meantime, hurrah to him. The 94 Aston Martin currently in P3 at the moment and has yet to make a first mandatory pit stop as we go to Jonas van der Reuten from Germany in uh, the number 995 Aston Martin. He's still he's still keeping Jack McIntyre very honest here, isn't he? Yeah, he, he certainly is and he's he's doing a really good job of it as well because we saw Jack McIntyre take that place back after Eunice uh, popped up the inside of Tamburello and uh, you know Jack was showing the pace that he had but Eunice, I, I don't know if it's a case of Eunice is just holding on to the tail, we know how fast he is um, so it could just be he's waiting for the pit stops to go um, and then just make his move. Baltz are now pits uh, for his second mandatory pit stop from uh, P7. So that's going to drop him out of the top 10. But Amadeo de Kaiser battling with uh, Daniel Suarez. Uh, this is a great little battle, Bentley versus Audi. And then you've got uh, the ever-recovering Gary Huang in the number 11. You know, remember that he was in the barriers earlier on in the race and uh, he's already one pit stop down as well. So Huang really on the comeback charge and, and doing a good job being, you know, in 15th at the moment. And uh, the other point being, with uh, an hour and 14 minutes left to go, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think, Alex, what's your opinion of the remaining pit stops? Because we see Dex. Dex is obviously an outlier here, as is Cops and uh, Bacon and Pollock. They've all done their, their second pit stop. But for these top guys, when do you think you're, we're going to see the second pit stop? And in the case of Fuzzy and Ruoff, when do you think we're going to see their first? Well, I think probably with, like, say, Huoff and Fuzzi, probably maybe with an hour to go. Uh, Fuzzi now pits. So I say that. God, dear. Yeah. How to upset the apple cart by Marcel Fuzzi. Three races and split one here on Super Saturday. And he pits just as I say, well, probably with about an hour to go. So Fuzzi's going to try and get the undercut on, or maybe say, I mean, Boothby, Boothby and Kachala have yet to pit, haven't they? So that's going to give him a bit of a, an advantage in that sort of respect but then he's you know Huben's now got p3 as there's uh, Amadeo de Kaiser Daniel Suarez round the outside of the Bentley going through uh, Toza he could have got a good run uh, if he carried the momentum a bit more towards the outside but good defending there by Amadeo de Kaiser from Belgium uh, it's just about how Cachalo and Boothby respond to what Fuzzi has done now because that puts the top two and the top six as Ruoff has now pitted for the first time. So Ruoff and Fuzzi, with about uh, one hour and 13 minutes still to go on this race. Now, uh, and Boothby, I think, has just pitted, uh, has pitted the leader on lap number 41. See, Ali is uh, Balzoita facing the wrong way across the gravel there. I think we saw them, uh, the number 69 car, facing sideways back onto the track as we uh, were watching the Kaiser. Um, making his way through. Brilliant move, by the way, but on, from uh, De Kaiser on the inside of Suarez there. Just popped it up the inside. Uh, it was uh, a very sort of <laughs> non-emotive uh, move up the inside and just made it look so, so easy there. But uh, Fuzzy into the pits and uh, we're now really left with Boothby, Cachilo and uh, in fact, that's that's just it. Uh, Boothby and Cachilo are the only two in the top 20, uh, sorry, the top 15 that haven't pitted. Um, well, they are in the pits. This is possibly going to give... Huben is now coming past. Uh, so, looks like Huben is going to take the lead of the race with an hour and 11 minutes and 48 seconds still to go. Grunewald now takes P3. Well, he's going to take P2. So, this is where it's going to get rather... Yeah, that's going to be rather, rather interesting. So Scolari and Boothby could be on level peggings very shortly. There is Boothby coming out of the pits. And here comes, I think, Scolari. There it is. The battle rejoined between these two and Scolari. If, if, if Boothby had been another five seconds later out of the pits, Scolari would have had him going into Tamburello.
Well, he still might remember that uh, Boothby's going to come out with cold tyre or war mesh tyres, but they're not up to racing temperature, and things like that are going to happen, and Scolari is going to smell blood right now. He's right onto the back of Boothby. Look at how quickly he closes up to the back of that Mercedes, and this is definitely, definitely game on right now as they make the run up through from Toza to Piratella, that left-hander, and it's very, very easy to get your breaking point wrong here at Piratella and move wide over to the uh, left hand, uh, to the right hand side there, but uh, yes, yeah, Galari now, it's all mind games, it's all trying to get into the head of George Boothby and make him uh, make mistakes with that Mercedes, I've got to be honest, I don't think that's going to happen from Boothby, but Scolari definitely is going to make a move within the next lap or two. Yeah, I think probably on the start, finish straight very shortly, look how close Scolari is, As if he gets it right through uh, Rivazza, um, the, the good thing that he'll have is the straight line speed, but also, let's not forget, Boothby, those tyres are pretty much still probably nigh on half up to temp at the minute. You know, he's struggling for traction. The track temperature's still at 11 o'clock. We're into night time now, David. And this is where Scolari, oh, he dives into the pits. Very interesting strategy with just under an hour and 10 minutes still to go. Yep, because of course we've got two pit stops left for the majority of the drivers and uh, I tell you what, with Denks having one pit stop left to go and uh, he's currently lapping uh, in the 140... what? In the low 142s? Hang on a minute, Denks actually could be a bit of a dark horse here. And I know Michael Hamlet said that behind the scenes. Uh, he was tipping him for uh, good things earlier on. We've also had Ross McGregor, as you said, in YouTube chat pointing that out. But I, I didn't put two and two together there until just now and seeing that Dex has still only got one pit stop to go. And he's he is on really, really fast pace right now. Yeah, there is one driver that I've just noticed that is coming for a final pit stop with just over an hour and nine minutes to go. Alexander Pavlik in the number five that has decided to go for broke. So uh, this is where <laughs> we could see something special from Alexander Pavlik or it could li literally fizzle out like an unlit firework <laughs> very, very soon. But the thing is, is that Pavlik currently P24. The Porsche is an agile beast. We know that in the 911 GT3R. But, you know, the likes of Scolari, who now factors in behind uh, Ben Scattergood, in the number nine Bentley and look in front these drivers so the likes of and look you've got McIntyre, Van Droyten, Rodriguez, Scattergood, Scolari his tyres are up to temperature the four in front they could they could find that their tyres might start going away a little bit because the track conditions are still optimum still clear skies overhead and there goes Scolari oh nearly two wheels on the grass tries to plant it around the outside of Scattergood to give him the fright that's going through into Aqua Minerale, but the Bentley holds ground, and there is Scolari saying to Scattergood, Oi, you, get out of the way. In the most polite way, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm imagining yeah. that some different words might have been used in the uh, the, the voice chat channel, but uh, yeah, fascinating to see, as we see, uh, who's that? That's the uh, 83 of Dobes, and that is uh, Suarez, just making it look so so easy taking that position there i think uh Dobez ran wide actually at that corner at the chicane and uh, suarez just thought thank you very much in fact actually no because uh suarez has dropped oh. all the way back because he was up with the kaiser and he's uh, now with uh, Dobez. yeah well rodriguez and scattergood have now pitted just in front of um just in front of uh, scolari and nick baltzer closing on rob taplin uh, these two battling away for what is effectively, well, will now be 12th position as they'll get past Rodriguez and Scattergood who were in the pits at the moment. The the more impressive thing is, you know, when we were talking about uh, Niklas Huben earlier on and Tobias Kornwald uh, a bit earlier on, it, I, I got told by Michael Hamlet that it was uh, that Huben made up two seconds in his pit stop, but look at the gap he's got over Grunwald. Five and a half seconds, but Grunwald is starting to go quicker and wow, Grunewald took nearly eight tenths of a second out of Huben on set to one alone on the last lap. And uh, Boothby's now just pumped in his fastest time of the race, a so one minute 40.893. And uh, here we are with the uh, the man himself on his uh, on his stream. 
Yeah, just watching that here on uh, George Boothby, and I'm, I'm noticing that uh, that gold that he's got at the top right there. New graphics cards, sixty-four pounds thirty-two out of uh, nine hundred pounds. So uh, yeah, if you, I'm presuming that's going to be a, a Nvidia GTX at that price that he's uh, going to be after. But certainly, he's uh, he's looking very very comfortable in his uh, stream just now, and it just shows you the level of concentration these drivers have, uh, Alex. And it's it's mm -hmm. always important to, to stress that to our viewers who maybe don't take part in sim racing but enjoy watching it um to, to, to explain just how much commitment these drivers all have it might be a fun race but these drivers will put in hours and hours and hours of practice in the cars in the tracks to uh, to get ready for these events and they take it very very seriously indeed right well i've just noticed that alexander duderev uh has just been received a drive through for track limits as uh, McIntyre and De Kayser uh, have now pitted for their second mandatory pit stop with just over 65 uh, minutes uh, to go and um, I was going to say I mean Boothby's been pushing hard but he's got he's got a five second penalty uh, according to uh, the the timing tower on the left hand side of the screen I've just noticed well, that is uh, a very and that very was on, ah, that was ah. Now I've just been told it's on the di It was on the dive uh, up the inside of Cachilo. That's where he's got it from. Ah, right, okay. So avoidable contact. That's where it, what it will be. That's what it looked. That's but for regret. Yeah, uh, for yeah. So Cachilo uh, was it was effectively deemed a push to pass by race control. It was over exuberant or aggressive driving from uh, George Boothby um, but uh, at least it's not uh, a, a drive through or a stop go penalty of some description you know Boothby we know is very very capable of uh, pushing that Mercedes hard we saw that at the Spa multi-class when he was in the lead um, in the Ferrari you know so I, I think at the end of the day he knows that he's got work to do uh, and he's just going to do his utmost and, and, and keep pushing yeah for sure for sure and i think that's realistically that's all you can do is just get the head down alex and and just keep fighting away but um you know what impresses me with uh with boothby as we we uh, jump to his, his stream there is how little he's wrestling with that car he looks incredibly smooth and incredibly fast with that it kind of makes me jealous as wow this is what I love about nighttime racing, that explosion from the Mercedes as we see showers of sparks everywhere and yeah this is a glorious glorious sim isn't it Alex in the dark. It is indeed, uh, Josef van Droyten from Germany has now pitted in the 995 uh, so we're with uh, James Bacon and uh, that is the number 55 of Alexander Duderev who still needs to serve that drive through penalty for track limits and Duderev decides to now uh, exit stage right into the pit lane whereas Ben Scattergood now trying to close on uh, the that is the one of the Ferraris the 170 of Olivier uh, Cowenberg um, who was originally showing up as a driver that was in a Mercedes but switched to uh, Ferrari as uh, we've also got Matisse Kopf in the number 91 now with just over an hour to go serving the final pit stop out of three in this race and Alexander Pavlik down in 28th uh, on the tower on the screen is showing as the first driver to have completed all three pit stops yeah, and this is now the time where we're going to see that final roll of the dice with just over an hour left to go in this SimGrid 2.4 hour endurance race as part of our Super Saturday event, the first of hopefully many that we're going to be running here at the, uh, the SimGrid. Uh, I just can't get over how much excitement and how much action we've managed to pack into this one race. We'd, we'd be absolutely laughing ourselves if we had this in one of our uh, championship races, let alone one of our, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of more relaxed, enjoyable events. And uh, the drivers just aren't treating it like that. They aren't treating it like it's just a laugh. It's just a bit of fun. They are taking it very, very seriously indeed. And what a shot this is from Good Time Racing's number 83, Joseph uh, Dobez. And you can see the uh, the exhaust glowing bright orange on the left-hand side of that Mercedes. And on the downshift, you'll see the, the pops and the flames and the bangs 
out of that Mercedes. Absolutely glorious. But more importantly, he is hunting down uh, Suarez at a rate of knots right now. That gap is just 2.4 seconds. Uh, sorry, 0.24 of a second. And uh, yeah, this is going to be over very, very quickly. Yeah, they're just coming through the exit of Aqua Minerale before the rundown to Variante Alta. Suarez, a bit of a sitting duck here, but uh, Josef Dorb is uh, still closing in, right on the back bumper going through. Uh, they both take a, an equal amount of wallop a curb going through uh, the respective parts of it as uh, Matez now pits for the final time in the race with just over an hour remaining on the clock. Down into the double left at Trivazza, down the dip, onto the brakes. And uh, Suarez has now got a bit more breathing space. But uh, we're going to see how much this power of the uh, Mercedes AMG GT3 is really going to help. Well, it hasn't really helped because look at the gap opening up between Suarez and uh, Norbez there. It's gone up from two tenths to nearly six and a half. Uh, and that was going through Variante Alta down into Rivazza. So the Audi, through its agility, has really got the upper hand in the last sector of the track here. Uh, in comparison with the Mercedes. 100% he's absolutely gapped him there. Dennis Suarez off like a stab drat in the Rebellion Audi number 78. And you can see from this glorious rear view shot here from Mikey out Simply Race, we get all these wonderful, wonderful, unusual angles that you would never see in, uh, in real life. But uh, you can see again either side of this camera shot the exhausts of the uh, the Audi glowing bright orange in this nighttime sky here at Imola. And you can see the, the stars in the background as well. What well, a beautiful, beautiful uh, sight that uh, you can you can enjoy here. Uh, just watching then, let's have a, a recap then. It's still at the uh, the lead off the race. It's the uh, number 24 of Nicholas Halvin in the Audi ahead of uh, it's Gronwald in second place in the 52 uh, Mercedes. That's, of course, uh, Tobias Gronwald. And there's George Boothby with that five-second penalty in the Mercedes. The uh, treble sixth car in third place. Fourth place at the moment, Kim Cachilo ahead of Marcel Fuzzi. I I've got to be honest, I don't think we've seen the last of Marcel Fuzzi just yet, Alex. No, not by a long sight. I mean, to be honest with you, to do all three races so far and still to be in significant contention, especially in this race, um, I, I, I think uh, Marcel Fusi has to be my driver of the day, hands down, to, to be that competitive. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's getting rather interesting on how much Fusi will factor in into the last 58 or so minutes of this race. Now, I'm just watching uh, Tobias Grunwald. He is really not able to close that gap down on Nicholas Huben at all. That gap is now up to seven seconds, and it seems to be growing quite steadily as we go by. But this is Jack McIntyre on the back of the uh, the number 11 car of Gary Huang. The, uh, the Mercedes are almost side by side into the, uh, the corner here, into Variante Alta. But, uh, yeah... Jack McIntyre having to sit back and uh, regroup and possibly think about that move later on. Yeah, I think it's just uh, about just biding your time. You know, there's still there's still plenty of time for people to make inroads. Um, but then there are others that are trying to fight their way back, um, as David Kalosai uh, trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Olivia Kalmenberg in the number 170 Ferrari going through into Rivazza. Uh, and you can see the Colossi getting a bit impatient there and he runs a little bit towards the oh now was there a touch between the two there so the Ferrari might have got a little bit of a touch from behind courtesy of the Mercedes and that has allowed Colossi to try and do I think there might have been a little bit of a push to pass attempt maybe but it's dependent on what race control do but Colossi on the outside of Kauenberg uh, going into Tamburello and the 170 Ferrari stays resolute and stays ahead for the minute well, I mean, it's like some sort of 4D chess match that we've got going on here, Alex, with uh, many different pieces moving quite quickly as we see back to that battle between Jack McIntyre and Gary Huang. And Jack McIntyre now round the outside, and that means that he's going to be on the outside in towards this uh, left-hander here. And I think, yeah, Gary Huang's going to have that corner covered. And Jack McIntyre is absolutely pestering him. That's the only one they can use right now as they uh, make the run down to Aqua Minerale. I, I mean, and now, actually, hang on, because Jack McIntyre has uh, botched that 
and he's fallen back quite considerably on Gary Huang. And uh, it's going to be Scattergood in the, uh, the Bentley, Ben Scattergood, that's that's actually catching up to the back of uh, Jack McIntyre now. Yeah, I mean, you make one mistake, that can cost you a little bit of time, or that can cost you a whole heap of time. And that's what Jack McIntyre's just found out. I mean, Scattergood is, what, one and three-quarter seconds behind? Um, so there's still all to play for between those two as uh, Karenberg again comes under fire from Colosso uh, going through into Rivata. So oh, that was a cheeky move and a half from Colosso up the inside of Karenberg um, in the 170 ACC Flanderen uh, Ferrari. Uh, that was a that was opportunistic at its very best there from from Colosso. So uh, a, a good job. Uh, on that battle it's great to see that even though we are into the night time here as Karenberg trying to go up the inside of Colossae again to return the favour through into Tamburello but Colossae this time keeps it planted around the outside carries the momentum through into Tamburello um, you, you can just see that even uh, and I've just heard that Sheldon Muscat in the number four uh, in the uh, number 14 Mercedes was running P24 has just DNF'd a, a, a disconnect from the server I'm afraid yeah, that um, that is the least surprising news I think we'll hear from tonight. It was a, a disastrous race for him, and uh, he'll certainly go back to the drawing board, and I think he'll come back out the uh, the gates sprinting next time because he really is an incredibly talented driver. Um, it's just unfortunate the way the the dice have rolled for him this time round. Um, just having a look there, Alex. Someone I've noticed there the fifty five of Alexander D uh, uh, Dudarev. He did have a drive through. He's now got ten second penalty as well. Yeah, that was for the incident on lap one involving him and car one sixteen of Timo Berkel in the Audi for avoidable contact. So that's where Duderes' penalty has come from. He got a drive through uh, because of track limits, uh, which was instigated by you know by the track cut system software here on Assetto Corsa Competizione. So Duderes will still have a ten second time penalty post race. Um, so that will probably drop him to around about P23 if things were to finish as they are now uh, because he's got the number 77 that is of Grigory Mostman uh, in the Mercedes is about seven seconds just behind. All right, okay. So I, I, for a minute there I thought they served it during the, uh, during the, the pit stops but um, 53 minutes left to go in the race. Scargood now all over the back of McIntyre and he's going to fire it up the inside. McIntyre is not going to like this one little bit at all and Scargood looks to try and make that move stick it's through Vilnov then the second set of chicanes it's going to be McIntyre around the outside sorry excuse me that's Tosa the left-hander at Tosa that they're uh, at just now and they're making the run up towards the uh, left-hander at Piratella right now I've got to be honest I think Scargood's got that move done but for how long? Because we know McIntyre is pesky he's persistent and he will not go away yeah, I've, I've heard that. Uh, I've, I've uh, commentated on Jack McIntyre before. I know that he is very, very well accomplished. But with the the sheer breadth and depth of this field here, on the 2.4 hours of Imola, you know, even he has been put through the ringer. And you can just see ahead that is oh, Gary Huang in the number 11 Mercedes, just up ahead from Scattergood. So this now has not just become a two-way scrap for 18th. It's become a three-way scrap for 17th and it's just dependent who's going to get the good run coming out of Rivazza. Now if they keep it neat and tidy, tighter line taken by McIntyre allows the Ferrari to go a little bit, drift out a little bit further coming out of uh, Rivazza as they go across the start finish line. You know they're pushing over 250 kilometers an hour uh, in top in sixth gear, you know nigh on red lining it going towards Tamburello and then hard on the brakes but McIntyre, okay was neat and tidy through Rivazza but it's also about the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the tyres degrade, the fuel level drops, the centre of gravity isn't going to be as prominent when the car's got a fresh set of tyres. And let's not forget that McIntyre didn't change tyres on his first pit on his first pit stop. Did he change it on his second? That's very different. But what you've got to understand here, David, you know I said about the fact that the track temperatures might hit single degrees? We're one degree off that right now for track and air. It's dropping quite quickly now with the uh, the time at 10 o'clock in sim time. It's uh, very close to European time, of course, just about 10 minutes out. 
and uh, it's uh, been a really really enjoyable part of tonight is the fact that the uh, the time and the weather have uh, simulated uh, the the European counterpart in real life so it's uh, a nice little addition to tonight as we see around the outside there that is the uh, the team for Zillicar of Kevin Scolari uh, I think on the stream just now we're seeing him picture yeah. picture that is his twitch stream that we're seeing just now and we can see him uh, on our feeds in picture and picture as well yeah you can also see his throttle inputs his steering inputs um you can also see on his steering wheel you know the 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 heads up display obviously the uh the rev the rev light shift uh you know the the shift limiter on on the actual steering wheel itself you can just see how calm and composed he is looking to rotate that car in having to correct a little bit using a bit of brake and throttle modulation now as he came out of the corner through rivazza he put the literally put the pedal to the metal and scattergood now trying to chase down and hassle gary huang in the number 11 mercedes wouldn't put it past uh, Scattergood actually getting past Huang here because the pace that he's got is quite something else in that Bentley right now as the the, uh, the cooler air seems to, to benefit the power of that car right now. Just looking at uh, Gabriel Rodriguez as well having to defend from Eunice Van Droyten in the 995 Aston. That gap's now just uh, six tenths of a second and uh, we can see Taplin in for his second of three pit stops. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you're going to see the likes of Suarez, Fuzzi. I think they're going to be going for a longer second stint and then splash and dash. It, it's it's a consistent topic of discussion between you and me uh, for any endurance race, whether it be a 90 minute uh, race with two pit stops and also now here with a, a 2.4 hour race, two, two hours, 24 minutes. Uh, in total with three mandatory pit stops and it's going to be rather interesting i'm just looking at the lap times between huben who is leading we're now on to lap number 56 of this race david he's just put in a one minute 41.811 granovart is trying to cl close down in getting chunks of time out of him but he's uh he was literally just over a tenth quicker on that previous lap and the gap still between the, the top two 8.238 seconds just feels like it's building to something we don't quite know what yet but uh, it, it does have that feeling like something quite dramatic is about to happen in the uh, the next 20 minutes so i'm going to bookmark that one and uh, say i told you so if if something vaguely uh, dramatic does happen <laughs> uh, <but laughs> hey, joke, joking aside i mean what i've really been impressed with and i say this all the time at the sim grid races is just the quality of driving from from these drivers tonight has just been impeccable this is on par no word of a lie to watching uh, a blancpain gt race um, the, the standard and skill of these drivers um is is just absolutely fantastic to watch and i hope that comes across for uh, everybody watching at home on youtube i mean it's certainly been the case you know i was a relative newcomer to esports commentary uh, until early, you know, April last year, where I got the opportunity to to start in in you know uh, and McIntyre. As I was just about to start telling a nice little tale for the folks at home, Jack McIntyre has got a track limits drive-through penalty. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, kind of burst that bubble. Um, that that's definitely, by the way, not the dramatic. Uh, turn of events that I thought was going to happen there's still more to come so that's um, that's, a, that's a setback for Jack but he's fast he's still got a penalty mm -hmm. in, a pit stop in hand um, he, he might be able to make this work for himself and, and he's just he's just gone straight into the pits as you said that David so he must have heard you there um, but yeah I mean the having started with doing esports commentary as of around about April last year so that's what crikey that's over nine months you know, I've been really impressed with the standard and the professionalism of the drivers and, and, and sort of coming here to, you know, we saw that the British Classics that you and I worked on as our first gig here on SimGrid together. You know, I've just been absolutely blown away. And, and it's just such a pleasure as a commentator to, to see such great action as that was a great move as Gary Huang actually, uh, I think, lost a bit of momentum. And Ben Scattergood sent it well and truly up the inside nice and cleanly from the number nine Bentley. It's just like people say to me what is the allure of esports well you've got 
great platforms, you've got great communities, including here at SimGrid. Um, and the quality of racing, the amount of banter behind the scenes between the drivers, you know, we, uh, through the communities, we have a laugh, we have a joke. You know, to see the likes of, you know, Dave Perel, Jordan Pepper, Kelvin Van der Linde, uh, you know, being part of, you know, the bigger part of the, the, the GT racing world, um, and to see them as part of Coach Dave Academy, it's brilliant because it just shows how close the divide is now between esports and real life racing. The technology, the amount of money I know of people investing, you know, like 30, 40,000 pounds into a state of the art simulator with a top of the line PC is just absolutely incredible. And, and just to think that, you know, there are some people that aren't even, that don't have that kind of money, but they have, they've been scouted by, by top teams, you know. Uh, and to get this kind of racing here at the SimGrid, it's just an absolute joy to watch. And, and for myself, as someone who's been involved in, in sim racing for well over a decade and a half now, uh, the transformation is, is literally unrecognisable. I mean, the fact that I'm sitting here at home with one of my friends commentating on a simulated race, you know, if you'd said that 15 years ago, uh, it, it, you would have been kind of laughing to yourself. It's just, mm -hmm. it's incredible. And the, the show that, uh, you know, that Michael Hamlet and uh, Mike Kiao behind the scenes help put on, it's it's just, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing place that we're we're at right now. And we're very, both of us, very, very privileged to, uh, to, to be part of this unfolding story with uh, sim racing and uh, and esports. But, uh, yeah, let's let's get back to the race because I'm I'm starting to feel a bit teary and emotional at, uh, at all this reminiscing here. 45 minutes <laughs> left to go in the race, and uh, what a 2.4 hour endurance race of Imola we have had here. We hope you've really really enjoyed Super Saturday as much as we have. And Eurus Van Droyen gets a drive through penalty as well. Drive through penalties for everyone apparently, and uh, yeah, that's going to be for track limits almost certainly. Well. He was uh, sitting quite comfortably in 15th, not anymore. No, no, that means he's got to make an up. And he, you know what? This, that was the sensible call from Jonas van Droyten from Keck Esports. The best thing to do is just get it done, you know. Think, of, look at it after the race, just deal with the now, get it sorted, get back out on track, put the hot laps in, just push like crazy, but don't make any mistakes. Now we're into nightfall here, because that is. Uh, that is Suarez I've just seen and I think has he just been passed by Nicolas Uben the race leader that's uh, so we're now uh, on lap number 59 that is the case Nicolas Uben in the Rutronic racing car um, Rutronic racing having uh, uh, a few drivers uh, I think I remember ADAC GT Masters last year Dennis Marshall and I think uh, Harry, uh, I think it was Carrie Fisher as well no, not Carrie Fisher it's uh, there's a, there's a young uh, German lady, I'm trying to remember her surname now, I've got to Google it now because I've dropped that clan. Um, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm just, it's just, I'm just like... Gonna, I'm just going to leave you drowning there, Alex. Yeah, well, at least um, it was quite funny listening to your pronunciation attempts earlier on today, mate. <laughs> it's amazing because it's like you get off all these uh, these these uh, uh, amazing you know worldwide names and uh, yeah, I'm absolutely useless at trying to pronounce them. I'll still give it uh, a go, thank and it's usually quite hilarious. Thank, yeah, yeah. Carrie Schreiner, thanks to uh, yeah Marcus, uh, yeah Marcus Eichhorn, who was in the uh, GT4s with us at Spa. On Thursday night, I knew, I, um, and she's now uh, started to do a lot of uh, work with uh, Schaeffler, uh, who, uh, and that was recently to test drive what was called the uh, the Space Drive Steer by Wire Audi R8 LMS. Um, so there's no, and that was the flyby wire steering as opposed to the normal conventional steering column uh, aspect that you have in the current uh, GT3 cars. Yeah, fancy. It's a uh... It, it, it really does fascinate me the uh, the, the cutting edge technology kind of kind of side of thing and the amount of test drivers that they do have involved and all that sort of stuff and the the uh, the top secret uh, work that they have to do. But uh, we eventually see it. Oh, Dennis Suarez hits the curb and around and around and around he goes in rebellion. Audi that came out of absolutely nowhere. There you go. There's a little bit of uh, dramatic 
interpretation for you. My goodness me, I did not expect that one. And that was on the exit of uh, the run down to Ravazza. Wow. So, yeah, and uh, someone nearly got collected. Denks in for a final stop. Scolari in for a final stop. Uh, David, Huben's in the pits as well. This, uh, has someone pulled the pin on the grenade and thrown it to the general direction of the Autodromo Enzo with Dino Ferrari? I think that's just happened with about 41 minutes to go. My goodness me. And that was just absolutely at random as well. He just clipped the curb on the outside of the corner and went absolutely flying. That is, as a driver, you hate stuff like that because everybody sees it and there's nobody else around you that you can blame. So you've only got yourself and uh, you're, you're left with your head in your hand. So, yeah, a very, very strange moment there. Oh, that was uh, that was just definitely, um, I think, new Nomex time there for Denis Suarez, I think. Uh, that was definitely not what he wanted to do, and he was running what? Um, uh, well, he's he's still apparent. Is he is he still running P7? He's he he got away with that one, and that was what was that coming out of Variante? Yeah, uh, yeah. So who? So effectively, Suarez has benefited because of, uh, and Denks has now pitted for the final time. Oh, Michael Hamlet's dark horse in the BMW, now P13 with 40 minutes to go. There we go. Wow. This is this is awesome stuff. I think Denks is on for a, a top 10 finish easily. Um, especially when you consider Suarez, Roof and Fuzzy have still got two pit stops to make. Um, so that's that's what 35, 40 seconds plus um, per pit stop. That'll, that'll easily handle it. Yep, over the curb, bang, around and around. And around the corner goes Suarez, and oh my goodness me! Oh, he did that was uh, that was the uh, McLaren. That was no, no, that was McIntyre. That was McIntyre. McIntyre in the Ferrari, like literally, Suarez did a 720, and McIntyre had nowhere to go. My goodness me, that was <laughs> not just a moment. But uh, Scolari seems to be have a little bit of a train, and he's got De Kayser, Taplin, Rodriguez just behind, as Boazita has now got a drive through in the number 69 Honda. Uh, so the 20th place Honda, uh, and yeah, that's for unsafe rejoin, I believe. So yeah, it's uh, the mistakes they are a coming. Yeah, thick and fast, and that's it. It's uh, tired to start to set in. The amount of concentration that this requires, Alex, is uh, is like nothing else. It's obviously, um, you know, we we see endurance racing all the time, um, and I know obviously you were you were at Silverstone watching the the, the C ones do their thing. Uh, the uh, concentration that's required at night time alone is probably more than double what you would require during the day because having to focus, getting a rhythm. I mean, any of you that, that actually drive in general on a, on a road to know what it's like driving on a highway at night, you, you always end up finding that you, you kind of tail a car in front of you just so that you've got that general idea of where the road's going. Um, and the, the concentrate, your eyes are out on stocks. Now imagine doing that for a full you know, hour, hour and 20 minutes of this race when you've got cars flying by you and, and you know, doing all sorts of crazy things. It's it's a mentally draining event. It is indeed. Um, just had confirmation incident on lap 60 involving car number 69. That is uh, Elias uh, Boizita in the Honda and car triple six, George Boothby. Drive, drive through to Boizita for an unsafe rejoin. So Boizita now serving that penalty. Gary Huang has now uh, hit it for the final time. One of the interesting things, you know we talked about Boothby having a five second penalty for over aggressive driving on Cachilo on that move up the inside of Toza. Well the next pit stop, it will automatically make him serve that five second penalty. So when Boothby gets out of that second pit stop, it's he's now going to have that opportunity to absolutely go for it. And look, my driver of the day, Marcel Fusi from Sidemax Motorworks in the 94 Aston Martin, with still two pit stops to go with about 36 and three quarter minutes remaining, still running P5. 
Yeah, that is a fantastic, fantastic drive. But I am now starting to get a little bit concerned for those drivers in the top 10 who are still on two pit stops left to go because you've got an increasing number of drivers now with just one pit stop to go. And given the, the amount of time that it takes for a car to go in and out of pit lane alone, let alone the actual pit stop, it's fine taking a splash and dash. But the, the time that they're going to concede as well, I, I just don't think this gamble is going to pay off for them. No, I completely agree because you're going to see the likes of Huben, Baltzar, I think, are going to profit. I mean, Scolari uh, could be one that really could factor in. Um, but yeah, then you look at the list Grunewald, Boothby, Cachilo, all have two pit stops still to make because uh, there was a Bentley flying through the uh, Variante Alta there. And oh, Cachilo's got a drive through. That is for track limits, the mistakes again. And and that was the Bentley. That was that was Cachilo's final track cut before he got a drive through. And Cachilo, that has taken him out of contention for the top three. And now he goes into the pits uh, to serve that drive through. So Cachilo, in the next 35 and a half minutes, has to serve another two pit stops, include uh, not including the drive through that Kim Cachilo is now serving. Didn't somebody say something five minutes ago about dramatic undertakings in the next 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right there. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't see that one coming, though. That is, that again, that's one of those things that is, it, it's his own fault for, for exceeding track limits. You get plenty of warnings from the uh, sim, and uh, it's just a case that you get... You can't help it. It's not something that's done deliberate. It's a case of you're pushing as hard as you physically can. And if for whatever reason, the, the car understeers and you, you get pushed out wide, that's exactly what happens now. But, I mean, look at this, Alex, right? We've got five drivers in the top ten that have only pitted once, that have still got two stops left to do. And you look at Scolari, and he's done both of his stops. Now, granted, he is probably well over a minute and a half behind the uh, the race leader but i uh, yeah he's he's definitely surely in contention for a top five position very much the case and a good point from made by ross mcgregor uh once again he said uh attila Denks's pace is not good enough Denks is only running in the 140 19s at the moment um so and yeah scolari i think could really now be the danger driver I mean, um, <clears throat> Suarez, I think, uh, you know, Suarez had, through that trip, I mean, you know, uh, and uh, Cachilo, they they have now struggled. And there's going to be other drivers. I mean, De Keyser has one pit stop to take. Scattergood, one pit stop to take. Rodriguez, Dobes, McIntyre. You're seeing a hell of a lot of green on the... And you remember I said about Alexander Pavlik in the number five Porsche? Currently in 18th position. Just watching that there on screen just now, that was one heck of a move from Juris van Droyten on uh, Matthias Kopf there for the uh, the position of 19th right there. Um, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, the other thing, going, going back to Michael Hamlet's danger man, Denks, in the uh, BMWs, we see Rob Taplin, and uh, that is your race leader just uh, making his way by just now, the, uh, the, the number 52. Um, but it, back to to Denks and the the BMW. Now the cars in front of him, Alex. Collectively, I worked that out. That is around about twenty seconds from that thirteenth uh, place that he's in up to that ninth position. So I think he's going to take all of them in one fell swoop. When they go in for pit stops, he will just. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so effectively, um, there are going to be a lot of strategy calls from the drivers with we, as we've got 32 minutes and 17 seconds still on the clock to go. Um, coming back to David's point, uh, Danks is now running in the 141.8. And in comparison with uh, Josef uh, Dobes, who he is about, uh, who is about 4.7 seconds up the road, is lapping in the 142 fives and so that is effectively seven tenths of a second uh, between them as Taplin find it firing his Lexus through Aqua Minerale and is 1.1 seconds behind the 125 
Aston Martin of James Bacon. Tobias Kohnwald still leads the German in the number 52, Euronics Gaming Mercedes, as a lead of 8.7 seconds ahead of George Boothby. But Boothby, in the meantime, has got the hammer down in the Mercedes. And that gap is coming down. It's now 8.3 seconds and was over 8 tenths of a second last time around. And there is Boothby. He's still got two pit stops to... Uh, to take and then you've got the likes of Niklas Huben who rounds out the top three the top Audi with uh, Daniel Suarez having a bit of a moment earlier on in the race with that 720 there's uh, Marcus Eichhorn posted on the chat he did a 720 but not in the McLaren uh, with the laughing emoji just behind it so uh, ballots are now pits from seventh position in number 50 we go back on board with uh, the number triple six of George Boothby, and as David was saying earlier on, he's interact well. He's interacting with everybody at the moment. You can see that we've got his car picture in picture here. And, uh, the tyres looking rather consistent on the pressures. 24, 27.4 psi on the fronts, 27.5 on the rears. As we're heading into the last 30 minutes of this race. And you can see a bit of dust kicked up and we're going to go to a replay here and that is with the 170 of Olivier Kauenberg and uh, oh someone had a bit of a moment just behind that would have been I think the number 11 Mercedes of Gary Huang so uh, Huang having a bit of a moment Kauenberg nearly got uh, hit from behind as a result of it however you can just see now how committed and the good thing is, is that Boothby has got a really, really good run uh, in this Mercedes at the moment. Uh, you can see a lot of data on the right-hand side. He's got the throttle absolutely pinned. Oh, hitting 150 going into Rivazza. And then here is a... Oh, now that was a turnaround there. Now was that... Oh, that was Kauenberg. And that was going through Toza. And I think that might have been a bit of a, a rejoin there. So Kauenberg has lost two places and luckily enough Gary Huang just behind in order to pick up the pieces there from the Ferrari driver. That's not what you want to see especially coming up to the final half hour of the uh, the race here Alex it's uh, it's really starting to, to unfold I mean I remember saying at the at the hour mark about you know we weren't sure about how this was going to play out and just in the space of half an hour we've had so many incidents going on drive through penalties we've had cars spinning off for absolutely no reason but look at this Marcel Fusi absolutely on it right now he is pushing really really hard in that uh, in that Mercedes right now but I mean it's, it's well, it, crazy yeah. to think that Alex he started in 14th position and that he's up in in fourth he's got two podiums already today and uh, yeah he's he's in a strong drive but remember he's still got two uh, pit stops to take yeah I mean the, the thing is is that he really needs to get those two pit stops out of the way and you look at the gap between him and Kachilo, and that gap is not enough, I think. But then Kachilo, in his own right, has still got two pit stops to make. So Fusi's got to try and get the undercut here. You know, he can try and get the undercut, not on, he can't get it on Niklas Huben. Huben's got one more pit stop to make. You then have to look at Grunewald and Boothby. And when you, and Van, Van Dr Van Royten apparently has um, got some muscle pain, a hurt right leg apparently I'm just hearing uh, through my, uh, our ever-present ever oracle Mr Michael Hamlet that he's got uh, a sore leg and uh, is not going to be able to continue but fusi has got to really do the undercut on Boothby, Groenewald he'll have a bit of a, a little bit of time in hand courtesy of Boothby's five second time penalty for the incident with Kachilo. Kachilo is 20 seconds behind fusi has got to really really make this strategy count uh, but then you've also got Yannick Ruoff. Yannick Ruoff was all the, you know, he's come back from absolutely nowhere after that massive moment with Sheldon Muscat, who's retired, and also Rob Taplin. Taplin is in 15th, and Taplin, I think, could also really factor in if he really, really pushes that car. He's running in the 142.8, so I think that the real danger drivers now are more the case of 
You know, Huben, I think, is probably going to be de facto leader once he's done all his pit stops and you've got the likes of Grenville, Boothby, Fuzzy, Cachilo, um, and Huoff. You know, Fuzzy will be able to do the jump on Huoff no problem at all with a pit stop as long as he doesn't have any delays. Um, so it's all about now who's going to blink first. I, I've got to be honest, I don't understand why Fuzzy's still out just now. He's. he's the, the tyres must be absolutely short on that thing. His last lap was a 143.7. The lap before that was a 143.2. And the thing is, is that he's just been undertaken by... Uh, that was Dobez in the 83 um, that, that just under that got past him. And, uh, yeah, I, I just don't understand why either his pace has dropped off or his tyres are done. I mean... I mean you, you know, he, he changed tyres. He changed tyres on his first pit stop. So they're only 27 laps old, David. But you've got to understand that out of every single driver, you know, he is the only one that has done all three races. He is getting tired. There's no doubt about that. If you're that far off the pace, you know, look at um, Niklas Huben's pace last time around. 1 minute 41.1. Marcel Fusi was 2.6 seconds slower in the Aston Martin, even on fresher rubber. So I think Fuzzy, I think he's going to be in the top 10. He won't, I don't think he's going to get a third podium in a row here on Super Saturday. But unless something befells the drivers in front, who knows? Yeah, that's that's. I I honestly just don't understand this at all. Not just with Fuzzy, but with the with those top five drivers, with the top six drivers, with the fact they've got to take two uh, pit stops, I I can't see them any of them finishing the top five. Fuzzy's in, in the pits just now, but uh, I I honestly can't see it at all. Yeah, I think this is going to give him the advantage over Cachado and Hoff. Um, You know, if he. If he makes it a top five at the end of this, I will be absolutely beside myself on that front. It's just it, it, the the strategy it, it does not compute at all. You know, Grunvald and Boothby still out with two pit stops to make. Cachilo, Wolf, everyone else, like from Scolari downwards, has either got all three pit stops in the bag or they've still got one more to serve. It's those four drivers out of the top six that really now... I mean, Fuzzy now has got one more pit stop to serve. I think if he's going to chance it, he's going to... The ultimate thing to do is to do a splash and dash right at the end. You know, like, maybe with the, about five minutes to go, that might help him. But then it's dependent on Cachalo, Hoff, Boothby and Kornwald. How are they going to respond? Are they going to get the, uh, the undercut on him? We don't know. Just having a look as well. Scolari is is my man right now, Alex. I, I think he's in the pound seats right now as well as uh, Hauben. Hauben, I think, is uh, potentially in in for a w if he doesn't get a win, it's definitely going to be a podium for for Hauben for sure. And um, with the fact that he's only got one pit stop left to go, but Scolari, the pace that he's got, the fact that he's done all three pit stops as well, yeah, I think he's looking very very good. Yeah, it is just about who is going to really uh, exercise that best strategy because you just you can't tell. You don't know what the drivers are thinking. You don't know how they're going to react uh, according to certain situations, David. Um, and it's just and have you just seen that George Boothby's uh, information on his screen just showed he's just had a track limits warning from race control saying no time game but he's still got a track limit ping the mistakes are starting to come in these drivers are getting tired you know we're over two hours into this race i don't think we're done yet there is going to be something that is really really going to change the dynamic of this race and we could see a winner decided right at the final throw well it's not going to be rain because the forecast now clear for the remainder of the race here at uh, Emila for the 2.4 hour endurance race. It's still uh, Grunwald in the lead ahead of uh, George Boothby by 8.1 seconds, but Boothby with a 5 second penalty. Oh, I'm sure that was a little bit of a nudge there on uh, Nick Balzar there from 
uh, was that Rodriguez behind him that he, he took the position from there completely unintentional just as they exited the corner there but uh, Balzar makes up that position and uh, again moves himself up even further and he's now the second car in the top 10 to have done all his pit stops yeah I mean Attila Danks is currently 2.472 seconds off of um yeah, off of uh, that was uh, Dobes in, in 12th position. And you can just see how hard these drivers are still pushing. I mean, I cannot believe this. You know, we, we were astounded, you know, for the last, you know, three 90 minute races we've covered here on SimGrid together. Uh, it's now, oh, James Bacon gets a drive through. James Bacon gets a drive through in 17th position. Track limits once again. It's darkness. The darkness really, really does change the dynamic. And as you said earlier, David, the drivers are in the tail end of this race. It's where it's going to hurt the most. And the drivers have really, really got to just watch it. Yeah, and it, it, it's concentration. It's like, again, like you were saying as well, you know, it's it's a two and a, almost two and a half hour race. Tiredness sets in, fatigue sets in. It's really difficult to see the track when it's dark because obviously there's no uh, real overhead lighting. You've got the occasional patchy lighting from uh, track sides, uh, you know, track side locations. But for the most part, you're having to rely on your own memory of the track. And uh, there's a there's a perfect example of just how dark it can be. Now, uh, actually, to prove that point, it'd be great if we could actually jump on board with uh, one of. Yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, I think if we can jump on board, let's go on board with Nick Balta. You can just see how difficult these conditions are. Rodriguez now pits for the final time. You can just see how much curb Balta is still taking through Tamburello. We now come out of the corner, down towards Villeneuve. You can just see they're just able to make out the apexes. It is about literally anticipating what not just the car is doing the conditions the wind has dropped from what was 15 kilometers an hour earlier on uh in qualifying and in the early throws of the race you know we're down to three kph winds track temperature still at 10 degrees celsius we've got 19 or so minutes left to go and you can just see as david was saying your eyes have to be on stalks down through piratella into the dip towards aqua Minilare taking it fourth gear at about 180 case you then put on the, le the lift off hit the brakes down to second up through the second part of aqua Minerale. now the run down and this is where things get rather tricky because you've got to really time it well under the bridge into variante alta and that's nice and clean there from nick balta and because the thing is is that as i mentioned earlier the consistency is where it really really counts and with these mistakes coming in the drivers are really going to have to watch their A game. It is not easy. And when you come up amongst uh, back marker traffic like George Boothby is right now, it's not just about the fast, faster car trying to get past. And this is going to be rather... <laughs> now, Boothby gets past... Um, I think that is the number 55 of Duderev that he's just passed there out on the track. As Duderev runs a little bit wide coming out of uh, Piratella into uh, Aqua Minerale but it's about not just the faster car making the move past safely it's also about the other driver trying to get past or well, to stay out of the way and it's about the mutual racing respect and the drivers in these difficult conditions are having to watch everything again so and Duterov actually looked looked it looked like uh Dudrev actually got the Varianti Alta curse uh, and this is the corner that Daniel Handover was talking about earlier on in both the Super Trofeo and the Porsche race so so Cachalo has pitted for the penultimate time as has Grunewald and so Boothby takes the provisional lead with 17 minutes and 20 seconds still to go uh, so Boothby now has to really put in the work the work rate here now and it is about how he can capitalize on the likes of Grunwald Ruoff now up into fourth Huben in third place Ruoff still not yet pitted for his second pit stop of the night here on the Sims Grid if you haven't already subscribed 
why haven't you? We've got a lot of exciting racing coming up, which we'll, uh, I'll briefly talk about now. More female races by Thrustmaster. Monday night, January 25th. It is the season finale here at Imola. The Sprint Cup Season 2 finale takes place at Kyle Army on January 28th. And then the penultimate round, round four, of the Endurance Cup Season 2 will take place on February 6th. The four hours of Le Castellet at Paul Ricard. A lot of action still to come as Scattergood pits for the final time. Boothby now on lap number 75 of this race has a lead of around 11.6 seconds ahead of um, Tobias uh, Grunewald and, uh, and Grunewald. And uh, it is going to be uh, an interesting fact that uh, Grunewald actually did the reverse uh, psychology trick on Huben because Grunewald did not take tyres in his second pit stop. So he's gone for the long game. And his uh, his tyres are now 40 laps old and that and he is really he's running on the pace and effectively um, Boothby's running in the 141.3s, Huben in the 141.0s uh, and uh, Grunewald has got one more pit stop to make and if he does a splash and dash and sticks on a new set of tyres that car could be very very quick around the track but he wouldn't put tyres on he probably would just do a splash and dash as he's now flashing tra traffic in front of him to literally and that and that is uh, Amadeo de Kaiser in the number eight Bentley uh, that has managed that is ahead and Grunewald is actually De Kaiser has decided to pit from 8th position for the final time. The drama never stops here at the 2.4 hour endurance race. The finale out of three races for the Super Saturday here on the Sim Grid. So looking, looking forward to... Sorry Alex, I was just saying looking forward to the, to the final 15 minutes. I mean, this is... This is like a chess match playing out. Who knows how this is going to go down? You've got the uh, the outsiders of Scolari and Balta looking on in with the fact that they've done their three pit stops. And then you've got Boothby, Gronwald and Huben uh, along with Ruov. Who knows what they're thinking right now? Uh, Gronwald and Huben, I mean... Yeah. So effectively, uh, yeah, Grunewald could really be the danger here because Huben is uh, about, well, he's not that far behind. He's about 2.3 seconds. Uh, it just really, really uh, caused a major problem for uh, Huben. So literally, they've been trading haymaker blows in the pit stop phases, but now it's going to come down to the wire. Boothby, I think, will not factor in towards the... Uh, Vic, uh, towards the victory you know the first pit stop out of the two and, and he's got 13 and a half minutes to do the pair of them and when you look at it that is going to put him out of i i think possibly it depends on well who off might be out of it Fuzzy might be in a shot with the podium here and, and i'm and that is an outside chance i wonder what my our, our uh our resident uh, expert, Mr. Michael uh, Hamlet, might say about that one, but Marcel Fuzzi still running P5, 15.8 seconds behind Yannick Kulov with 13 minutes to go. fuzzi has got a pit stop in hand. This, oh, <laughs> the dice are ready to be rolled, and whoever decides to roll it and get blackjack, it, blackjack, then that's really going to pay dividends after what's been an enthralling Super Saturday here on the Sim Grid. If you haven't already um, followed us on social media, you can type in the Sim Grid on the search engines on Facebook. You can follow us at the Sim Grid on Instagram and Sim underscore Grid on Twitter. You can also head for any relevant news, obviously about the the uh, recent uh, announcement earlier on this week, this past Thursday, of course, about season two of the World Cup. Uh, and uh, David, I think you know. All this racing so far, not just in 2020, but in 2021 for the Sim Grid, things are looking even bigger and brighter, especially with the fact that there's a $20,000 prize fund on offer for the Sim Grid World Cup Season 2. 
I, I'm not saying I'm Scottish, but that's literally all I heard was twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> it's just such a, an amazing prize to 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 be offered, Alex, and it, it just shows the leaps and bounds this uh, this community and this uh, you know this this group are are offering to the the sim racing community. So yeah, it's just awesome stuff, and the the last season of the World Cup was amazing. This one's going to be absolutely spectacular. Yeah, so keep your eyes on, uh, uh, for those wondering, the link has been posted by our very own Michael Hamlet in the YouTube chat. Uh, details to come soon. There will be a combination of 12 and 24 hour races. You do not want to miss it. And um, and you can see there, five rounds, two splits. And yeah, uh, a big thank you to everyone behind the scenes, the likes of uh, Dave Perel, Josh Martin, Michael Hamlet, and everyone involved here at the SimGrid to get such an incentive for the sim racing community uh, uh, provided. But, you know, Cachilo now has one more pit stop. But David, I wanted to know your thoughts about, you know, the likes of Boothby, that <laughs> Boothby and Ruoff both have two pit stops to make and they're leaving it rather close to wire. I think they might be out of contention, not just for the victory, but maybe even a top three. I've I've said this a couple of times. I, I don't understand the, the strategy they're on. It's, it's not worked. I think their goose is cooked. And uh, they're going to be lucky to get a top five finish. In fact, Ruoff certainly won't finish in the top five. Boothby, with the combination of that uh, that time penalty as well, yeah, I, I think it's it's game over. Yeah, and uh, big thanks to uh, Jonas van Droyten, uh just saying, yeah, he's had problems with his legs, so he has retired. Uh, uh, a big thank you to those also commenting on the stream. We couldn't do it without the, the fantastic work of our broadcast director, Mike Yao, once again. And um, you, look look at the gap now between uh, Niklas Huben and uh, Tobias uh, Grodewald. This could possibly be the battle for the victory. Uh, and you, 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 know, you know, at the end of the day, I think it could be it's going to be between Grodewald and Huben for the victory. But what if... Boozy does the unthinkable. Three podiums out of three today. Whoa. That would be a story for for, for him to tell, <laughs> wouldn't it? Well, it's, uh, we're, we're going to find out. I, it's not without yeah. the, the, the realms of possibility, Alex. That's the thing. It's, um, yeah, this is, this is crazy how literally 10 minutes in, or 10 minutes left in a 2.4 hour race, and we, we just have no idea what's going to happen. Scolari running in the 141 falls. You know, um, I think, you know, it's it's really interesting how Kevin uh, Scolari has done an absolutely epic job in this Mercedes, you know, battling with uh, the likes of George Boothby, Kim Cachilo and et al. You know, it, it's it's not out of the realms of possibility. I mean, even if even if Fuzzy gets in the top five and Scolari takes the final step on the rostrum, that would be one hell of a way to end the day, wouldn't it? Oh, it's, it certainly would. And whatever happens, I mean, we are in for an amazing finish here. It's been a fantastic event. I've absolutely loved this. From the Lamborghinis to the Porsches. Oh, and a very, very close moment there for uh, Scolari. Um, but from the, the Lamborghinis to the Porsches to, to this two-hour two event, I mean, this this isn't long enough for me. I, I want a 12-hour event. I want to, it, it just to, to keep on going. It's It's been fantastic, and I, I would like to see more of these types of events. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I'm very much of the of that opinion as well. You know, these, these longer endurance races, it really does give you an opportunity to sort of, like, look at it. You know, not overanalyze what's going on, but... Um, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, Coachello. I've just heard is yeah, Coachello's now in for the final pit stop, pitting from P8, and now drops out. Will drops outside of the top ten if uh, Suarez uh, closes up in the 78 Audi uh, in the next few moments or so. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be uh, it's it's going to be really really interesting because you know with the seven and a half minutes to go, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, Denks, look, <laughs> Attila, Denks in the top 10. He's currently P9, and he's closing on uh, Josef Dorbes from Germany. Um, so Denks, you know, uh, the dark horse for Michael Hamlet could be, uh, I think, uh, depending 
Now, Baltzar's a little bit further up the road, let's be completely honest here, David, but Dobbins has still got one more pit stop to make, and if that happens, then that will unleash Attila Denks, and Denks could possibly put some hot laps in. But if he had another 10 minutes, I think Attila could, might have an opportunity to push even further up the top 10. Denks for, is going to finish P5 or P6, that's my prediction. Uh, it's it just been an inspired drive. Um, I, I, the other thing that really impressed me with, with Denks is his quick fight quick thinking uh, he had that first lap calamity took the pit stop very early on uh, and then really has just soldiered on and uh, made the most of it and uh, you know he's, he's left some of those that have been you know up the top of the field with a bit of egg on their face right now yeah I think um, you know some drivers will now be thinking well the next time I do a 2.4 hour endurance race on sim grid I'm looking I'm gonna look at it very differently you know they'll look at the strategy they'll look at also was it the right car that I picked how did my did my driving improve did I need to do I need to work on a couple of things how has the track evolved um, you know we're still uh, you know the server time is now at 10 48 p.m. and the track temperature is still at 10 degrees Celsius as we go into the last six minutes what are Boothby and Ruoff at? Uh, uh, and, and it's actually making me quite nervous. Do they, do they make, do they know something that we don't hear? With the fact that, in fact, there you go, Boothby into the pits right now, and there's less than a second between Grunwald and uh, Hauben right now. So, yeah, this is this is getting spicy. Hold on to your seats, boys and girls, because this is going to be a wild five minutes. Yeah, the uh, the intensity's uh, de definitely uh, got up uh, the uh, Scoville scale. If you're referencing Chili's there, David, uh, who are off now in the pits as well. So they've decided to get their first, uh, their penultimate pit stop out of the way. I would imagine, because now Boothby will be in the pit stop window a little bit longer than who off. And uh, this is where it's going to get rather interesting now because, you know, we're on lap number 82. Uh, and, and this is where the likes of, you know, Huben and Grunewald, look at the gap. It's less than three quarters of a second between these two. They'll pass Wu off and Boothby in the pit stop phase, will they? Well, Huben's got that gap down to so just under half a second. There's Boothby coming out of the pits. He now gets demoted down to third place. But think of it this way. These drivers now, look at Scolari. He's 1.743 seconds behind Marcel Fusi. And Scolari, I think you're right. He's in the, I, don't, I think P3 might be the least of what he'll achieve in this particular occasion because now you look at where Scolari is he's uh i think that's mossman just uh yeah mossman just uh in front but yeah both be having that extra five seconds in the pits if he was actually if he didn't have that five second penalty i think he might have made it out in front of huben and grunwald by a whisker yeah, I think you're you're spot on. We're away to find out right now. Scolari up the inside right now, and uh, just making that. Oh, he thinks about making that move stick, but it's not going to happen. And he, oh, that looked like a little bit of a push to pass there. Frustration setting in on the uh, 77, and that's uh, that's a back marker. That's a lap traffic that needs to move very very quickly. That is the uh, the number 77 of Gregory Mossman. So, yeah, that is not what you like to see. Yeah, that's not. That's that's only gone and aggravated Scolari. And now what will happen is that that the, the 209 driver will start. And and uh, look, Mossman doesn't need to flash the lights back. He was, in my honest opinion, he was in the wrong there. I think we both. Uh, oh, Fuzi now in the pits. Fuzi has blinked. Now Scolari will. Uh, and now Huben pits for the final time. The chess game is well and truly afoot, my dear Mr. Christie. Fuzzy is uh, into the to the last corner now, and uh, yeah, I'm just what. Oh no, sorry, he's on his way down into uh, Ravatsa. I I just want to see how he's he's going to make this this work. Um, Scalari, I, I mean, I I don't understand how they've they've managed to to make this happen because uh, from the looks of it, Huben is uh, potentially going to be in the lead of this if I'm if I'm looking at that rightly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the. Uh, we'll 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 see what happens because I think at the end of the day, Scolari apparently I think is about a lap down off of the top three, so that puts him out of contention. Yeah, he's ninety. 
Yeah, so when you think about it, the lap times they've been setting, it's a 1 minute 41. That's just over a hundred, that's a hundred and a hundred and one seconds. Scolari uh, is 92 seconds off of, um, off of Grunewald. Yeah. And it's only getting closer and closer. So I think, I think at the end of the day, Boothby could hold on. But, uh, and then you look at Fuzzy. Fuzzy's down in sixth position. If he, well, he's in seventh. If he gets into the top six after two podium finishes in the Super Trofeo and the Porsche races, hats off to him. Irrespective. I've, I've got to be honest, I'm, I'm more impressed with Denks. I mean, to get up into sixth place after that, that dismal start from 20, I think it was 20 seconds oh, on the oh, grid. Sorry to cut across you. Two leaders, two leaders in the pits. Leaders in the pits for the final time with about a minute and 10 seconds to go, David. Game on. Yep, certainly is, because uh, I think that was uh, Huben was 25 seconds, uh, sorry, no, make that 40 seconds behind the uh, the leader there. And, uh, yeah, he's on the penultimate corner. I don't know if that's going to be enough. Is that them just leaving the pits just now? I think it is. Yeah. Right, Huben. Huben yeah, Huben's going to take the lead. Final... Yeah, he's got it. He's got it. Just. No, hang on a second. Grunewald out of the pits. Boothby now about to come out of the pits. Oh, has he got the move done? Huben has got the lead back with 30 seconds to go after two and a half hours, nearly two and a half hours of racing. Huben has done the unthinkable. He's got past both Grunewald and Boothby and we're on the final lap. Wow. Wow, that is just... Yeah, I'm going to say I called that. <laughs> but look at him, he is absolutely off, and who would blame him? Seven seconds left to go. That is just incredible strategy right now from Hooven. He's, uh, he's pulled an absolute blinder. However, he still has the majority of one lap to do. And as we've seen from many other drivers, Alex, that alone can be an issue. Yeah, Hooven absolutely pulled a flanker on everyone else Josef Dobbins comes in for the final time but I mean I cannot believe my eyes I, I, I really cannot I mean you know we're on board with Grunewald now going through into the uh, the Variante Alta and 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 look Ingolstadt will now be a Falterbach here at Simula who could have called that one my goodness me and I've, I've got to be honest, uh, yeah, Michael Hamlet put it in chat, it's absolutely right that Audi has just spanked four Mercedes in that top five. It has absolutely come out on top right now. But round the final corner for the final time then, it's going to be a stunning, stunning win then for Huber to take that win. Brilliant win then for Nicholas Huben and the uh, Rooftronic e-racing team. Tobias Grunwald's going to finish in second place. George Boothby in third. Kevin Scolari in fourth place. Awesome finish for Kevin Scolari. Great comeback drive for him. It's then Nick Balzar in uh, fifth place. They're still racing just now, so they're still on the run down to the line. So we're not going to get too excited just yet, but it does look very, very good for them. And then, and then you have the man himself in uh, 18th. Uh, Attila Denks in that BMW. What a drive from him. Alex, this has just been incredible. Hats off, chapeau, Marcel Fusi. P7, having started P14 in this race. Two podiums earlier on today. The, the It was definitely a triple threat for Marcel Fusi and has responded. Here comes Attila Denks out of the Variante Alta from 22nd on the grid. Michael Hamlet's uh, welcome, uh, dan danger man. Uh, now coming into uh, what is uh, Rivasa for the final time after what has been an epic 84 laps here at Imola. Uh, that's well over 250 miles covered. I think probably closer to 280. Attila Denks absolutely jubilant across the line in the number 18. The sole BMW. Uh, here and well done Marcel Fusi absolutely despite three races in one day the only driver in split one to do so sets an initial benchmark as the fireworks virtually start flying their way into the nighttime sky here at Imola
awesome, awesome stuff there. An incredible race and an incredible event here for Super Saturday. We're going to go and uh, get a breath and uh, hopefully have some drivers to have a chat with. We'll take a very short commercial break. And as I said, when we come back, we'll have some driver interviews and uh, some wrap up for tonight. We'll see you in just a sec. So welcome back then and we pick the uh, bones out of what was an incredible evening of racing. We had the Super Saturday where we had the Lamborghini uh, STs, we had the uh, Porsche Cup and then we had an amazing, amazing 2.4 hour race here at Imola won by uh, the slimmest of margins by proper big brain strats from Nicholas Hubin and uh, yeah, that was amazing. Without further ado then, let's get some drivers in. And I think the man of the moment, Nicholas Hubin, we have to have a chat with. Uh, Nicholas, welcome. Welcome along, buddy. That was uh, 3,000 IQ strats there. Your very first race with the Sim Grids. Congratulations. Thank you. So... I Talk us through that final 15 minutes when everybody was going for the pit stops. Well, it was a good question. What's going to happen? Um, I didn't know either. So um, I just did my race. I go into the pit. I saw, oh, okay, I'm right behind Tob uh, Tobias or Tobias. And then I saw, oh, God, P3 is right, around, uh, right behind us. Um, that could be pretty close. And then we had two or three laps left, and then, yeah, I had to do the opposite of the uh, guys in front of me, or the guy in front of me, and luckily it's, yeah, it was good. <laughs> and all through the race, you were having this incredible battle with Tobias Grunwald, uh, undercutting each other through pit stops. Um, how did you respond to, uh, to Grunwald? Um, were you concerned about him at all? Uh, I knew before I couldn't do only one service. I have to do two service for uh, refueling because yeah, my car does use a lot of fuel. And I know that he could do it with one service. So I have to do a shorter stint with a lot of space. I did uh, pretty much the whole race was full stand, full risk. And luckily it paid off. Your first event with the SimGrid um, results in a win. Is it safe to say you'll be coming back for more? Of course. I hope I can I can come back for the World Cup. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, for joining us tonight, Nicholas. Congratulations on the uh, the race win, and uh, very much looking forward to seeing you uh, being part of the SimGrid in the future. Thank you. Uh, right, let's go and have a chat with uh, Alexander Paulik, um, who f had a, a, a quite a mixed race, really, uh, finishing down in 16th place there, uh, just behind Mattis Kopp, but some incredible, incredible battles. So let's uh, have a look there. Uh, Alexander Paulik, uh, very warm welcome, and uh, it was a busy night for yourself tonight. Hello. Uh, first of all, I will try to speak English as good as possible. Uh, first time interview in English. Um, and yes, it was. It was uh, pretty mixed. Um, um, bit of bit of a shunt. I don't know with um, Mr. Bacon. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, at the end, my breaks were done. I had the uh, number one brakes uh, on the car. Uh, thought it uh, they will make it uh, the distance, but uh, 20 minutes before the end, yeah, they were gone, and I needed to nurse the car <laughs> around the track, uh, which resulted in three to seven seconds uh, slower lap. 
Well, you said you were going to try English, buddy. That was uh, that was an excellent effort. That's certainly better than some of my uh, attempts at commentary, anyway. But, um, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, when it's when you're involved in the mid pack, Alexander, and and you're struggling to to kind of fight your way around, and all hell is breaking loose. How do you concentrate? How do you uh, you know settle into a into a rhythm? Um. That's a good question because um, <laughs> it's it's not easy uh, at all, and uh, the Porsche is yeah, it's it's doing <laughs> it's doing its own its own thing. <laughs> um, it's quite difficult behind another car with this car, um, as you know, I think, and. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's no overtaking. Also, uh, I don't have the chance with this car on this track um, to overtake. Um, the, the sector two is, is pretty fast, but on the main straight, uh, uh, yeah, there's nothing I can do. So I uh, I try to focus on myself and uh, hope um, for for a mistake. On a mistake, I don't know, um, um, from my opponents. Well, I mean, obviously it was a mixed bag of results tonight. Looking forward, are you going to be uh, joining the Sim Grid for season two of the World Cup? <laughs> I would like to, but uh, I think I don't have the pace. <laughs> uh, it depends on track and car, but uh, yeah, uh, I don't have a team, I don't have. Uh, Oh, my crew chief. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I don't have a teammate. I don't have a team. Um, I don't think I have ultimately the big pace for, for I don't know, top 10. Well, to answer all of those things, Alex, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's two splits. Yep. Uh, anybody that's out there that fancies teaming up with Alex, give him a message on Discord. Get this guy into the World Cup, and uh, I'm I'm going to take it that we're we're going to see you uh, very very soon. Uh, it would be a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we look we look forward to it. It was awesome catching up with you tonight, Alex, and uh, all the best. And we'll uh, we'll see you back on the grid very very soon. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. There we go then, Alexander Pollock then finishing in a, a difficult mid-pack position there, uh, down in 16th position just behind Mattis Kopf and head of David Kalaksai. Uh, I guess everybody's quite shy tonight because that's the only drivers that we've got to talk with. So uh, Alex, it's, it's just me and you, buddy. Let's, uh, let's sum things up because it's been a, a busy, busy night here. As well, firstly, we have to say a big thank you to Dan Handover for making his debut on the Sim Grid. Did a fantastic job all day. Uh, of course, uh, we have to thank you people watching at home, wherever you are in the world. A big thank you to all the interaction throughout uh, what's been going on today here on Super Saturday. I think this format really does work, doesn't it, David? Oh, it does for sure, and uh, I'd love to see more of these throughout the season, maybe as a, a sort of joined up um, affair. It'd be fantastic mm -hmm. to see championships supporting championships, you know, like you see in the uh, the, the real life affairs. But yeah, a, a wonderful event, great Lamborghini race, stunning Porsche race, and that 2.4 hour endurance race, my God, that had absolutely everything. I mean, like the amount... Uh, I have to give Michael Hamlet credit where credit is due for putting on an absolutely brilliant performance in the Super Trofeo race. He didn't just make up the numbers. Uh, and that was really, really good to see. I mean, you know, you could just see how the how the tone of the day was going to go along with the Lamborghini Super Trofeos, then the Porsches, and then obviously what was one hell of a 2.4-hour Imola endurance finale. But, yeah, I mean, there's still so much to come. There's so much... That we want, we wish we could tell you, but there is so much coming from SimGrid, of course. With, uh, you know, on your screens, you can see obviously the the World Cup returns for season two. It's going to be in March. It's going to start. We're going to have two splits, five endurance races, a combination of twelve and twenty-four hour races, a twenty thousand dollar prize pool. Uh, that's the only uh, words that David has probably just heard from me in the last thirty seconds. But 
you know, we're going to be allowing a maximum of 50 teams with four drivers in each team, you know, two splits. It really, really just show how much the sim grid has exploded onto the sim racing scene. You know, we can't do this without people such as Coach Dave Academy uh, and Thrustmaster, two great partners as well. But yeah, just looking forward to, you know, what's coming up next, you know, next, next week, more female races by Thrustmaster finale. You know, Imola, the season finale. So back here again, the Endurance Cup goes to Paul Ricard on the 6th of February. Uh, and then you've got the Endurance, uh, you, you've got the, the Sprint Cup final next week as well at Kyle Army, you know, and that's an incredibly, incredibly tricky track in its own right. But yeah, I mean, things in, tw you know, 2020 was a big year for Simcrit. 2021 is going to blow the bloody doors off, mate. I couldn't have said it any better myself. So all that's left to do from everyone here at the Sim Grid is say a massive, massive heartfelt thank you to our production team behind the scenes, Michael Hamlet, keeping us updated on everything, whispering sweet little nothings in our ear all through the night. And uh, Mike Yow at Simply Race, providing us all of the stunning audio and visual goodness that you're accustomed to here on YouTube. If you want to see more of the same, click that subscribe and notification button on YouTube, give the video a like, head over to thesimgrid.com, get yourself registered for the events and our daily races. Remember, head over to beta.daily, uh, sorry, beta.thesimgrid.com and you can take part in our brand new daily events that we are running. From myself, though, I've got to say a huge thank you, as Alex said, to Dan Handover for his amazing debut tonight and to Alex Goldschmidt for his stellar effort that he always brings to the table every single time. Thank you very much, guys, at home for watching. I've been David Christie. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, and we'll see you on Monday for more Female Racers by Thrustmaster.